All right, well, welcome, good morning, and thank you all for coming. It is really great to see you all here in person. I know that for many of us, this is the first sort of large public gathering we've been to, so, so thank you. On behalf of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, NOAA Fisheries, the Steering Committee, the Planning Team, and Tidal Bay Consulting, welcome to the 2022 National Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Summit. This is the fourth of these that we've held since 2010. I think each one has been uh, better and getting more productive. So I'm Russ Dunn. I think I know most of you in this room. I'm the National Policy Advisor for Recreational Fisheries here at NOAA. Uh, about to join me on stage is Jessica Joyce with Tidal Bay Consulting. She is the principal there at Tidal Bay and our primary facilitator. So again, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for your, your time and effort and expense you took to come here. And I guess most importantly, thank you in advance for the work that we're all gonna do together over the next two days. I also want to acknowledge our virtual participants. We're streaming this live, all the plenary sessions, uh, out to the internet. I'm not sure how many folks are on there, but at last count we had around 75 additional people that, that, who had registered. Uh, we have a full agenda over the next two days and uh, with, a, with a series of important topics. Climate resilient fisheries, balancing uses of ocean space, recreational fisheries data, and recreational fisheries management. And I think we could easily spend all of the next two days on any single one of those topics, uh, but uh, in order to get through them, we're gonna have to be focused and efficient, and Jessica is gonna keep us on track in those efforts. So uh, without further ado, Jessica is gonna come up and walk you through some logistics and other meeting information. So if you would, Ooh, take it away. Good morning, everybody. As Russ said, I'll be the lead facilitator for today. Um, like many of you, I am a small business owner, and I also uh, fish recreationally and dig clams in Maine, and more importantly, teach my daughters to do the same. Uh, this summer, my family had the opportunity and, and privilege to go to Alaska, where we took our first charter fishing trip out of Homer and uh, caught halibut and salmon. And, love reliving that trip every time we get to cook a meal prepared with that fish. Louder? Okay. Thanks, Tina. Um, so I'm just going to provide an overview of the agenda today and a few logistics for everybody, and then we'll get started with our first session. I did want to acknowledge all those streaming from home today, and also uh, I wanted to thank the amazing project team at NOAA and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission as well as my associate, Madeline Tripp, and uh, my subcontractors from AECOM, Jack Murphy and Kelly Stoll, who helped check you in and will be here throughout the day. Um, so we'll get started. And one quick note for all of our speakers as well. We were, um, we're gonna have Maya, who is running the GoToWebinar, advance all of our slides. So rather than a clicker, you will hear, um, you know, next slide, please. Uh, so. Right now on the agenda, we'll start off the morning with our keynote speakers, and then Russ is gonna take us back from the last summit in 2018 and share progress to date with that. We'll have a break, and then we'll get into our first session of the day, Climate Resilient Fisheries, which includes presentations and discussion, and then we'll go into breakout groups for the rest of the morning, go right into lunch, and then start our second session balancing ocean uses, where we'll have presentation and discussion, followed by a break, and then we'll get back um, in the afternoon for a panel discussion. Uh, we'll hear a report out from the breakout groups and have closing remarks, and then we'll adjourn by five. And there's one change in our schedule tonight. We moved up the reception from six to 5.30. So that reception, which will be in the atrium, um, which some of you know who may have crashed the other conferences uh, happy hour last night, <laughs> is just <laughs> where the breakfast was this morning. Um, next slide, please. Uh, thank you all for being flexible as we navigated a changing environment of COVID protocols as we changed this conference. Um, yet, despite all these changes, the number one question that we did get is what to wear. So I'm glad everyone has their uh, priorities straight there. And I'm just going to review. I think everyone knows masks are optional. 
Um, we do still have a duty to self-monitor <clears throat> during and after the conference. Um, so if you have any um, symptoms, please, after the fact, email recfishinfo at asmfc.org. Hopefully you all read the assumption of risk, and I know we're all aware of this right now. <clears throat> if not, <clears throat> it is in our COVID protocols that we have some printouts and it's online as well. And finally, uh, let's just all be respectful of, of everyone's choices and um, we'll have a good time and be grateful that we're all able to be here in person. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I will also add that while we do have the meeting room and our capacity to allow for more distancing, if there's anything we can do to make you feel more comfortable, please just let us know. Okay, a few things um, with meeting etiquette. I know um, for some of us, it's been a while since we've met in person and uh, we've developed some meeting norms that we'd like to share. We hope everyone treats each other with respect expressing opinions responsibly, focusing on the issues and not on personal differences, speaking both honestly and kindly. Allow others to finish their thoughts. Uh, we recognize that we all interrupt at times or build on each other's statements, but we strive to allow each person the space to finish your thoughts. Participate fully and engage in each other's thoughts, ideas, and opinions, even if they may be different from our own. Stay focused on the topic under discussion um, unless we make a group decision to alter the agenda. And we have a shared responsibility for success over the next two days. So we're all responsible for achieving the outcomes of this me meeting. And if there's something you'd like to change in the process, please uh, let one of the organizers know. Um, and finally, a note on technology. We, um, while we do have Wi-Fi in this room, um, it is one Wi-Fi code for everyone, so we do ask that maybe you only connect one device, a phone, um, or if you need a laptop, but we do hope that everyone um, can be present during the plenary sessions and the breakout groups, as we do have plenty of breaks and lunchtime for checking emails or phones. Uh, finally, we will be taking a few photos throughout the two days, and if that's something that you would rather not be in, uh, these could be used on the website or the conference report, um, please just let one of the organizers know and we'll make sure to um, put you on a do not photo list. Um, so I think that's all I have for now. Hopefully everyone, I think the only other uh, information was the Wi-Fi code, which is phishing with a capital F. 2022 if anyone needs that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Russ to get us started with our keynote speakers. Thank you. All right, thanks Jessica. So we have a series of keynote speakers, the first of which is from the private sector uh, and is Whit Fosberg, who is president and CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Witt, uh, a little bit on his background. Prior to joining TRCP in 2010, he spent 15 years at Trout Unlimited. He served as fisheries director for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and was chief environment and energy staffer for uh, Senator Tom Daschle. Uh, and he was a wildlife specialist for National Audubon Society. NOAA has had a great partnership with TRCP over the years. About 10 years ago, Witt and I started our respective jobs that we hold today at the same time. And uh, they were very open in inviting NOAA into their process as they developed a series of reports. And we appreciate their, their openness and we've been a, a sponsor of theirs for events, their policy forums such as the Saltwater uh, uh, Media Summit that they host in conjunction with ICAST. So without further ado, Witt, if you would. Please take the stage. All righty, thank you, Russ. And I uh, just want to say how good it is to be back in person uh, with so many old friends, uh, not doing these things remotely or through Zoom. Uh, Janet Coit, great to see my old colleague again. We were uh, interns together at Audubon a very long time ago. Um, anyway, I just wanted to go through uh, a few different things today. Uh, some of the challenges we have before us, but some of the successes we've had as well. So why don't we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, these are the good old days for recreational fishing. Um, 
we have experienced unprecedented growth in the last two years and the hunt boating and fishing sectors are the largest parts of the six hundred and eighty four billion dollar outdoor recreation economy so what we have to make sure now is that we maintain those experiences that folks have had according to american sport fishing association about almost 55 million people fished in 2021 up from about 50 million in 2019 we have to make sure we keep those people by showing them good experiences and the fundamental way of doing that is make sure we have well-managed fisheries and lots of fish in the water as Mike Nussman used to like to say, we're not very good at doing what we do. We need a lot of fish to be successful. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, a little looking back right here, about a decade ago, American Sport Fishing Association, CCA, and TRCP put together something we call the Morris Deal Report that laid out a vision for how we could do better managing our recreational fishing uh, policies in this country. And I think it's important to sort of think about some of the things we talked about then and where we are today. The first thing we talked about is for NOAA needed to develop a recreational fishing policy, which didn't exist until that time. They have one now. And I think the recreational fishing community has a strong seat at the table along with the commercial industry and in how our fisheries are managed. And really, this is the first time, you know, I feel that we were truly empowered. And Russ, honestly, a lot of that, you know, credit for that goes to you and the agency for making sure there's always been open door policy here. Plenty of stuff we can disagree on, but I think that we do feel that we have a real seat at the table at this point. Okay, go on to the next slide, please. Uh, several different things we talked about in addition to the rec fishing policy. One was alternative management. And uh, I think we have a few different examples of how this is being used today uh, in, to, you know, basically instead of shoehorning recreational, manage, recreational fishing into a commercial fishing construct, we are trying different things in different fisheries technically that could work better for our community. I mean, you have golf and South Atlantic red snapper and South Atlantic reef fish management would fall into the category of alternative management. Mid-Atlantic, uh, Mike Wayne, a lot of the work that he's been doing around flounder, scup, black sea bass, bluefish, also may be a better way of managing these fisheries, certainly not the way we've done in the past. All of these processes are gonna be iterative. They're gonna change over time. But you know that's the nature of really trying to get this thing right. And I think it behooves all of us to give these a good faith effort to make them work. Okay, next slide, please. We also recommended uh, cooperative management you know, with the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, with states and recreational anglers. We can use a couple of different examples of how this is happening in real time, especially the data collection side. Louisiana's La Creole program, the Florida State Reef Fish Survey, are both ways that anglers are really engaged in the management process through data collection and data reporting. And I think those offer a really good you know, paradigms for how we can do this differently in different places and really have better data and better management instead of relying on the old MRIP systems. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, another key, and probably the key recommendation for the Morris Deal Report is we need to do a better job of managing forage fish, which are the foundation for all of our fisheries. And I think we're seeing right now the most profound changes in the Atlantic where Moon and Hayden have been moved to ecosystem management. And this is great progress, and uh, thanks to many of you who are in this room right now. However, we need to do more. I mean, the Chesapeake Bay has got to be protected from the risk of localized depletions by lowering the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishing cap. And NOAA really needs to expedite their spatially explicit modeling. 2031 is really too long to wait to get this thing right. We also need to expand ecosystem management to the Gulf of Mexico, where the fishery, the production fishery is twice as large as in the Atlantic, where there are no hard catch limits, and where the industry refuses to even take the most basic steps for conservation, like creating buffers around the beaches. On the federal level, we need to pass the Forage Fish Conservation Act, either as freestanding legislation or as a part of an MS Magnuson Stevens Act reauthorization to create those controls on forage fish populations before we have more unsustainable fisheries that impact entire ecosystems. And the notion that we're even considering approving new large-scale commercial forage fisheries, reduction fisheries, like thread herring along the Atlantic is really unconscionable. All right, next slide, please. Looking ahead, we have several challenges, and I want to dwell on these for a minute. I mean, first of all, we have striped bass, and this is something we need to get right. 
Anyone who has fished with striped bass, this is where I cut my teeth in recreational fishing in the salt water with striped bass in Long Island Sound. Everyone who's been doing that knows that the fishery has been in steady decline for the past you know, 10 to 20 years, depending on where you are. Now, Amendment 7 offers promise to stem the decline and begin a real rebuilding process. And I'm you know, very proud to say the recreational community has largely been united in calling for real conservation and not fig leaves that mask the problem and allow overfishing to continue. Climate is another issue that we've got to grapple with, and I know they're going to be doing some breakout sessions on that later on today. You know, home ranges are shifting for a variety of species, and rising sea levels, ocean acidification are real threats. We need to be united in supporting federal legislation and state actions that address climate change, both by reducing emissions and also by supporting efforts to increase the resilience of coastal communities. By the way, many of those solutions, like restoring coastal barrier islands and creating coastal wetlands, are also great for fishing. And we need, the continue, we need to support the continued research and science budgets at NOAA and the other agencies so that management can keep pace with the changes that we're seeing in the oceans and help guide our restoration work. And another point on forage fish, to the extent that we can protect forage fish populations through ecosystem management, that is gonna help us create more resilient ecosystems in the face of a changing climate. Infrastructure. In the fall, Congress passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It's gonna provide billions of dollars for coastal restoration and access projects, such as helping marinas and boat ramps that are facing rising sea levels. It's imperative we get this money on the ground as soon as possible. We know what works, so I would, my advice would be let's supersize the existing programs, not try to create a bunch of new things it may take years to get money on the ground. To this end, I want to com commend Janet, the Department of Commerce, for being one of the first agencies to get real money out the door, this time through the Res Coastal Resiliency Fund in partnership with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Folks, that RFP is on the street, $140 million for on-the-ground projects, and they ought to be tapped as soon as possible. NIFWF wants to get that money out the door and on the ground by November. So, you know, the challenge is there. We need to step up to that. Finally, I'm going to end with a little bit of plea for collaboration. The recreational fishing community is famous for its circular firing squads. We spend most of our time attacking each other as opposed to the real enemies. And uh, I think we maybe saw a different model moving forward in the Manhattan debate. Uh, here, the recreational fishing community, oops, excuse me, has complete alignment and what we want to do and really how we want to do it, go about it. Uh, which is unique, and we also have a great partnership with the environmental community on this issue. While TRCP, ASA, CCA, National Marine Manufacturers, and others worked on one side of the campaign, Nature Conservancy, Audubon, Pew, Chesapeake Bay Foundation ran a parallel but closely coordinated campaign on the other side. And I think the results speak for themselves. Obviously, we also need ongoing leadership from NOAA in this regard to supporting observer coverage, bycatch studies, habitat analysis, ecosystem science, as it relates to these fisheries. But I think the Manhattan example shows that that collaboration is possible, and to the extent that we can continue to do that, maybe we build trust in other areas, you know, things like you know, marine protected areas and issues like that that tend to be a lot thornier. So with that, I think uh, thank you for everything you do. We have a lot of the leaders in the community that have done a tremendous amount for conservation here. I see you down there, Pat Murray, Dave Sikorsky, you know, Mike Leonard, many other, Chris Horton. Uh, it's a real honor to work with you guys and everybody else in here and have great partnership with agencies like NOAA and uh, National Marine Fisheries. So with that, thank you very much. Yep. Oh, you want questions? Yeah, no, if, uh, if I have still have time on my gavel. All right, so anybody has questions, things we want to talk about, feel free to jump in. There's some microphones set up around the room, it looks like. I guess, uh, yep, right here. Well, I just want to say, it is amazing to see a man stand in front of this crowd and talk about Emerald. <laughs> I wrote my first letter about that in 1998, and people just laugh at me. Just, you know, oh, a fisherman has a problem with the data, ha, ha, ha. Okay, good. Well, it's getting ready to really come around, but I don't want to butt now, because the uh, Emerald's been so overinflated, but our stock analysis, yeah.
Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the comment on data collection. For those who couldn't hear it, it was a sort of shout out for doing something other than MRIP. And you know, coming from you know the sort of deer hunting community, which you know I grew up in, and we we tag, we report everything, and uh, seeing that now starting to happen in places like Louisiana and Florida and others, I mean, you know, sportsmen don't mind doing that kind of stuff, and to the extent that can create better data, we ought to be doing that. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much. All right. Thanks, Whit. Really appreciate your thoughts. Um, just a comment for folks that if you do, as we go forward, if you have comments or questions, you really need a mic because we have the uh, virtual participants too. So they can't hear you if you aren't on a microphone. So uh, now we are going to move to our second keynote speaker, uh, Deputy Secretary of Commerce Don Graves. While Deputy Secretary Graves was Welcome unable to, to join National. us this morning, he has provided us with a, with a short set of pre-recorded marks. So if you would, please turn your attention to either screen and we'll play those remarks right now. Welcome to the National Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Summit. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I'd also like to thank our summit co-hosts, in particular Bob Beal and Tina Berger at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission for their leadership. NOAA has a long history of supporting recreational fishermen and boaters. Coastal weather forecasts and our tropical storm warning system provide critical and timely information. Tide tables and sea surface temperature data help fishermen know when to fish and where to find productive fishing areas offshore. NOAA and our state and federal partners manage fisheries for the benefit of the entire nation. I want to acknowledge your resilience as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. This summit is the first large public event NOAA has hosted in two years. And I'm here to tell you that at the Commerce Department and NOAA, we're not only listening, but we're also ready to work with you to forge strong partnerships. We're lucky to have an amazing body of water just an hour away. I value the time I spend, rare as it may be, fishing, crabbing, and boating on the Chesapeake Bay, something I've been doing for 50 years. I know why so many of you love getting out to the water as well, and we're committed to continuing to preserve America's natural bounty for all people to enjoy. But at Commerce, we understand our coastal and ocean waters are not just a weekend playground. They're the foundation of a vibrant blue economy. New data shows the 2021 marine economy accounted for 162,000 new businesses and 3.4 million employees. And coastal travel and tourism activities depend on NOAA Trust resources. They are key contributors to the social and economic fabric of the nation. According to NOAA Fisheries most recent statistics, saltwater recreational anglers spent $36.1 billion on fishing trips and related goods, supporting 470,000 jobs nationwide. We're glad to have you as partners to reach our economic goals, and we also value your conservation and sustainability efforts. U.S. marine fisheries are among the largest and most sustainable in the world. There are 460 species under federal management, and only 20 have been classified as overfished. Healthy and abundant fish stocks are essential. They drive every decision in fishing activity from buying boats and tackle to catching the fish and bringing home dinner. Our NOAA scientists also are committed to exploring renewable energy options. The Biden-Harris administration has an ambitious goal to develop responsible offshore wind energy by 2030. We need to work together to achieve these conservation goals while protecting our marine ecosystems. The nation's tourism and marine economies depend on it. It's how we ensure Americans can enjoy the benefits of our saltwater ecosystem for generations. So thank you again for participating in this summit and for your work to support our recreational fishing industry. I look forward to hearing your ideas and implementing the successful outcomes from this summit. All right. Thank you for, uh, for playing that for us. And again, Secretary Graves uh, is, uh, expressed his, his uh, condolences for not being able to uh, uh, join us here today. So with that, we're going to turn to our last uh, keynote speaker, 
Janet Coit. It is my pleasure to introduce Janet. Uh, she is the she was appointed to the head of No Fisheries, known as the Assistant Administrator, uh, and also as Acting Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Atmosphere in June of 2021. Uh, she has worked on natural resource policy management and stewardship issues for more than 30 years. Prior to joining NOAA, she was, was director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management for 10 years, served as director of the Nature Conservancy in Rhode Island, worked on the Hill for Senators Lincoln, John and Lincoln Chafee, and was counsel to the Senate EPW or Envir Environment and Public Works Committee. So if you would, please join me and give a warm welcome to Janet Coit. Good morning. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you, Witt. Those were excellent remarks. And um, it is hard to believe with, with both Witt and some Tom and some other people in this room I've uh, worked with for over 35 years. So a lot of familiar faces. I also wanted to... Uh, thank um, in absentia uh, the Dep Deputy Secretary Don Graves and also uh, mentioned that a number of us were on a travel and tourism panel yesterday with Secretary Raimondo talking about how important uh, fishing and boating are to the nation's um, economy. Uh, so on behalf of NOAA Fisheries, I want to, and also the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the 2022 Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Summit. Um, it is super exciting to be in person, really, really heartening. Uh, it's been, uh, as, as the uh, Deputy Secretary said, this is the first large in-person event that NOAA has hosted in two years. And um, I keep thinking to quote um, a band that I'm sure many of us have seen live, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> um, so the fact that we're here today, it reflects uh, the commitment of NOAA, the commitment of the ASMFC, and my commitment uh, to you um, and the recreational community. Um, our goals, to share views and experiences, to improve public policy, and to leverage partnerships, to identify stressors and science needs that require our attention and skillful responses, and to improve stewardship of our living marine resources and the fishing experience you and millions enjoy on the water. For those whom I have not yet met, um, I hope to connect with you in, in person over the next two days. Um, Russ gave you a little snapshot on my career, uh, but I started working on Capitol Hill in the mid 80s for Senator John Chafee, and at the time worked on striped bass. What a magnificent, uh, exciting, amazing fish. Um, after um, the striped bass study, which cited that its decline was largely based on overfishing. And that was certainly a passionate and fraught um, debate at the time. And I've been working on those issues ever since. Um, as mentioned, for the past 10 years as the head of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And I'm so proud of the work that we did there. Uh, Whit mentioned ecosystem-based fisheries management, which is so important. And uh, um, really, Jay McNamee and some of the scientists in Rhode Island really led the way. Uh, I hope people agree, I think, on a lot of that work and the science around um, looking at uh, Menhaden's role in the ecosystem. So I know that um, there are thousands of years of experience in this room, and um, the issues are really exciting, and they're really consequen consequential. So first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for coming. I really appreciate that many of you traveled from the West Coast or further. Um, thank you for your time and effort to be in this room. Um, your expertise and your commitment to improving conservation and management and access to our fisheries resources are what is going to drive us forward today. So we could not have pulled this off without the steering committee who built this summit and shaped its content. Um, so please don't be shy. I would like the members of the steering committee who are anglers from across the country, staff from the Interstate Fisheries Commission to please stand so we can acknowledge you and give you a round of applause. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have roughly 175 participants here today, 
and many, many more um, virtually participating. So that certainly sends a powerful signal about how important these issues are and the opportunity that we have at hand right now. So in addition to reaffirming relationships, I hope that we leave here tomorrow afternoon with a shared understanding of facts and issues of concern, um, a clear idea of steps that can be taken to address these concerns, and then mutual commitments to work together in our respective capacities to implement or move forward on these recreational fishing issues. The issues we'll be discussing are complex, um, often controversial. Some of them are relatively new, uh, like offshore wind, something we've had um, the nation's first offshore wind farm in off the coast of Block Island. Um, the goals of this administration, as the DEPSEC said, have are to increase dramatically offshore wind off of all of our coasts. And um, that's an issue that we've been spending a lot of time on at NOAA um, that's very important and very interesting in regards to uh, recreational fishing. Um, I know that um, maybe Rick Bellavance or, or Frank Blount will tell you that they're a bit of an attraction, um, both for fish who aggregate there and for people who are curious about fishing around those wind farms. Um, other issues are more traditional. Um, we mentioned MRIP and, and data collection, um, management flexibility. Those are issues that people have argued about and thought about for years. Um, they're notoriously difficult to resolve, and I hope that we today and tomorrow have some open, respectful conversations. Um, I ask people um, to look beyond past ways of thinking and to be open to new ideas. And I know we all feel a real sense of urgency around these issues. So what are some of the new ideas? I'm sure you all have ideas. Um, here's a few that have been discussed. So they're, um, from me and my team, landing tag programs in fisheries with limited harvest to improve data collection and improve compliance with catch limits, a federal permit or endorsement that may better define the universe of anglers pursuing council managed or rare event species, improve survey sampling frames and reduce uncertainty in our recreational catch and efforts. Separation of for hire and non for hire recreational catch limits where appropriate, which may increase accountability and stability. Continuing to evaluate voluntary or mandatory electronic reporting to improve recreational fisheries data. To that last point, I'm looking forward to the MAFAC report on electronic reporting. Um, but as Whit mentioned, uh, many people, especially young people, are, have their own devices at hand and are um, used to reporting what they catch in other contexts. So none of these tools are without challenges or controversy or risk. Management always involves in any context collecting data, evaluating options, and making informed choices. Choices involve risk and risk elicits controversy. So we can choose to maintain the current course of incremental change or as the Mid-Atlantic Council is planning to do with recreation reform, embrace change in the hope of accelerating progress and solving problems. We live in a world where the only constant is change. We are witnessing unprecedented change in the marine environment with impacts to fish, marine mammals, habitats, all driven by climate change. Rising ocean temperatures, shifting fish stocks, ocean acidification, increased harmful algal blooms. These are just a few of the impacts we're seeing around the nation. And again, coming from Rhode Island and having headed the DEM for the last 10 years, uh, the degree of change in terms of populations of winter flounder in the bay or populations of uh, black sea bass um, available have changed dramatically in just, in just the last 10 or 15 years. So we need to continue to support and grow science, the science needed to better forecast and manage for climate-driven changes, to support recreational fishing needs, and to effectively execute our mission. So I look forward to honest conversations, which are a critical path to problem solving, and to seizing new opportunities in this dynamic and too often polarized world. We've structured the summit to provide a venue for respectful, frank, back and forth about the issues that concern us all. We're here to create a vision for the future in this quickly changing world. Uh, to think about our successes while learning from and hopefully avoiding mistakes of the past. As we look to identify and address the challenges before us, there will be things we can do 
and probably some ideas out there that we can't do. So let's acknowledge that, um, but keep looking for alternatives. Be creative, stretch. So before I turn the mic over to Russ, uh, I wish to provide an, just a quick update on one priority of the Biden administration, America the Beautiful. Many of you were involved in creating and shaping that policy, and we thank you for your insights, your recommendations, or for, and for staying engaged. Um, Whit mentioned, you know, it's all about the habitat, and we want to make sure we conserve and steward ha habitat. And I can say that um, one of the things I've always admired about the fishing community is, is that individual accountability and the places that you love and enjoy are places you want to care for. And, um, and I think that gives you special currency and the fact that you work with Democrats and Republicans, state houses, communities, it's powerful. The first progress report on America the Beautiful was released in December, and it highlights the steps that we've taken so far over the past year, mostly supporting locally led and voluntary efforts, steps which sustain the health of communities and support their economies. NOAA co-chairs the interagency subcommittee that's developing the ATLAS, the American Conservation and Stewardship ATLAS. That will establish the baseline and track progress on conservation and restoration of U.S. lands and waters. Recently, the public was invited to uh, provide comment on that atlas, so that's something we're reviewing now and taking stock of the comments, and a preliminary version of the atlas will be released later this year. In addition, NOAA is working with the special subcommittee of the Council Coordinating Committee that was established to develop a common understanding among the regional fisheries management councils of their area-based measures, and also to assist the regional councils in coordinating with the Biden administration to achieve the goals set forth in America the Beautiful. So I want to thank uh, councils and um, the work of the CCC, um, which has been really important, and we look forward to hearing from those partners, and I'll be with them in a meeting coming up in May. Um, the issues around how conservation is defined under America the Beautiful are things that are still under development. And I know you all have ideas. So in closing, I look forward to reopening old dialogues, um, to listening, to learning, to absorbing, and to the results of our conversations. This is not just about dialogue, it's about action. So please introduce yourself to some new folks um, think hard uh, during the next two days, challenge yourself, um, try out uh, new solutions, let's develop some new technologies, be smart, take calculated risk, and come together to make hard and necessary decisions. Uh, there is so much at stake, and I really respect and admire all that you've put into promoting um, recreational fisheries, uh, clean habitats, and um, the work that you've all done for so many years as a vocation and sometimes as an avocation and as a passion. So uh, one last point, um, I would love to see more diversity in a room like this. I would love to see more access um, to fishing opportunities for all sorts of people. That's another goal of America the Beautiful. So let's, uh, let's uh, make that a goal as well, expanding the diversity of people who benefit from and enjoy um, both the, the delight, um, the restorative nature, and also the economic benefits associated with recreational fishing. So thank you all for listening. Um, it's really, really great to be here. So we have limited time together. Let's make good use of it and roll up our sleeves and get to work and make this a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. We appreciate that. And, and I think our all of our opening speakers really provided some uh, valuable insights. So thank you once again for your thoughts, for Wit, for your thoughts, and Deputy Secretary Graves. So if we can key, uh, um, key up our, my presentation, that will be great. All right. I got a lot of slides in here, and I wasn't expecting to have to point, so this may be a little awkward. So I want to take a few minutes and touch on where we have been since, since the 28th summit. But it has been, you may be surprised to hear, four years to the day, exactly today, since the, many of us met in this very room in, in 2018. 
there have been a few historic and unprecedented changes since then. Climate, climate change has become undeniable. Last year in 2021, we had 20 separate billion dollar plus nat uh, natural disasters totaling more than $150 billion in damages and losses. COVID erupted and disrupted all of our lives and we experienced the longest government shutdown in US history. Next, please. So this image represents the 1,462 days since the close of the 2020, uh, 2018 summit. And the red boxes indicate the number of days that I and other NOAA staff have been literally unable to access our offices since, uh, since then because of a combination of COVID and the government shutdown. The blue boxes or green boxes represent the number of days that we have been, but those also include weekends and holidays and everything else. So for more than half of the time since the 2018 summit, 790 of the 1,462 days, we've literally been, been unable to access our offices. Now, this is not to make any excuses, and this is not to say we have been idle. What it means is that we have had to adapt, as all of society has had to adapt to our changing circumstances. Now, as I walk through some of, our, of the work that's been done, uh, I want to first say that neither I nor my team is trying to claim credit for the work that we're about to touch on. Uh, it has been accomplished by many people in many offices inside NOAA, outside NOAA. Uh, all have worked to try and keep recreational fisheries front and center and moving forward. So engagement. So participants at the, at the 2018 summit sent a strong message that engagement was a priority, angler engagement. You asked not just for more communication, but for better communication. But Pre-COVID, we responded with a flurry of engagement activity. We started off with a, a five-year MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with the private sector to promote sustainable recreational fishing and boating. We signed that agreement with some of the groups in this room, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, National Marine Manufacturers Association, American Sport Fishing Association, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, there's a lot of associations out there, and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Next. On the ground, uh, we also sponsored and hosted, and uh, co-hosted on the ground activities and fishing clinics in Hawaii and on the West Coast, where NOAA staff and uh, local partners teamed up to engage local communities, including kids, veterans, people with disabilities, and taught the basics of fishing and marine conservation. Through federal funding opportunities, we, oh, no, stay on this side, sorry. Uh, through federal funding opportunities, we sponsored other hands-on projects such as the Bristol Bay Fly Fishing uh, and Guide Academy, which I believe TNC is also a big sponsor of. This unique pr program is led by Tim Troll, teaches primarily Native Alaskan youth about stream ecology, salmon biology, and how to be a fly fishing guide. It aids them in pursuing their passion for the outdoors, protecting the environment, and, and teaching them valuable job and life skills. Next slide, please. We sponsored annual recreational fisheries policy round tables and, and forums. Uh, one, as I mentioned earlier, the TRCP Saltwater Media Summit, the ASA Annual Policy Summit, and others. We made a major financial investment in the Marine Resource Education Program, where fishermen teach other fishermen about the science and management process in the federal system. Our Pacific Islands region initiated a grant program to fund recreational and non-commercial fisheries and fishing projects that improve sustainable fishing opportunities and protect cultural fishing tradition, uh, um, traditions. Sorry. Next. When COVID struck, we transitioned in-person recreational, sorry, uh, sorry uh, in-person recreational fisheries habitat conservation workshops to online forums. We created a series of informative and instructional recreational fishing videos. We expanded our online celebration of National Fishing and Boating Week by partnering with and cross-promoting with RBFF and our other sister federal agencies. In preparation for this meeting, we held more than a dozen roundtable discussions uh, around the country to inform our conversations here. And we partnered with our Office of Aquaculture to directly engage the recreational community on aquaculture opportunity areas through a series of webinars. 
And finally, we celebrated America's passion for recreational fishing uh, in partnership with Bonnier Corporation uh, through back-to-back -back national fishing photo contests. Next, please. Following the 2018 summit, uh, well, during the 2018 summit, socioeconomics w was one of the primary topics of conversation. Following the summit, we produced a series of valuable socioeconomic surveys and studies uh, that have been conducted. This work examined everything from the motivations of anglers to economic contributions of tournaments uh, and charter fisheries in, in regions around the country to angler expenditures across the entire U.S. These products add to the information uh, available to staff and managers as they review the potential impacts of proposed regulatory changes. With a steering committee of external experts, we organized and we're ready to host a, an econ socio-econ workshop in March of 2020, but obviously that got derailed because of COVID. We've tried to reschedule it a few times, but it remains an agency commitment. And during COVID, our economists turned to examining the pandemic's impact on the recreational for hire fishery, and we're currently awaiting OMB approval to conduct a new nationwide fishing expenditure survey, fishing trip expenditure survey. Next. Data collection. While there's no shortage of opinions in, about data collection and the progress made with regard to data collection, there has been progress nonetheless. A number of specialized state data surveys, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, earned MREP survey design certification, and we continue to work with those data and support calibrating those data for management. Electronic reporting expanded, particularly in the for hire fishery with the introduction of the Sea Fire program. MAFAC, the Marine Fishery Advisory Committee, engaged on data. They impaneled the Recreational Electronic Reporting Task Force, which Janet mentioned earlier, uh, in February of 2020, again, just in time to be disrupted by COVID. However, that, that task force has continued to work and is, is on the cusp of producing their final report. I think we'll see that uh, in later this spring. MAFAC also impaneled their Recreational Subcommittee and, and who has completed a report on improving understanding of offshore effort. Substantial time and effort by our uh, data folks were spent supporting and now, importantly, responding to the National Academy's report on uh, recreational data and management in fisheries with ACLs. And our Office of Science and Technology admitted, administered $3 million in FY21 funds and FY22 funds to ACCSP. Uh, the Gulf Fisheries Information Network, Pacific Rec Fin, and to support increased sampling along the Atlantic, Gulf, and Pacific coasts, and is now currently planning for distribution of FY23 funds. Management, next, please. Innovative management, as we've already heard today, that was a big topic in 2018, and we were seeking paths to better align management with the needs of anglers. At the close of the summit, the president signed the Modern Fish Act into law. And now, although the MFA did not fundamentally change the Magnuson Act, it was reflective of interest in alternative management, and that was witnessed by the authorizing of various management techniques within the bill or the law and, and requiring a number of reports. While progress on alternative man management or innovative management as it's also known, has been made. It has admittedly been incremental. Uh, and where it ha the conversation has advanced, it has been through collaboration. The CCC, the Council Coordinating Committee, hosted a discussion regarding alternative man management in 2019, which led to the formation of the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic Council's joint Working Group on Alternative Management, and we'll hear a little bit about more about that tomorrow. GARFO, our Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office, hosted a series of workshops to discuss how to better align management with the needs of anglers and for hire captains, and I believe there's a poster out in the hallway on that. Mid-Atlantic Rec Reform has gained traction and now has substantial momentum, and we'll hear more about that tomorrow. And the North Pacific Fishery Management Council adopted the RQE, the Recreational Quota Entity, and preliminarily identified preferred funding mechanisms, and we'll hear more about that tomorrow. Conser uh, next, please. Conservation. 
So conservation was discussed at the 2018 summit as a path toward additional uh, fisheries opportunities. So following that thread, as we came out of the summit, we partnered with Yamaha, Fish Smart, state wildlife agencies in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and the National Ocean Service to distribute fish descending devices and information to anglers about how to reduce post-release mortality. We collaborated specifically with Atlantic states to distribute additional devices beyond those. And we distributed with them, through them, 61,000 circle hooks along the eastern seaboard to address concerns regarding striped bass post-release mortality. We worked with the Pacific States Commission and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to distribute more standing devices and educational materials in Alaska and along the West Coast. Next slide, please. Through our Office of Habitat, conservation, we worked with NIFHAP, the National Fish Habitat Partnership, uh, and the commissions since 2018 to support habitat restoration projects across the country that directly engage anglers. That is one of the requirements of those, those funding opportunities. The agency has supported 14 projects over the last four years with another set of projects that are currently under consideration and should be announced soon. There's also the Return and Right project, which is a $30 million project in the Gulf of Mexico that's funded by the Deepwater Horizon Open Ocean Trustees Implementation Group. Say that five times fast. Uh, and executed in collaboration with Florida Sea Grant, Gulf States uh, Commission, and, uh, and others. The goals of Return and Right are simple. Improve the survivorship of released recreational uh, reef fish in the Gulf of Mexico, the health of the Gulf reef fish populations, and improve anglers' experiences with release gear. So my point in recounting all of this, all of these projects, is that COVID or no COVID, a substantial amount of work and progress has been made. We recognize that there are still issues to be resolved, many issues. We also recognize that there's lost time to be made up for, which is why we are all here these next two days to kickstart that process and, and continue and accelerate progress towards resolving those issues. So with that, I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes and then we'll move into break. No questions? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yes. If you do have questions, please, again, reminder, you have to use a mic. And please state your name uh, as you come to the mic. All right. All right. Well, good. The morning's looking up already. OK. All right. Well, with that, if there are no questions, we're going to go going, going, gone. So. All right, I guess that's a sign that everyone needs a coffee refill. <laughs> so that means we get a little bit of an extended break. Um, so it's just about 9 o'clock, and we were going to um, get back here to start up at 9.30 for the Climate Resilient Fisheries. Um, so if I can have all the speakers and the moderators who are in that session come up um, about 10 minutes early, maybe around 9.20 or so, We'll get ready, um, and otherwise, there should be coffee refills in the atrium, and have a nice break, and we'll see you um, promptly at 9.30. Thanks. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, everyone had time to refresh their coffee. We're going to transition to our first session of the day, um, which is the Climate Resilient Fisheries. Our moderator for this session is Janet Coy, Assistant Administrator for NOAA Fisheries. Um, Janet, why don't you come up and get us started? Thank you. Excellent. Hopefully everyone had another cup of coffee and you're raring to go. Uh, this is our panel on climate resilient fisheries. We all, I'm sure, in this room know that climate, changing climate and ocean conditions are having significant impacts on our marine life and ecosystems. Scientists expect environmental changes to increase with continued shifts in the planet's climate. We're already witnessing changes in stocks, fishery productivity, changes in migratory patterns, and many new challenges for fishery participants and managers. 
The initial part of this session covers a range of topics, including the state of ocean climate science, tools and investments, the importance of habitat for climate resilience fisheries, on the water perspectives from the recreational fishing community, and a look at climate scenario planning. After the opening presentations and discussions, we'll, and some Q&A, so I hope people think of some questions, we'll break out into regional working groups to understand better anglers' climate-related priorities and concerns in your region. Um, hopefully, you will both offer your perspective and discuss strategies for addressing climate change and improving climate resilience. Um, at NOAA, we have a climate fisheries initiative. I want to introduce Evan Howell. Can you just raise your hand, Evan? He's the head of our science and technology, one of the people you should group you should introduce yourself to. So we have an amazing panel this morning. I'm going to quickly give very brief introductions of each of the panelists, and then we'll get going. Uh, maybe you can raise your hand as I call your name. Dr. John Hare with NOAA Fisheries. Uh, John is the science and research director for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Starting on Monday, he will, he will be the acting chief scientist for NOAA Fisheries as well. Richard Heap, a recreational fisheries advisor to several federal and state councils and commissions, as well as the port commissioner in Oregon. And his grandparents are from Warwick, Rhode Island. <laughs> David Sikorsky. David serves as the executive director of the Coastal Conservation Association and harkens from Maryland. Carrie Selberg-Robinson. Carrie is with NOAA Fisheries. She's the director of the Office of Habitat Conservation. And Whit Fosberg talked about the um, IIJA funds. Uh, Carrie is overseeing all of those uh, grant programs, almost all of them, um, at NOAA Fisheries. And finally, Kylie Dancy, a, fisheries, um, a fishery management specialist with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, who will talk about scenario planning. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to John to start the panel. Thank you very much, Janet, and thank you all. Um, I like to think I'm starting my acting job on Friday because April 1st sounds a lot better than April 4th. So I'm starting on Friday. Just, just make yeah, no fooling. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I see my role here today to set the stage for this panel. I'm going to talk just a little bit about what climate change is. I think we all know, but just to refresh, talk some about how it impacts marine fisheries, and then just talk about the, you know, the idea of opportunities and challenges. I used to frame this as winners and losers, but I think that just doesn't frame it correctly. So I think opportunities and challenges is a better framing, and, and Witt used this as well this morning. Next slide, please. So what is climate change? Um, I think we all know what climate change is. It's warming oceans, ocean acidification, deoxygenation of ocean waters, changes in ocean circulation, changes in precipitation, sea level rise, and increased frequency of extreme events and others. These are all documented in, throughout the scientific literature and through numerous national and international reports. I have a picture of the fourth uh, national climate assessment, which was produced by the US government. Um, and all of this is well documented. I'm just going to go through three examples that I think are relevant for marine fisheries. Next slide, please. So ocean warming. Um, we all understand what it is. Um, the map on this slide shows the rate of ocean warming across the North Atlantic. Um, two points that I'd like you to take from this. One is, is that there's regional variability. You can see south of Greenland, there's an area of ocean cooling. Um, and you can see off of eastern North America, there's an area of rapid ocean warming and across the rest of the Atlantic Basin, ocean warming. So the, the, what we see is there are regional differences in this climate change signal and the ocean is warming dramatically, particularly off the east coast of the United States, northeast coast. Next slide, please. Changes in ocean circulation. Um, on the top is a satellite imagery of ocean temperature. I think we're probably all mostly familiar with the Gulf Stream. It's a large ocean current that runs from the southern part of the North Atlantic into the northern part of the North Atlantic and carries a large amount of heat from the tropics into the northern part of the Atlantic Basin. 
um, the Gulf Stream has been moving northwards over time. And the, the graph on the bottom shows uh, an index of the location of the northern edge of the Gulf Stream from 1960s to the present. And that Gulf Stream has been shifting northwards. So that means it's bringing warmer, saltier water into closer to the North American coast. Um, and that's just a, a large change in ocean circulation, which is impacting uh, the North Atlantic ecosystem. Next slide, please. Precipitation. So precipitation and the link to marine fisheries um, might not be immediately intuitive, but precipitation is stream flow. Stream flow affects a number of anadromous species um, that spend part of their life cycle in the ocean and part of their life cycle in estuarine and freshwater habitat. So think of salmon, river herring, American shad, striped bass. Um, in general, on the eastern half of the country, precipitation has been increasing. Western half of the country, precipitation has been decreasing. So this means increased stream flows in the east, decreased stream flows in the west. Um, again, large-scale changes, um, and the rest of these climate-driven changes have also been documented. Next slide, please. So again, climate change is a number of changes in the physical environment which are going to force changes in the biological environment. And these have been very well documented in a number of outlets. Next slide, please. So let's think a little bit about marine fisheries. Um, but before we do, let's just summarize a little bit about what we heard about climate change. First, there is regional variability in that global uh, climate change signal. Uh, precipitation is a good example. More rain in the east less rain in the west. And so the sort of contrasting, well, it's not getting warmer in my ocean, is not evidence against climate change. Climate change is happening, and there is regional variability in how this change is expressed across our ecosystems. The bottom slide, it's both variability and change. This morning was a very cold morning for Washington, D.C. in March. That variability happens at the same time that climate is changing. So the probability of these cold mornings in March is decreasing as the climate warms, but we still can have these cold March mornings. So it's the variability and change are both occurring. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for marine fisheries? In the Northeast, last week I had the opportunity to attend the Baird Symposium, which is put on by Rhode Island Sea Grant. That's Dave Monty's there. He was one of the hosts. Um, and sat down and listened to a number of recreational fishermen from around Rhode Island talking about changes that they have seen in response over their careers of fishing. So catching king mackerel and mahi-mahi off the coast of the northeast, striped bass overwintering in Rhode Island, um, and decreases in winter flounder productivity and population status. So these are what's happening in the northeast. This is where I work. This is what I know. This is a national conference, so how do I find out what's happening nationally? Next slide, please. I email friends. Um, so I'm director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, there are my counterparts throughout the country, so I emailed friends and documented what they had to say. Next slide, please. So Bob Foy, who's over here. Bob, what's going on in Alaska? Climate change and recreational fisheries. Salmon distributions and productivities are changing, um, and halibut productivity is changing. Next slide, please. I email Clay in the southeast. The Gulf Clay, what's happening? He says snook distribution is changing, southern flounder productivity is changing, and the Florida Bay ecosystem is changing structure. Next slide, please. Email Mike Secchi out of Pacific Islands. Tuna and billfish distributions and productivity are changing. The shoreline habitats are constricting, and there's increased coral bioerosion. Next slide, please. Again, Clay. Clay's got a lot of territory to cover. He's got the Gulf of Mexico. He's got the southeast U.S. He's got the Caribbean. So, Clay, what's happening in the southeast U.S.? Alrife runs are earlier, and pink shrimp, pink shrimp productivity is changing. Next slide, please. Uh, Kristen Cook, West Coast, Southwest Center, what's happening in the Southwest? Salmon productivity is changing, and rockfish productivity is changing. Next slide, please. 
So we put all these together and we come up with a more complete picture of how climate change is affecting marine fisheries. It's affecting distribution and timing. And these are the most two relatable changes. We'll hear comments you know, across a number of people that distributions are changing or the timing at which fish are coming into my area are changing. Productivity changes are more subtle. Uh, population's ability to increase or decrease is changing. Um, species inter interactions are changing. What fish are eating is changing. The food available to them is changing. And then their habitats is ch are changing. So the Hawaii examples of shoreline habitats constricting, and we'll hear from Carrie more about that uh, coming up. Next slide, please. So what does this do? Uh, a number of physical changes driving a number of biological changes that affect recreational fishing. This is creating a number of challenges um, in the management arena and in terms of the you know, ability of fish. Catch limits, bycatch, discards, allocation, availability, infrastructure. Um, Mid-Atlantic Council talking about black sea bass allocation. Uh, California salmon uh, you know, the risk of Chinook extinction in California. Uh, sea level rise in the Gulf of Mexico putting infrastructure at risk. These are challenges that we are facing. Next slide, please. There are also opportunities here. Black sea bass in the Gulf of Maine. Um, glaciers retreating, creating salmon habitat in Alaska. Benito and bluefin tuna being caught further north along the coast of California. Thank you. So these challenges and opportunities are occurring at the same time. And I think what we are going to be talking about today is how do we address the challenges and make the opportunities that present themselves at the same time. Next slide, please. And the way you know we've been thinking about this is our challenges, our opportunities, climate resilient fisheries and offshore wind energy development are all leading us in the same direction. Um, and pulling a word from Witt's presentation this morning, how do we get there together? It's through collaboration. How do we work on these problems together to find the solutions that will help us take advantages of the opportunities while addressing these challenges? So thank you very much, um, and I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Coit. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Richard Heap. I'm from Brookings, Oregon. So some observations from the Pacific Northwest about climate change. Kind of set the stage for you. This is my home port in Brookings, Oregon. It's located on the southern Oregon coast about four nautical miles above the California border. It has capacity for about 400 recreational commercial boats up to 100 feet. This is a maintained channel with jetties directing the flow over the bar. It's dredged to a nominal depth of 14 feet at low tide. It's at the mouth of the Chetco River, which is a typical Oregon coastal stream. It heads at 3,500 feet in the coast range and flows 56 miles to the coast. It is a high gradient, gravel rich, cold water stream. This is typical of most of the Oregon coastal ports. There are nine ports in Oregon. Seven of them are small, compact ports. Significantly, they're easy to survey for catch and effort estimate. The native fish in this stream include Chinook salmon, winter steelhead, and sea run cutthroat trout. Next slide, please. So the iconic fish in the Northwest are salmon. Uh, in Oregon last year, there were 98,670 Oregon angler trips for salmon. This is a picture of Chinook. These are the larger variety. Uh, the fishery there is a 24-inch minimum size, two salmon per day, 20 salmon, 20 salmon per season. The source of fish for our fishery is from the uh, Sacramento Basin and Klamath Rivers in California. These populations have been struggling since 2014 with the beginning of the marine heat wave, and now most recently we've had freshwater challenges because of the drought. To show you the contrast, the catch in Brookings for Chinook salmon in 2013 was 10,550 fish. Last year was 895. The season in 2013 was 130 days. Last year it was 58. In addition to that, we've seen a southern distribution of Chinook, 
to the area off of the coast of San Francisco. We have a big blob of cold water there full of anchovies, and so mostly they're staying there. Next slide, please. So coho salmon are the most abundant salmon in Oregon, provides the majority of the recreational catch. Last year, the Oregon harvest was 93,456 coho. Our fishery is an 18-inch minimum size. And in the summer, we fish mark select, meaning we can only retain fish with a keeled adipose clip. These are hatchery fish. And we're allowed, uh, for salmon, no more than two single-point barbless hooks in the ocean. The fish source for our fisheries off of Oregon are from the lower Columbia River hatcheries. Next slide, please. So I'm often asked, well, how on earth do you know where these fish are from? So this is an example of two Chinook salmon that have had their snouts removed. Um, the reason they took the snouts off is because the port sampler detected a coated wire tag in the nose of the fish. Coated wire tags are small pieces of stainless steel wire that are magnetized. They're smaller than a grain of rice, and they're inserted in the nose of the fish when they're juveniles in the hatchery. They're laser etched with a unique code number on them, and that code will tell you the brood year that they represent and the hatchery from which they came. And that's how we've been able to kind of determine salmon distribution in the ocean. Um, I can tell you a lot about these particular fish, though so those fish were both three years old. They were from the Feather River, which is part of the Sacramento Basin. And based on my personal research, I grilled them, baked them, and smoked them, and they were delicious. <laughs> so, next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about the impacts on freshwater, particularly the drought. This is a picture of Shasta Reservoir taken in February. It is down 171 vertical feet from full. Shasta is part of the California um, Central Valley Project, which provides it's a series of 20 dams that were built for flood control, hydroelectric, and irrigation storage. And it generally provides water for agriculture and municipal use in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valleys. Right now, the snowpack in the Sierras, which feeds most of those reservoirs, is at 64%. Next slide, please. So this is another depiction of Shasta Reservoir. This is the largest reservoir in California. It has a capacity at full of 4,552,000 acre feet. It's 38 miles long and covers 47 square miles. It is now at 25 percent capacity. So the, the upshot of that is that the outmigrant salmon particularly are challenged because we don't have sufficient flow to get them to the ocean. What flow there is is warm, and they're uh, consumed by predators, pumps, and uh, just suffer from the warm water as they're trying to outmigrate to the ocean. All the hatchery produced salmon in, in California now are trucked to the ocean. There's none that naturally migrate. We no longer have summer in the West. We call it fire season now. Next slide, please. So we also have what we call bottom fish, which is primarily lingcod and rockfish. The four fish on the left here are lingcod, very popular game fish. They grow relatively fast, and their populations have been pretty stable over the last several years. Um, we see them up to 40 pounds in Oregon. They get larger than that in Alaska. The fishery is limit is uh, two fish a day, 22-inch minimum size. These fish spawn in January, February, and March, which is usually weather protected, so we don't get much activity on them this time of year. Over the last three years, we've seen fishing days increase dramatically during the winter period. And now we're at the point in, in Oregon of talking about a closure in the winter for lingcod and rockfish. Next slide, please. So rockfish are kind of the bedrock fishery in Oregon. It is open year-round, provides about 110,000 angler trips a year. But the angler trips are dependent on the availability of salmon. So when salmon fishing is down, rock fishing participation goes up. Um, these are slow-growing long-lived fish, and the general population trend over the last several years, many years, has been down. 
the season as we have it right now is open year round, five fish per day, with sub limits of one spe one fish of various species, including these two. These are copper and quillback rockfish. Just to show you the change, when I started fishing 20 years ago, the limit was 10, and then it ratcheted down to seven, and then it went down to five, and now it's five with the one fish limit on some species. Next slide, please. So there are some better things happening, however. These are albacore tuna. Uh, they occur where the cold water, inshore cold water currents meet the offshore warm water. The participation in this fishery has been growing steadily since 2000. In 2020, there were 5,625 trips in Oregon with 20,856 fish landed. The major change in this has come from the participation in salmon declining and primarily from better equipment. We have a group of boats now that are built purpose built to do this. So the Al Albacore boat in Oregon will be a welded aluminum boat with a cabin. It'll be 25 to 30 feet long, have a fuel capacity between 100 and 150 gallons and the capability of icing and holding 40 medium-sized tuna. Um, our, we grade our tuna. Anything under nine pounds is considered small. Mediums are nine to 15, and large are over 15. The limit is 25 a day, but generally if we catch 10 apiece, we consider that a good day. The other thing that has changed is the technology, particularly the open the satellite ocean temperature imaging that we get. That enables us to pull that up, locate the place where there's going to be a good interface between those two currents, and concentrate our fishing effort on that. Like I said, normally we're 30 to 40 miles offshore for this fishery, but in recent years that's been moving in. We've had it as close as 13 miles, which greatly increases participation when that happens. Next slide, please. So this is something we've been seeing lately. These are pyrosomes. This is a colonial tunicate. It's actually a, a large group of individuals formed into a tube shape, about the size of a cigar. As the waters have warmed, we started seeing these things more. Uh, the primary implication for us is that they foul gear terribly. So if you're trolling for salmon, you are constantly cleaning your gear, trying to get the pyrosomes off. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, uh, we have domoic acid issues. So domoic acid is a byproduct of harmful algal blooms. It is toxic to humans in high concentrations. We see this in the muscle tissue of clams and, and mussels. So we have periodic closures during the summer on those when the, the domoic acid concentrations rise. We've also seen the collecting the viscera on Dungeness crabs, and we've seen our crab season delayed for five out of the last seven years which has a tremendous commercial impact as well as recreational impact. So kind of in summation, what we're seeing is that climate change is obvious to us. Fishermen are beginning to start to become more aware of it. And there is a great deal of concern now about the future of our fisheries, particularly salmon. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Sikorsky. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm the executive director of Coastal Conservation Association, Maryland. And uh, like all of you or many of you, I'm an angler. That's how I ended up here today. So I put a bunch of pictures of people fishing. Uh, that's what it's all about. And um, I had the honor of speaking in 2018 in this room about habitat and forage, because it's a big part of the work I do as the executive director of CCA Maryland. Um, and of course, uh, we're talking about change, and I had to reflect back on all the change that's occurred um, for all of us in the last four years. And um, for me, I can measure it by gray in my beard, hair on my keyboard, uh, maybe some weight on my waistline. Um, but the consistencies are, are what I like to, to focus on as well, because um, it's great to see so many familiar faces here uh, and still be able to stand up here and talk a bit. Um, as, a, uh, as somebody that grew up in Maryland, uh, the Chesapeake Bay is in my blood. 
Uh, it will always be. Um, and for all of you, whether you're or anybody on the Atlantic coast, um, what happens in the Chesapeake Bay affects your fisheries. And, and that's why I'm, I'm honored to talk a bit today about the work I get to do every day on behalf of recreational anglers and in partnership with so many diverse communities and diverse people and, and thoughts and ideas. Um, what I think all of us have in common as anglers is that we have to be optimists. We have to face adversity in many ways when we head out to the water, whether it be walking down to a shoreline or, or heading 80 miles offshore. Um, we're seeking something, you know, an experience. Uh, we're seeking an opportunity that, that all hinges on access and, and abundance. Um, you know, Witt mentioned so many great things that I almost wish I had his speech up here to, to highlight it and, and reference them again. But I think we all understand what, what connects us and then that passion to, to pursue these, these species. Um, for various reasons. And um, again, I mentioned that uh, last time I was here, I talked about habitat and forage. And uh, I think about that a lot in the, in the sense of climate change because those are two really important issues. Um, they were actually, um, yesterday as, as I started to talk with some of you, as we arrived, um, I was reminded that, that food and habitat are really important to us. I heard one person note that there's a lot of restaurants that have closed. So there's different forage availability to us in this area because of the pandemic. I, a Texan that I spoke to this morning went jogging. It was 24 degrees this morning. You think that Texan had a little bit of shock when they ran outside in that weather? So we're fortunate that we can build structures. We learned this as children. You know, shelter, food, or these water, these important things that we need, we're resilient. And so it's really important that we do what we can in, in this entire three or two days is about talking about what we can do to be resilient for the things we rely on. These, these fish. You know, the, the smiles you see on that screen are something that we want to sustain into the future. Um, and so, again, the habitat and forage piece is something we can't forget, but I want to talk a little bit about these fish because we all know as anglers, we generally pick up the big ones and show them off. Um, and we like the smile when we do that. Sometimes we take them home and eat them, but we can't forget about how they got to that point and what's changing to reset our expectations for the future. Um, and so, from the Chesapeake Bay perspective, these are all pictures of fish caught in this region um, and fish that thankfully exist a lot to, to a lot of anglers from, from Maine and, and around to the Gulf um, in some of these species cases. Um, the red drum in the top left corner in the Chesapeake Bay, um, they've been here. They've been here before, but they're here in, uh, in higher frequency than ever before. And the anglers that I represent, I get to work with, are interacting with them more and more. So it's a, an opportunity. Um, that is coming from the south with those warming waters that we've seen. There's good and bad with it, um, but it's a great angling opportunity um, for those, those big fish, like that one in the top left corner, but also the younger ones. Well, what a redfish need to be successful? They need habitat. They need forage. Uh, we need to be smart about how we're impacting the juvenile species in this region, um, especially to the south of us here. Um, the Spanish mackerel there in the top middle, a fantastic fish that many don't realize how valuable it is. Um, I've been talking with folks about how if you can take an oily fish like that, that mo many people say you're either going to eat it fresh or smoke it. Well, there's better ways to even utilize those. And so we've seen a pulse of them in this region uh, recently, and they're an opportunity for the angling community to, uh, to utilize, um, especially for higher fleets that, that have lost striped bass uh, seasons in, in abundance. So there's a great opportunity there. Uh, the sheep's head personal favorite. Um, I think folks have referred to them as trash fish in the past, but as somebody that loves to grill a fish and cook fish, uh, they're, they're fantastic on the half shell. So I highly recommend it. Guess where they live? Around oyster reefs. Guess what history has told us about the Chesapeake Bay? When we had much higher oyster, oyster abundance and bigger reefs, which, include, which improve water quality and improve resiliency, we had a lot more sheep's head. And so they're coming back. Is it waters? Is it habitat? I don't know, but it's a bright spot, I think, and it's something that's kind of returning to an opportunity for us. And from a management perspective, we've got to think about that. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner, the black sea bass. We all know that they've shot to the north and confused management, and kudos to the people at the Mid-Atlantic Council and Commission who are working towards the harvest control rule and these other uh, opportunities to improve how we can manage these fish for where they are. There's lots of challenges facing them, but their range is expanded. Um, and uh, again, stick with the conversations about how we can shape um, a better future for black sea bass fishery because it's accessible to more people now than ever. And that's a good thing if we can manage it properly. 
and we better manage it properly. It's such a key piece that can, can lead to success for so many people, from headboats to even shoreline people, uh, anglers in the Northeast. Um, and, and it's such an important part of my, my um, up, up raising um, fish on Captain Monty's boat. Um, some of the best times I've had is leaving Ocean City on a headboat, you know, elbow to elbow with my, my fellow anglers, enjoying fish to take home for dinner. So we, we can't forget that. Um, we have this tendency to remember the private anglers and the folks that can invest in a larger boat and kind of do it on their own, but we can't forget every single piece of the fishing community that must access these fish. We do that through good conservation and good abundance of, of these stocks um, and access to them. Um, and so my notes are horrendous, but we'll get going here. All right, we've got a cobia in the bottom middle. We're seeing these expand, and, and management has shifted. Um, it's been tough, but management is getting out in front and trying to understand how do we manage these. Maryland's never had, it hasn't had regulations until the last couple of years. They're showing up in, in Delaware. They're showing up in New Jersey. And so there's opportunities underway, and, and we play an important role. Um, I want to highlight something that the state of Virginia has been doing to require anglers to report what they're catching and you know, mandate that they turn in these, these reports. These are something we better get on board with as the angling community um, to improve the information that we're giving. And I, and I don't think it's new for us. I think we've been coming up with great ideas for a long time. Um, our friends, the striped bass. Well, the Chesapeake, of course, uh, is dealing with its challenges from a water quality perspective. My hometown of Baltimore has been in the news recently with failures to treat raw sewage. That's a major issue that we need to rise up and use our voice um, to, to highlight the impacts that it has. Um, I'm very fortunate that I get to build artificial reefs with students. In fact, if it wasn't 20-some degrees today, um, our team would have been out there doing that. Uh, we're building artificial reefs with every fifth grader in Calvert County, a county bordered by the, the Patuxent River and, and the Chesapeake Bay, a really important place to inform and educate people. I mention that because in Maryland we call that forget forage. Forage that feeds them to make them successful, make them healthy, is a issue that we've come together on, like Whit mentioned, but the work's not done. We have to ask ourselves, is it acceptable to remove massive levels of forage in a changing climate, with the time that's changing faster than ever? Is it okay to just continue on hundreds of years of history of removing massive amounts of forage in the Atlantic Coast's most important estuary, the Chesapeake Bay? The burden of, of proof is reversed in the way we're managing forage right now. And, and I know it's tough to change what's happening with, with existing fisheries. There's always gonna be that back and forth between commercial and recreational. But if we don't get this right, that striped bass is moving to the north, its food's moving to the north, and we have to be really careful that we take care of the ones that are still in the Chesapeake. So they're not a loser in climate change. Um, and so the, I wanna mention w one more thing about our responsibility. Um, and I want folks to think about this and share some of their experiences as we go to the breakout rooms. Uh, the Maryland legislature right now is considering a, a bill that will improve our recreational data and licensing systems. It will impanel a task force of folks like us to work through solutions to provide them to fisheries managers. We have all had the experience where we bring good ideas to fisheries managers and the answer is, oh, we don't have the budget, we don't have the capacity. And as stakeholders which pay into a system, we have to be patient. We have to understand that you cannot give up and continue to focus on solutions. This bill in the Maryland's legislature will give us some solutions to impanel a task force and come up with solutions that we come up with as a community and ask decision makers in the future to implement. And it's taking little bites at the massive elephant that is rec data and rec management. And if we don't have a better reason than, uh, we have a better reason than ever right now, and that's how fast our climate's changing, how fast things are changing on the water, and anglers have a front row seat for this stuff, so we need to be the ones around the table working with the great leaders that we have in our nation and the great opportunity we have to express our interests and our desires so we can shape things for a brighter future and really making lemons or lemonade out of lemons because that's what we as rec anglers do. Um, and we, we take what's available to us, we, we head out to the water um, with, with optimism, with an interest in, in maybe bringing home some food but really having a good experience, stepping away from our, our jobs, and we have to continue to shift the management of our fisheries away from a construct built on commercial fishing and maximum sustainable yield and really recognize on uh, how important the experience is for, for all of us and, and all of us into the future. So thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carrie Selberg Robinson, as Janet said, um, and I am with the Office of Habitat Conservation, and I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, while I've been with NOAA Fisheries for quite some time now, um, I got my start um, in this work at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and I didn't realize until this morning how many old friends I would see in the audience from those days. Um, so it's really good to see everybody today. I put our mission statement um, right on our cover slide um, because we don't um, just do habitat work just because. Um, we do it for a purpose. We do it because we know healthy habitat is foundational to our nation's fisheries, um, as well as to resilient coastal ecosystems. Uh, today, um, I'm really going to focus on a couple of specific examples um, of how our work interacts um, with um, climate um, and our changing climate. Uh, but um, both Kara Meckley um, back there, one of my division chiefs, and I um, will be happy to tuck your ear off um, over the next couple of days about some of our broader work and how it intersects um, with a lot of people in this room. Next slide, please. So first, I'm going to focus a little bit on our restoration work. Um, for more than 30 years, we've worked to restore habitat, supporting our nation's fisheries. We've invested over $2 billion through our grant programs to do this work. And in addition to this grant funding, my team is located across uh, coastal states, um, and we provide technical expertise through all aspects of our restoration work. And you see some of the results here. Um, acres restored, stream miles opened. And while I am incredibly proud of what we have accomplished over the past many decades, um, I am even more excited to talk to you about what I see coming in the future. So as Whit mentioned, um, we were thrilled, truly thrilled, <laughs> when Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, providing a historic investment in our work over the next five years. Um, we're going to be running competitive grant programs um, focused on habitat restoration and fish passage. And my team, as I mentioned, all across our coastal states are going to be standing ready to work with our partners to implement even more of this habitat, habitat restoration work around the country. So please stay tuned um, for those, those funding announcements. I, I expect a lot of exciting things happening in the next a uh, couple of weeks, couple of months. Next slide, please. So as a way to really dive into our restoration work, I want to walk you through a specific project, um, which has a strong connection to fish populations important to wreck fishermen, and that's the Robinson Preserve Restoration Site in Southwest Florida. No, I know, right? I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so restoration here took place on degraded coastal farmland and created over 100 acres of wetlands creating important juvenile sport fish habitat that's now open to the public. Um, I was talking to Russ the other day and I think he was just here a couple of weekends ago. Um, so we created key habitats um, such as seagrasses and oyster reefs to provide habitat for early life stages of fish like red drum and snook. We did this work with a lot of partners. Um, so uh, I didn't want to turn my presentation into acronym soup, um, but just know <laughs> we don't do this work alone. So this is representative of many different funding sources, many different partners um, to get this work done. I also want to talk a little bit about how we took climate change into effect um, into account while we were um, planning this project. And it's really in two important ways. Um, the first is we design the restoration to withstand sea level rise. So we do things like setting upland island elevations higher than current conditions. Um, we also um, know that climate change is creating disturbances in our current conditions. So we've heard a lot about that already. Habitat restoration um, can provide different refuge for fish who are recovering from a variety of climate disturbances. So something like a fish kill from a red tide 
um, we know those fish need refuge um, to recover from those climate disturbances, and habitat restoration projects can provide that refuge. Next slide, please. So our work is ongoing at Robinson Preserve. Um, we don't do a project and then just walk away. Um, we want to make sure that the project is working as planned um, and it's creating the benefits that we expected to see. So again, we're working with a lot of partners um, and we're building a comprehensive fisheries monitoring program that includes socioeconomic studies um, to make sure we're seeing the benefits we hope to see. Um, that we're understanding and learning from this for the next project. We're monitoring fish communities so that we can understand what habitat features the fish are using. We're also monitoring fish movement in order to understand juvenile sport fish from Robinson are successfully leaving this system and joining adult populations in the larger nearby estuaries. So this is the example of the kind of project that we really hope to get to do all over the country with the infrastructure dollars. Next slide, please. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, and I am going to move away from talking about our restoration portfolio and um, talk about some of our work our office does more broadly to conserve habitat habitats that are also being impacted by climate change. We are using all of our available authorities and our strategic partnerships, um, like the National Fish Habitat Partnership, so that we can work together to conserve these habitats. As we know, all know, uh, many economic development projects along our coast can impact fish habitat. And we are using our essential fish habitat tools to make sure we are minimizing that impact as much as possible. A specific example to share with you, um, NOAA Fisheries has been working with the Army Corps of Engineers and the part of Houston Authority um, for over 30 years to ensure that dredging projects, which are needed for port operation, use the resulting sediment to enhance fish habitat like salt marsh and oyster reefs. Next slide. I am excited to share with you a new tool um, that we've developed with our partners in the Northeast, partners um, with many of you here in the room. Um, using the same approach that was used for fish climate vulnerability assessments, we looked at 52 different habitats in the ocean, estuaries, rivers, and determined how vulnerable each of those habitat is to climate change. Knowing that habitat vulnerability is one way we can bring critical ecosystem information into decision making. I am not going to walk you through the results of that assessment, don't worry. Um, but this red, yellow, green um, graphic is just one of the outputs. And you'll see a lot of warm colors on the chart here indicating many of the habitats fish rely on are vulnerable to climate change, especially in our estuaries. For example, a species like summer flounder relies on several nearshore habitats, including salt marsh and shellfish reefs, that are highly vulnerable to climate change. So we all have an important opportunity to focus our habitat restoration, conservation, and management where we know those pinch points in nearshore habitats are occurring. And the results can be used in concert with the fish climate vulnerability assessments um, to provide a broader ecosystem context for fisheries management decisions. Next slide. Thank you all for your time. Um, as I said, both Kara and I are here um, for the next couple of days and would love to talk to you more about our work in the Office of Habitat. Thanks so much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Kylie Dancy. I am going to cover an overview of the East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning Initiative, uh, which is being conducted by all of the organizations shown on this slide, the three East Coast Fishery Management Councils, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and NOAA Fisheries. Next slide. So um, what we're doing with this initiative is looking forward into the future and trying to figure out 
how East Coast governance and fishery management issues are going to be affected by climate-driven changes in fisheries, with a particular focus on changing stock availability and distribution. Um, so our second objective with this process is to advance specific tools and processes that are going to provide us with additional flexibility and robust fishery management strategies, which are going to continue to promote our goals of conservation and resilient fishing communities, but also allow us to address uncertainty in an era of climate change. Next slide. So what we're really doing with this project is using scenario planning as a tool for planning and action in the context of an uncertain future. So. Scenario planning is a tool that allows us to do that by sort of exploring different plausible futures. Um, there are a lot of different predictions about what is going to happen with climate change and to East Coast fisheries specifically as the result of climate change going forward, but there's also a lot of uncertainty about exactly what is going to happen with all these different elements of climate change and how fast. Um, the basic premise of scenario planning is that we ask the question, you know, if we knew that certain conditions would occur in the future, what would we do now to prepare for that future? So, for example, in this East Coast process, we so far have been kind of thinking about questions like, um, what if species distribution changes accelerate? Um, Dr. Hare mentioned Gulf Stream changes earlier. What if the Gulf Stream continues to change? What if the frequency uh, and intensity of extreme weather events increases? What if recreational fishing effort substantially increases or decreases. Um, so these are just a few examples of many different drivers, drivers of change that we've been thinking about in this process so far. Next slide. So scenario planning then allows us to consider under different possible combinations of future conditions, which management actions and governance strategies are going to be beneficial under a range of management or under a range of different future conditions and in contrast which management actions and governance strategies should be avoided due to them causing reduced flexibility or increased difficulty adapting to future conditions. Next slide. And it's important to note that scenario planning is not a method of prediction or a forecast. It's just a framework for allowing us to explicitly consider uncertainty in future conditions, it, and it's intended to stimulate um, creative and innovative thinking and to avoid a trap we can of, often fall into where we might be overconfident in a single uh, vision of the future and end up focusing too narrowly on what we expect to happen and not really planning well for surprises. So scenario planning allows for planning for multiple possible futures. Next slide. So just to give an example of what a set of scenarios might look like once they are drafted, this is an example from the Pacific Fishery Management Council scenario planning process, and they completed that scenario creation pro process in 2020, and this is from their final report on the scenarios. So this, is a, this grid structure is a kind of a common way that scenarios are structured, although it's not the only possibility, but essentially what you have here is a two axes showing a spectrum for two different major drivers of change that represent major sources of uncertainty. So the major drivers that the Pacific Council chose were climate and ocean conditions, as well as species abundance and availability. So when you consider those drivers in combination, you end up with the four quadrants shown here, and each kind of describes a different scenario with a different view of the future. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about these really, but the upper right, you know, for example, the box of chocolate scenario, that this is assuming that there is a world of environmental surprises and extremes, but also that on average stock abundance is steady or increasing. And so from this basic framework, you can do some sort of additional work to fill in the details of what that would mean for fisheries, what that would look like, and then from there get into discussions about how you might prepare for such a future. Next slide. So getting back to the East Coast Initiative, there are six major phases we've planned for this project, three of which have been completed. So after we first defined the project objectives, we, did, we conducted a scoping phase last summer and fall, followed by an exploration phase that we just completed to kind of dig deeper into factors that are driving changes in East Coast fisheries in greater detail. So I'll talk more about the later phases in a bit, but just wanted to quickly touch on some of what we did during scoping and exploration. Next slide. So our scoping activities uh, included preparation of some introductory materials, including a website, 
and brochures and series of videos. We also held three introductory webinars introducing the initiative and seeking some initial feedback from participants on uh, factors driving change in fisheries. And we also sought this feedback by an online questionnaire to get at experiences that stakeholders are having with climate change and what major drivers of change um, the respondents viewed as important or uncertain or potentially surprising to consider through this process. Next slide. So then a couple of highlights from the scoping process were that we saw a very high level of interest in these issues, obviously affecting a lot of people and people are really interested in this process. Um, there were a lot of examples given by stakeholders of areas where they're already seeing the effects of climate change or changes that are thought to be driven by climate. So there are a few examples that are shown on this slide. We heard many more. We heard a lot of things that have been discussed already this morning. Observations of shifting species, changes in fish productivity and size, shifts in timing or frequency of spawning, habitat, food web changes, um, a lot of examples about how these factors are then influencing human communities, like businesses that are adapting to new species compositions, as well as things like storms and sea level rise impacting boat access and infrastructure. So in addition to those examples of what folks are seeing already, we were able to have scoping participants sort of identify a range of broader drivers of oceanographic, biological, and socioeconomic change that they would expect to see influence fisheries over the next 20 years. Next slide. So for the next phase, we, help, we use that feedback from scoping and the commonly identified drivers of change to dig in more detail to examine what factors are expected to cause change in the fisheries. We held three webinars late February and early March of this year where we prepared a set of overview materials and we held a panel discussion on these kind of three different categories, including all the subtopics that are listed here for each, a lot of which we, we heard about during the scoping process. So um, during these webinars, we heard a lot of great insight from panelists that we invited to, to participate in these. and. All of these factors you know, that are listed here range pretty broadly in the ways that they might impact fisheries as well as in their predictability. So these drivers of change essentially will form the building blocks of the next steps of this process, um, specifically the scenario creation process. Next slide, please. So now I'll briefly talk about the next phases planned for this project, including we have a scenario creation stage planned for this summer, and then application and monitoring will come later this fall and in early next year. Next slide. So the next phase is the scenario creation process, which is a critical step in the initiative. So this will involve a workshop where participants will create three to five different scenarios to consider how climate change uh, might impact East Coast fisheries over the next 20 years using different combinations of, of future drivers of change that I discussed previously. So again, these aren't predictions. They're supposed to be plausible, relevant, memorable stories describing conditions that we might face. Next slide, please. And for this step, we are planning a two and a half day in-person workshop. This sort of process really works better with an in-person um, setup, including about 75 in-person participants. And we have a lot of interest in this initiative and, and do need to limit um, participation. So I will note we are, we will be considering participants for this workshop based on a short application that we hope to have available next week. So keep an eye out for that if you're, if you're interested in participating. We're aiming to have a balance across different stakeholder groups and regions, as well as a balance of people that are heavily involved in the current management process or in currently in the fisheries and some who may not necessarily be as um, in tune with the current systems that we have set up. Um, we do plan to partially stream some of this workshop, but participation in the scenario creation discussions will be mostly limited to the in-person uh, participants. Next slide, please. Um, so following this scenario creation workshop, we do intend to have some additional webinars that will serve the purpose of a scenario deepening, we're calling it, meaning um, seeking comments on the draft scenarios that are going to be created at this workshop and adding additional details based on reactions to those stories and further thinking about those stories so that we can make sure we have a, a set of scenarios at the end of this that are detailed and realistic and really relevant to considering what might happen in the future. So this will these webinars will provide an additional opportunity for involvement for folks that are unable to attend the scenario creation workshop. Next slide. And then 
Following the uh, creation of the scenarios, we have the applications phase where we will use the um, scenarios as a platform for discussion of future uh, fishery governance and management issues. So this is really where the most important conversations are going to happen about what we do with this information. So the previous steps aren't really intended to be focused on solutions or changes. They're sort of prior to this point. Um, arriving at a set of scenarios which are a means to an end. And so then those scenarios will ultimately allow for sort of productive and creative uh, conversations about East Coast governance and management and ultimately help us decide on tools and processes that need to be advanced. Next slide, please. And at the end of this process, we do intend to have, we have a specific list of project outputs. So we, I won't read these out, but you can see they include not only the scenarios, but we do hope to have more specific policy and management recommendations outputs, um, among other things. There are a lot of unknowns in exactly how these are going to be structured, but um, we do intend to, we want to keep in mind that we really do need concrete outputs uh, from this project, so it's not just a, an ap academic exercise. Next slide, please. So um, that's a very brief overview. It's hard to cover all that in 10 minutes, but lastly, I'll just point you toward our website for this initiative, which has a lot of additional information as well as some recordings of previous webinars. And uh, feel free to contact me or any of the core team members that are listed here. Thank you. Thank you to all our excellent panelists. Now we're going to have a period of Q&A. And I invite you to address a question to the entire panel or to one of the uh, panelists. I'm going to kick it off, however, with a question that will, I think, tie together uh, the first and the last. And my question is, given the pace of change and the, the limits on our resources, how does our management system keep up, our science-based management system keep up with the changes that we're seeing even the scenario planning, that is fantastic, uh, takes, you're talking about two years before you even get to concrete. And I think that MSA, um, the brilliance of MSA is how it invites engagement. So that you buy into decision making, but it's not fast. So I'm going to ask John and then maybe Kylie to address that question of, you know, how do we continue our scientific integrity and make good decisions um, with the flexibility using our management authorization and tools now? Thank you, Janet. Um, you know, I don't have a magic answer because I don't think there is a magic answer, but I think it, I'll go back to what you said, Janet. The, you know, you said the brilliance of Magnuson, I believe, is its participatory nature. If you look at a number of our environmental laws, I think Magnuson is the most participatory. And just from my own perspective, I think that is what gives it the most strength. And so I think to, to get to climate resilient fisheries is going to take increased participation and increased voices to sort of help management move faster and more broadly in that direction. So I think it's an opportunity for all of us to, to bring that perspective to uh, the participatory process that has been set up by Magnuson. Yeah, I, I think this came up on at least one of our recent webinars for the scenario planning process. And I, I can't remember who said it, might have been Dr. Malin Pinsky but was talking about maybe we need to have kind of two tracks of information. Um, in addition to our kind of traditional timeline where, you know, we, we have assessments and we have management actions that might be responding a little slower than we would like, we should start to incorporate more uh, fisherman knowledge and local ecological knowledge about, um, you know, for folks that are able to see changes faster and be able to find better ways to incorporate that into our management process so that we are kind of operating on, on a sources of information that might be quicker and we might be able to hopefully think through ways in the scenario planning process where we can respond to that information faster. Would anyone else like to address that or should we move to other questions? Please come up to the microphone, say your name and what organization you're with and don't be shy. And we have mic runners. Oh, go I ahead, Dave. One quick comment because it relates kind of to the stakeholder piece of this that scientific puzzle, and um, we're we're here 
as a community, of course, to help collect data. I mentioned that in my comments. Um, so cooperative management is key, and then also knowledge. And so I didn't mention it previously, but kudos to the increased investment in MREP education program. I'm on the National Steering Committee and the Mid-Atlantic Implementation Team, and uh, we just got back in person in March, and it was great. And that is where the rubber hits the road for so many anglers, because um, obviously this stuff is alphabet soup and overwhelming for all of us. And um, helping us set our expectations a little bit better is key, and I think management and leaders can't forget that. It's an expectation of that access and opportunity and the, and the enjoyable time on the water. And so um, we can't lose focus of that as we evolve in our, our scientific views and, and what our laws require us to do. Thank you, David. And that was MREP with an E, the education program. Um, please uh, raise your hand or stand up. I cannot believe after those presentations um, that some of you don't have questions or thoughts to offer. Uh, thank you. Would you like to stand up? I guess I do. Um, thanks. Appreciate it. So uh, none of you guys. John, can you please give your name and yeah, organization? Sure. Uh, it's John McMurray, and I guess I'm, I'm here representing the uh, American Saltwater Guides Association. Um, so I noted that nobody really mentioned uh, what I see as the elephant in the room, the allocation issues that come with, with shifting stocks. And, uh, you know, clearly things are moving north, but the council has been, and, and no fisheries have been very slow to respond in a fair and equitable way. And I'm just wondering, I guess this is a question for Kylie and Carrie, what's, uh, what's the plan or what's the policy moving forward to address shifting stocks from a management perspective? And this is, this is not a resiliency issue, it's an allocation issue. So I'd like to hear from you guys on that. It's a, yeah, it's a good question. I think that in this scenario planning process, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get down into the weeds of specific allocation discussions. You know, certainly not we're talking about FMP level um, changes that we might expect in allocation, but I think we do need to kind of think broadly about what is our, given that we have a lot of species that are managed or multiple jurisdictions, we need to think about our governance strategy and how that is going to you know help or hinder our ability to kind of adapt our allocations as needed and we need to think about a general kind of policies around allocation that might be um, useful to incorporate some uh, climate change information and species distribution shifts so I think the climate change scenario planning provides a venue for the sort of broader policy and governance discussions about that but is not necessarily going to get into species level allocation discussions is my understanding I'm going, to, I'm going to spare Carrie Robinson because she's the habitat conservation person and uh, Jenny Wallace is not going to be asked to answer but she is in the room she's the head of sustainable fisheries where are you Jenny she's somebody to approach um, but I'll say John I think that's an excellent question um, coming from Rhode Island um, we've had legislation for years to put Rhode Island on the mid because of the you know that the species that are landed commercially and, and recreationally and there is authority under MSA that I think no one needs to be to use um, to determine uh, whether something whether a fishery is federal or state um, what which councils uh, manage them so again the brilliance you know would like the council process to work um, but we need councils in some cases there's co-management of two councils I think that's a good solution in some cases maybe uh, the FMP should shift um, to a council that's further north but I think there is an opportunity and I know Jenny's working on some guidance in regard to that I think that is one of the challenges that we have in front of us in terms of how our geographic based councils manage when we have stocks that are expanding or shifting north so very much on our minds an excellent question be interested to have people discuss it further yeah that, if I could just add something I'm, I'm not one I don't like language very much I'm much more comfortable with numbers but I think language here matters um, in my presentation I talked about changing distributions John you referred to shifting distributions those are not synonymous uh, changing distribution is a broad category shifting distribution implies a stock is moving from here to here 
Um, there's also expanding distributions, a stock moving from here to here, and there's contracting distributions, a stock moving from here to here, and those differences are actually important in the management arena. So I think it is important to sort of tease out the sort of the elements of the language that we're using and think about the implications to our management. So it's shifting, contracting, um, and expanding. Um, I, I guess put your hand up and the mic runners will we'll bring it over to you. Uh, we'll keep going. How about we go left and right side of the room? Uh, Shane Cantrell from Galveston, Texas, own and operate a charter boat there. Um, kind of wondering how we better inform this climate resilient fishery conversation with recreational anglers and data collection. Um, what we're going to have is continually shifting things and moving from a thematic approach of access and opportunity to some real information that goes in to empower these decisions because this, this is happening fast and we need more data from the recreational fishery with the what we need to make these decisions and be prepared for this and consider a wide range of impacts um, considering we've got a lot of history in the recreational side of um, just not cooperation and data collection so just how do we address that and how do we get this going I'll uh, speak from the West Coast perspective but we um we spend a lot of time talking to our angler groups about their responsibilities and that they are not they're not immune from responsibility here in terms of data collection so um, we have several mandatory requirements in Oregon for salmon steelhead sturgeon so we're doing a lot of that reporting but I always try and explain to people that you know you can't just step, sit back and say this is government's issue this is our issue and we need to be open and truthful when we're being contacted. That's one of the issues we've dealt with a lot is folks will not want to divulge necessarily how many rockfish they've released, for example, because they're worried that's going to have an impact. And so we've, we've worked hard to explain to them that you need to be part of the system, not the victim of the system, if that makes any sense to you. So. I can add to that. Um, the recreational community has always been a part of, of driving what we understand about these stocks. That ugly four-letter word, MRIP, is a piece of that. And so we've been participating in the ways that we're asked, whether it be surveyed on a dock, answering a phone call, responding in the mail. And so I think what you've pointed on a little bit is the one challenge that Witt mentioned, that we shoot inward on each other. We divide we, when we're doing that in this nation more than ever. Um, it's a big mistake, big, big, big mistake to divide. There's no conquering happening if we divide, especially in the situation of climate change. So I would urge all of us to stop thinking about pointing with a finger. And if you want to point, break out all 10, take your shoes off. Because that's the really the reality of the complexity of the challenges we face with the shifting stocks, the changes that Dr. Hare mentioned. Um, very, that was really important. I'm going to write that down. Um, you know, those, those key definitions because they're key and, and the reality is um, there's no simple solution because if there was we would have found one by now there's small incremental steps in the right direction I mentioned one of those that we're taking in Annapolis in Maryland um, it's our responsibility it's heck everybody wishes we started collecting data 10 years ago on the key issues we're trying to answer now so I would encourage every single one of us to stop pointing fingers and stop saying that it's just that easy because I report you report we report no it's not that simple if it was we'd have done it Okay, so let's focus on the optimism, make that lemonade, maybe occasionally splash a little vodka in it if that's what it takes. But let's work together and realize that we are trying to find solutions and it's not as easy as you think. Thank you. Let's do a question this side of the room. Oh, we got yeah, it. <laughs> good, good morning. Captain Scott Hickman from Galveston, Texas. I'm here with the Charter Fishermen Association. Um, great presentations, very compelling, informative. Uh, we've got big challenges. Uh, and this is kind of more of an ask than a question it is to the administration and Janet and your folks is this next Gulf Council meeting we've, we're going to have a presentation on FEPs uh, with fishery ecosystem plans and this this is a priority the climate resilient fisheries is our probably our biggest challenge biggest priority moving forward can we prioritize that and get 
pressure put onto our councils to really dive into this and take it seriously. And, and you know, let's work on this. You know, we just went through an administration that didn't want to talk about climate. We've got opportunity. Fishermen are looking at this. We're seeing it. And the Gulf, we, our Gulf Kobe have moved up the East Coast, shifting stocks on king mackerel now. Big water, you know, it, quality issues. The Eastern Gulf with the red tides. The dead zones getting more uh, pronounced in different ports, bigger. And uh, it, it's time that the administration would put some more pressure on these councils to move forward these FEPs. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, could people who are on a council stand up? Um, I think there's an. I think there's a number of people in the room. Just so we see. Um, because I think the fact that so many people are in the room means that, <laughs> yeah, so that's fantastic, you know, that I think these are all, um, you got, are all people that we can count on to press that issue when we will too. Thank you. Uh, oh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Monte. I'm a charter captain from Rhode Island. And as far as uh, groups, I'm a member of the Saltwater Anglers Association, on the board of the uh, Saltwater Guides Association, and the Rhode Island Party and Charter Boat Association. But um, I'm also a, a fishing writer, and uh, all of the input uh, that the panel presented, um, uh, John presented uh, some great insights, and Dave and Kylie, of how um, anglers are uh, experiencing climate impacts and as a fishing writer I see that because you're always trying to write about something interesting so I'm writing about things uh, such as um, how to fish uh, for, for bluefin tuna more and more because now they're a mile off our shore we have ground fish uh, in great abundance uh, who thought that uh, uh, 10 years ago as a charter captain I would be running black sea bass trips but I am um, scup uh, we have uh, uh, a big movement now with sea robins. People are catching a ton of sea robins. How to how to catch them and clean them and eat them. So these are all ways that anglers are, as Dave mentioned, adopting to adapting to uh, uh, climate change. So I think so I think that's happening. And I also see a big movement of the citizen science underway. I know that in Rhode Island, uh, like there are many software apps, we're developing one called uh, Angler Catch. Conservation is a big reason why anglers are actually uh, using uh, that app, but the ability to impact public policy is key. So this funnel of all the additional science uh, that we need, additional stock assessments, um, uh, additional climate research, uh, angler uh, participation in the research, you know, we have anglers who are catching uh, David, to your point about the striped bass, we have, believe it or not, a little striped bass fishery in December and January, February in our estuaries now, and the fish have lice on them. People are catching 36, 38 inch fish. In the spring, we have two or three inch uh, striped bass. So they're spawning in our area uh, somewhere. So with all of this going on, all the climate change going on, all the additional research, there needs to be on a federal level, some kind of funnel uh, that kicks, you know, we, we've kick-started the process. We need now to organize, prioritize, how does this information, this angler recreational input, uh, make it into the decision-making? Because that's what will disenchant angles if they don't see that we have a game plan and that the information is being used. So I don't know if anyone wanted to address that, and I've talked way too long, and I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree 100%, Dave. I mean, it's it's for me just sitting here. It's easy to, to recognize the passion in the room, and that if you were asked to go out and collect data on what you were catching, where you were catching, how big, what species, that it would be done, you know, and that you would do it well and you would do it accurately. But I think your point is exactly right. You know, it's it's one thing to collect the data. It's the other thing to really carefully think about how we would use that data. And I hear your call to action. You know, what is our, what would our plan be for self-reported recreational data into decision making? Um, and so I think, Janet, you mentioned that there's a Mayfac report which we are expecting 
uh, on self-reported data. I think one thing that you know we could look at is what would then the pathways be, and I don't know if they're doing this or not, um, what would then the pathways be into using that data in assessments or in management decisions. But I think that's the call to action. I mean, I think that's, I felt that in, you know, there is the willingness to collect data, but then it's on us to figure out how to use it. So thank you for the comment. Um, okay, th this side, Lisa, uh, wave your hand back there. If you if you have a question, you might want to get up and come go into that back corner of the room. Mike. Thanks. Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association, uh, based in the Mid-Atlantic and covered New England as well. Uh, I've appreciated the fishery to dependent discussion that we've just kind of kicked off. But my question is on the fishery independent data. I think it's directed at Dr. Hare. Do you feel like the fishery surveys that we have currently uh, do an adequate job of covering the spatial and temporal shifts that we're seeing? And, and I appreciated your nuance about the, the meaning of those words. So I just wanted you to kind of embellish on what kind of changes are coming on the fishery independent side. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to ask a scientist, does, does he think more research and data is needed? So yes, <laughs> um, that's the, the flippant answer. But I think there's a lot more, you know, and you, you alluded to it there. There are a number of species for which our fisheries independent data is you know, lacking or not as robust. It's, it's variable. It's a variable landscape. Um, and so, yeah, there are areas where I think fisheries independent data could be improved. Um, you know, in the president's FY22 budget, and I also think in the 23 budget, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I believe that there are, you know, requests for improvements in the fisheries independent data collection in the agency. So, yes, I think there is room to improve those. Um, one area that I think is, you know, lacking or, you know, so that's the, it's the boundary between sort of the state collected fishery independent data and the federally collected fishery independent data. I think more effort and more attention to how to bring those different data sets together into assessments or how to expand some of those data collections or make them more synonymous over over space would be useful to have. But yes, um, I, I don't like having to I don't like saying that more data and more research is needed, but I think additional fishery independent data targeted two needs similar to, to Dave Monty's question, make sure you're collecting the data with the pathway into management already determined would be valuable. Thank you. All right, that side of the room. Thank you. Um, Patrick Paquette, mostly known as from the Massachusetts Striped Bass Association. Um, um, a question has been coming up and I'm going to try and avoid species specific, but use a species specific example. Um, and if that's manipulation, it may be. Um, the um, so in the current striped bass discussion, that it's some it, that in some ways reminds me of watching um, what happened with Atlantic cod, and in some ways reminds me that it may be a precursor to what's happening with Pacific salmon. Um, the management question, because that's the world that I tend to interact with most, as much as I want to pretend to be a scientist, I absolutely know I can swing with many of the managers. And I've looked at managers who I trust and managers who I'm suspicious of and asked them the question, what do you do when Mother Nature has decided to not make as many fish and there are absolutely more people who want to catch those fish than are fish available to be caught, period. And it's got nothing to do with fishing mortality. Maybe it has a little bit to do when we're not sure. How do you manage that? if that's what's going on with striped bass. Because it's not striped bass aren't moving north. Trust me, I live there. They're not there the way they were. Um, striped bass may be a climate change victim. Pacific salmon may be a climate change victim. And the thing that I'm looking for and what my question is, is the climate resilient fisheries scenario, this program that's going on, and the answer that came out to Mr. McMurray's question that gets at the same way that I think is where is that high level, not species specific discussion about management strategies going to happen? 
because it's clear to me that and the scientific discussions have to happen the hard choices about what data we can collect need to collect and maybe shouldn't be collecting anymore uh, with the resources we have but the one thing that I don't hear or that I haven't heard yet and that I need to hear um, and I think a lot of us need to hear is where is the big giant theoretical discussion with the people who do the work going to happen about how we manage these fisheries with some of the specifics with how does the allocation bit in the weeds happen without talking specifically about striped bass or red snapper or whatever but when I ask managers who I am impressed by they look at me and they go we're not sure we don't know yet and that academic hole maybe there's theorem out there that haven't made it to us but in my head if the people in this scenario in this room aren't talking about that we may be in trouble in really big bigger trouble and um and so that's my question is is this happening please tell me that there's a sketch for a conference in a room in noah somewhere or in a somebody's but I, that's my question is where is that discussion going to come from because we need to be having it and i think yesterday but today tomorrow this summer would be fine um but that's i think i got that question huh? let me offer one thing while um folks decide who wants to respond one that is one of the questions for the breakout rooms so as david and others have said we're, we're going to all end this together so it's one of the questions we want you to discuss head on and come back this afternoon on second like i see right um, behind you dr bob foy from alaska john curlin the new head of the alaska regional office there are regional heads all in this room and the head of sustainable fisheries sam rauch is in a corner back there we are having that conversation and i think the um scenario planning that has happened in the Pacific Coast and in the Mid-Atlantic is geared towards specific you you have to talk about it at a high level to avoid some of the clashing um, but then you have to implement it at a species level so um, excellent points that you made and I'll let people decide who wants to answer that I think everybody wants to answer that so let's go down the line carry your excuse yeah I think the breakout room <laughs> point is key for because I, I want to hear some ideas and um, like you Patrick I'm not a scientist I hang around a lot of really smart and talented and, and experienced people and try and condense that into some thoughts and I'm honored to serve on, on the board at you know, ASMFC and um, I, I see that one of the solutions is is focusing more on so management is a social science but we don't address it like that we don't have the right academic or, or intellectual power in that arena and I think um, walking through, I've, sat, I've been through various consensus processes in my limited experience, and I've found them to be the most beneficial because we really get into that human component more than anything else. And so I think increasing capacity across states and nationally to do that work is key um, because it, it's an opportunity to talk about trade offs. It's to, uh, an opportunity to talk about what the future might look like and how we may want to utilize this, these, these stocks as they change um, and, and kind of set the expectation, something I mentioned earlier. So. I think an increased um, focus on that is key. Um, I'll continue to focus on the state level, you know, me personally. Um, but I think each one of us can. That's the, almost the beauty of our, our country. Um, you know, some of these great ideas can can come up on a local and state level that can become national policy down the road. So, always the optimist, I guess. Yeah. So I, I think the climate change scenario planning process. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to, you know, f would fully satisfactorily, you know, address your points but I think it does in large part address what you're talking about and that there's going to be some big picture strategic conversations that are happening about what do we do in response to all of these external drivers including not only the the kind of oceanographic and, and biological changes but the there's a lot of socioeconomic changes happening as well including things like the changes in demographics um, co coastal population growth if we do have way more people that are interested in fishing for these wreck species than we have the stock to support what what do we do then what happens what happens under you know that that set of conditions what happens um under you know different combinations of, of future possible conditions how do we react to that and, and so i think that it is a good venue for a lot of big picture strategic discussions about what do we do with our governance structure and what do we do with our management strategies like allocation I agree with Kylie. I think the climate change scenario planning effort is the next best venue that we have to address this. I will uh, 
in 2014, Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council had an East Coast Governance Workshop. I think that was the last best chance that we had to do it. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, you know, in 2014, I don't think just as a, as a, as a broad community we were ready for it. Um, and I think this climate scenario planning activity on the East Coast is that opportunity. And so it's been, you know, climate scenario, Pacific Council, climate scenario, New England, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic Council. I think the other councils, other regions should closely watch this activity and think about is this something that you can use in the Gulf or use in North Pacific or use in Pacific Islands as a tool to help sort of have the discussions that you're, you, that we, I think we all agree need to be had. So I participated in the Pacific Coast scenario planning effort and one of the things that we asked people to do, particularly the government people, was to abandon your trench and set aside some of your hardcore beliefs. And I'll, I'll focus on salmon. And the issue raging in the Northwest is about hatcheries versus natural produced fish and their ability to adapt. So we approached one of our scenarios by saying, we're not going to be able to keep up with climate change. Salmon are going to wink out, period, if we don't do something. So one of our suggestions was that we go into an industrialized hatchery program focused on the San Francisco area, build a huge hatchery, and direct release right into the ocean, and be content that we're going to have some salmon to fish on. Uh, you know, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty good punch in the chin of a lot of people who are scientists and are, are working hard to, to deal with some of that stuff. But, if we're going to be realistic about going forward, we've got to consider at least those kinds of things. The other thing I've dealt with, I've been in the wildlife business for 53 years, starting with a state agency, and we said, well, let's just ask the public what they want. They don't know what they want. I mean, honestly, the, they want more fish, they want to have more fun, but to ask the public to focus in on very specific issues is pretty difficult. So. It's, I think it's up to the agency people to kind of help facilitate discussions to interpret what they're trying to tell you. Because you may be able to provide exactly what they're asking for if you're willing to consider different ways to approach it. So I, I think this discussion moving forward is going to have to be, I mean, the scientific people are going to probably have to get out of their comfort zone a little bit and the public is going to have to be willing to be, I won't say manipulated, but led kind of where we need to go for us all to get to the same place. I, I, I think that's, and I might just use another example what, that was a question over here about when you have shifting resources, how on earth are you going to deal with that? Well, the Pacific side is pretty simple. We have basically four states, one council, and dealing with salmon that are moving up and down the coast. Um, we approach that, so I'm the chairman of the Salmon Advisory Subpanel that helps the council develop season. So we start off every meeting in March by, by saying, look, salmon are a public resource owned by the people of the United States, and it's our job to manage them to get the most social and economic benefits out of them we can. So that's where we start. Then we'll step down next into the various state issues commercial versus recreational but you know you can't you can't if you're from the state of california and you produce a lot of salmon you can't say well those are our fish first because they end up in oregon so the shifting stock thing i think is going to have to be approached with a pretty open mind about what's fair and how can we best use this resource to meet national goals Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Excellent. Hi, I'm Mike Ruccio. I'm the division chief for our domestic fisheries division at NOAA Fisheries. And uh, I, there have been some great comments here, Patrick. I really love the question. The, the one thing that I think I would say that hasn't been said yet uh, or reemphasize it is in these breakout groups, I think it's a really great opportunity for you to tell us what you would like, what you would need, this this idea that there's so many issues that are interconnected here. We've heard governance, which I think you know, we're cognizant of. There's a lot of interrelatedness there with 
what we're seeing in climate change. I think the agency is interested in developing some guidance on that. Work is underway. We've heard allocation, which is one of the most difficult things that the, calend that the councils and the commissions have to deal with. Um, you know, we've heard about what targets we're trying to hit. All these things resonate. They're all part of this deep, deep challenge of climate change. So really help tease out some of that in your breakout sessions. What issues you're seeing, what are most important to you, where the agency can be of the greatest benefit to try to help provide information. But you know, one of the things that we started this session with was the participatory structure of the councils. We would like to try to be able to develop tools to help the councils do this work. And if you don't feel like you have those, then you can help inform that conversation on what we can do work on in the interim. So I really appreciate that question, Patrick. Thanks, Mike. I think our time is up. I just want to, um, one, um, reiterate that um, the council process has worked really well, and we appreciate greatly people who step up and get involved in that process. And secondly, um, express my appreciation to this amazing panel. You are truly brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to provide brief instructions on the breakout groups, and then everyone can go to your respective locations. So the second part of this session is going to be regional breakouts. So I'm going to share with you what rooms to go in, and you can self-select based on the region you're representing. If you work nationally, feel free to float between the rooms or choose one room. So we have uh, four groups today, and the locations for the Mid-Atlantic group uh, is to stay in this room, and you'll be on the right side facing the front, so right over there. Um, to the other side of the room, we have the South Atlantic, Gulf Coast, and Caribbean. And then just around the hall um, to the left are the crystal rooms, and one and two are the first hallway, and then you keep going to the left is um, five and six. So New England is in Crystal 5, and Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and the Pacific Coast are in Crystal 6. So after I finish instructions, you'll have about five minutes to transition to that room. And um, please arrive no later than 11.10. So the facilitators, who include um, all of our steering committee members and some of uh, NOAA staff and others, who are rapporteurs for that, will provide you with the agenda for the breakout groups and the guiding questions, although I know Janet already shared um, some of those questions and, and everyone has ideas already. At the end of the breakout groups at noon, we'll just transition right into lunch. So your um, breakout group facilitators will tell you when it's time and you can go right to lunch, um, which is served out in the atrium, and then we'll reconvene back here at one o'clock. Um, I just have one more ask that if you do decide not to join a group, uh, if you could please take those conversations in the atrium so uh, we can allow the groups that are working in here um, the time and, and space to have those conversations. So unless um, there are any questions, I will send everyone off to their groups and uh, we'll see you for lunch and back here at one. Thank you. Um, so my name is Claire Shea, and I'm with the American Clean Power Association. We're a national renewable energy trade association that represents onshore wind, offshore wind, solar storage, and transmission. I focus on our on our offshore wind portfolio. And um, to follow um, up after Brian, um, in terms of offshore wind, Boehm is the landlord, and basically uh, I represent the renters, you can say, um, or the offshore wind developers and, and turbine manufacturers. Um, so um, to start off, this, this picture is actually um, a picture of the two turbines that are off the coast of Virginia. The two turbine, the, we have seven turbines in total right now of offshore wind um, in the United States, five off the coast of Rhode Island and two off the coast of Virginia. And these, um, this photo is taken, is an underwater photo of, of the foundations off of Virginia. Um, so I want to talk about two things um, today. One, it, how stakeholder input 
um, has been taken into account um, for the projects that have that are currently under development, and then also talk about how offshore wind turbines have already provided new fishing opportunities for for recreational fishermen. Um, and there's during a break, there's a, a be, um, some B-roll of just some of the video of the footage that is that was taken off the coast of Rhode Island because if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth ten thousand. So you don't have to trust me; you can just watch the video afterward. But to get started. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the New York bite in the Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island wind energy areas and how stakeholder input was taken into account um, during those processes um, and as an example of, of processes moving forward, et cetera. So wanted to talk, show a little bit, um, so this picture has a lot of different colors on it, but basically the kind of the, the largest areas, which start out with the blue, show the call for information denominations area that BOEM originally looked, like, looked at when considering the offshore wind leases in the New York bite, and then narrowed them down into the eventually the um, final sale notice leases that are in yellow. And this process, um, which uh, Brian showed a little bit, showed on his timeline, is really important to show when to engage, when for stakeholders like, such as the recreational fishing industry to engage in the process and to um, you know highlight areas that are concerning or in where um, folks want to avoid offshore wind development and where um, offshore wind development should be should be concentrated. So just wanted to show this, and I'll, if you go to the next slide, um, this process. So again, these areas were very large and were reduced by over 72%. So again, the EEZ, um, as we kind of started out with, huge area, looking at kind of these call area to see what the interest is in, in developing them, and then was further reduced by 72%. So in this, in the call area, there was a lot of input um, that was taken into consideration um, from commercial fishing interests to recreational, to the Department of Defense, um, ENGOs, universities, et cetera. And so that process, if you go to the next slide, was then kind of winnowed down into these smaller dark blue areas, which was then again, um, you know, put out for, for public comment, and this is in the Federal Register, of when, you know, what areas would be best to, to site offshore wind. So you go to the next slide again, um, after the wind energy area, you had the proposed sale notice that originally, um, proposed, that BOEM originally offered um, eight um, lease areas in the New York bite before the lease auction, um, what was it, a month ago? Uh, um, just a, just one month ago, um, and so then in the final sale notice, the, uh, the number of leases went from eight to six. Again, incorporating more more stakeholder input into that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it should show yeah the the areas. So again, there's quite a bit, and we applaud Boehm for taking stakeholder input um, into account. We just want to make sure that folks are aware of kind of this process in place. And I think it's really relevant to this this panel in terms of balancing ocean users that folks understand the process of where and how to get engaged in, in offshore wind. So you go to the next if you go to the next slide, um, this isn't just unique to the New York bite. Wanted to point out the Massachusetts Rhode Island wind energy area as well. Um, the request for information um, that Boehm originally looked at was obviously was this dark blue area that was much much larger um, than the kind of fi the the final areas that folks are familiar with um, and was also reduced by, by over 60% um, in terms of the final area that was, that was leased. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, and then after, and folks are probably uh, not sure about folks' familiarity with this, but after that BOEM process, just wanted to highlight in the Massachusetts Rhode Island wind energy area that due to, to, to input from fishing stakeholders, the, um, after basically the leases were sold, the developers came together to coordinate kind of the the direction of which of the turbines and uh, having a um, layout to engage, to ensure that there is um, enough transit areas for folks to go in and out of the areas. So developers really do want to incorporate stakeholder feedback throughout the process and so far have. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we engage with all the the proper constituencies on this, and really do want to to coexist with the um, with all ocean users, because that's that's the only way that we're all going to be successful. Go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to quickly af um, show a little bit about um, the increased fishing opportunities that 
um, the five turbines off the coast of Block Island and the two turbines off the coast of Virginia have already started to um, provide. So I have a quick video from Dominion Energy that, that highlights um, some of those fishing opportunities that folks have, have already taken advantage of. So I believe that should be queued up on the next slide. Let's see. Does it work? Oh. For me and my son, fishing is the ultimate therapy. My wife, she succumbed to colon cancer and she passed and so I was coming a little unglued. One day I saw this guy with his t-shirt on. I said, hey, hey, Norfolk has an Angles Club. He starts laughing. He says, oh yeah. And so I went to the first meeting and I've been hooked ever since. It's like I found a group of people who love the water just as much as me. I got that this morning and I was going away. Today we went offshore and to the turbines and caught flounder, black sea bass, mahi. The structures themselves will provide a lot of opportunities to anglers like myself and others. The sustainability all the way around from a carbon reduction standpoint and obviously from a fishing resource, keeping the environment in a way that we can all use it in generations to come. Most everybody here that lives here in fishes. In the mornings when I'm working on my tackle shop, I have 30 customers come in and I'm like, so where are y'all fishing today? We're going to the windmill. <laughs> you know, you're looking at fuel sales, bait, tackle, restaurants, hotel rooms. People are going to come from everywhere just to go out there to fish the windmills. You know, I see the potential. It's going to be real good. Proud to be a part of a company that's the leader in wind energy. To me, that's a win-win across the board. The more of them you have, the better we are. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Is uh, Danielle queued up and ready to go? Check out this verbo. Oh, no. Look at me. Here I am. Another video intermission. Right where I belong. It's all I've been looking for and so much more. And now I'm here. Now you're here. Nothing can go wrong. Danielle's talented. I can see her. I can see my slide. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you now. Awesome. Thanks for having me with you guys today. Um, sorry to be remote when everybody finally gets to be in person. I hope you're enjoying catching up over coffee, and I'm jealous of the dessert that's to come. In my 10 minutes, I'm going to try to cover three things. One is why is NOAA paying attention um, to fostering marine aquaculture? The second is what aquaculture looks like today. And then the third is I'm going to give a little overview of a big effort that we have underway um, identifying aquaculture opportunity areas. Next slide. So why aquaculture? Um, we need more food. We have a growing population and finite resources on our planet. Aquaculture is one of the most resource and space efficient ways for us to grow protein. Unless you can convince people to eat bugs, which I'm glad that's not my job, we have to get more protein somehow. We are going to need an additional 40 million tons of seafood in 20 years. And that's not counting for the fact that Americans only eat half of the seafood they should. Um, 70% of our seafood is imported and over half of that is aquacultured under other governments where they may not have the same kinds of rules and regulations as we do. The, D the Department of Homeland Security actually came out uh, with a, a new um, analysis just a few months ago in 2021 that recommended that the growth of the domestic aquaculture industry is one of seen six key national priorities for supporting a domestic food system that's resilient in terms of climate change, 
and resilient in national security. Overall, we're focused on aquaculture because it's good for people. We all know that seafood's healthy, it's good for the economy, creates new jobs, good jobs, and it's good for the planet. As I already mentioned, it's um, the most resource and space efficient way that we can grow enough protein for the planet. On top of that, of course, there's also types of aquaculture that help <clears throat> uh, rebuild stocks, um, clean waterways, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. This is a, an oldie but goodie kind of graph. Aquaculture is expanding uh, globally. It is now uh, more than 50% of the seafood consumed on the planet is grown through aquaculture. Um, and it's really taking off in other parts of the world. We have a vibrant industry here in the United States, but it certainly could be bigger. Next slide. Here's some of the areas where we know there's interest in commercial aquaculture. We see a lot of interest in the Northeast. We also have a thriving industry in the Northeast right now. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of interest out in the Pacific Islands and in Southern California. Those are some hot spots at the moment, but it doesn't mean that other areas aren't of interest. It's just, this is just where we hear the most of excitement. Next slide. So a quick uh, dive into what aquaculture looks like today. So when people talk about aquaculture, folks either don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> or often they're picturing these images from what farms looked like 30 and 40 years ago. And you know, 30 and 40 years ago, we didn't even have cell phones. And now I have a, a butler in my pocket that I can talk to and she'll answer my questions. Those same types of advancements have happened in aquaculture they just haven't been as open and transparent to the world unless you're following along. So well, I'll dive into one, one suite of those, but here's what farms look like today. Everything from, you can see this big yellow structure, that's Ocean Farm One that uh, is off the coast of Norway. It's usually underwater, it's, it's raised in this image so you can see it. It's usually underwater, they, they grow salmon in that. That's one of their new advanced ways to grow salmon. We also see some cages in the middle of the top. That is also a fin fish farm that are totally submersible, but contained, unlike a floating net pen that you can't sink under the water. On the right, we see um, an oyster farm in South Carolina. And on the left, where you see this string of buoys, that's a farm. That's an algae farm off the coast of Maine. And it's just buoys because it all happens under the water. So when we think about what aquaculture looks like in the United States and what it looks like in other parts of the world, like I mentioned Ocean Farm One, it's not the same picture that you might have had in your head when I first said the word. On to the next slide. So I'm just going to do a dive into one thing that's changed because I could talk for hours about the innovations that have happened in aquaculture, but let's talk about feed. So since 1990, we have seen a decrease in the amount of fish oil and fish meal used in feed for fed aquaculture. Fed aquaculture is typically fish versus shellfish and algae. You don't have to add feed to the water. Right now, it's less than 25% of the components of feed. Um, so that dramatic drop has been replaced by all kinds of alternative feeds that NOAA and USDA have invested heavily into research as well as industry to try to find other solutions past things that we take out of the ocean. In addition, on the right, these are sort of the, the text and the image are two separate things. So what you're seeing in this image is um, a computer program watching fish eat. And you can see little flecks in the water and that is fish feed. And as soon as a piece of fish feed goes past those fish's mouths, the feeding stops. So there's no overfeeding in these advanced systems anymore. They're, we're literally watching when the fish are done so that we make sure that none of the feed is drifting to the bottom or impacting the water column. In addition, feed is getting much more digestible. So instead of, you know, sort of having McDonald's, they're now getting healthy salads with a nice piece of lean protein on top so that all of those calories that are they're ingesting, they're using to grow instead of 
um, having them come out of them on the other end and into the marine environment. So those are three different ways that feed one topic has advanced dramatically over the last couple of decades. On to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna dive into aquaculture opportunity areas. This is a big initiative that NOAA is leading. And the idea is finding appropriate space for aquaculture in our coastal waters, coast, in our EEZ. So an aquaculture opportunity area is a defined geographic space that has been determined to be appropriate for aquaculture. To us, appropriate means three different things. It has to be appropriate um, environmentally. So we're staying out of areas that have a lot of endangered species or are important fish habitat, things like that. We're also looking for areas that are uh, appropriate economically. That means that maybe they're close to a port. If they're close to a processing facility, even better, although we know that those things can be built. In addition, we're looking for areas that are appropriate socially. That means we're staying out of shipping lanes. We're staying out of traditional fishing grounds. We're trying to find areas that are most appropriate for aquaculture and not in the way of others. I should note that these are not exclusive use areas that we're looking for. So just if, if an aquaculture opportunity area is um, identified, it doesn't mean that other things can't happen in them. We're just saying those are appropriate areas for aquaculture to grow. Um, when you look at areas that are appropriate in those three ways, you end up finding very small spaces. So we heard about the wind planning areas. These are, at least for the first ones we're looking for, are orders of magnitude smaller. So we're looking at areas that are 500 to 2,000 acres, much smaller. These are like polka dots on a map um, rather than, than the large uh, polygons. How we're doing it is a two-phase process. The first phase is we're doing spatial analysis of all of the data that's available in the regions of study. We, for the first two, have looked in the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. We did uh, a ton of outreach and engagement on where these should go, what should we consider, what data should be considered, and that all resulted in atlases. Then the second phase is diving into the NEPA analysis, bureaucratic language for a deep dive with a lot of public engagement. Science and public engagement is what's driving this process. So on to the next slide. So here are QR codes, um, but you can also just Google <laughs> aquaculture opportunity area atlases. And these are actual atlases, they're digital, but there are 500 pages of all of the maps and data that we had to feed into these analyses. This is the most complete marine spatial uh, effort, uh, analysis effort that has ever been done worldwide and certainly within the United States. It's very advanced. All right, I have one minute left. <laughs> On to the next, I can do it. So that's phase one. Here's the map of areas that may be appropriate for AOAs. Those atlases found us 10 areas in Southern California. On to the next slide. and nine areas in the Gulf of Mexico that are now gonna enter into the phase two process, that NEPA process. On to the next slide. As I mentioned, NEPA is that deep dive. We're bringing all of the science that NOAA has to bear into this planning exercise. We'll have two years to develop programmatic uh, environmental impact statements with lots of public engagement opportunities continuing. These are some of the things that we'll be analyzing. And we expect this process to start this spring. So we're going to put out notices of intent in both the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California for, for both areas, but they'll be national um, notices of intent, seeking public comment on the scope of analysis that we should do and looking for that feedback from you all. And we hope that you participate. And that's it. Great, thanks, Danielle. And uh, Neil Sims, I believe, is queued up and his picture's on, so I think we're in business. You ready to go, Neil? Uh, I am. Can you hear me clearly? Yep, sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Aloha, Kako. Welcome from Kona, Hawaii. Uh, click through the next slide, please. I, I want to talk here about offshore aquaculture and exactly what's on the line, what, what is involved in offshore aquaculture, and how will this 
present some risks, but also then some benefits for recreational fisheries. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background, first of all, on myself. I was the co-founder of the uh, Kona Blue Water Farms operation, which was uh, an, set up here only a half a mile out offshore of the coast in Kona uh, from 2005. We ran it from 2005 through to 2008. Maximum production of around 500 tonnes a year of what we called Kona Kampachi, but is known locally as Kahala, or you may know as Amberjack. In the wild, it's considered pretty much a trash fish. This was uh, one that you would toss back if you would catch this when you were fishing because it has a history of ciguatera uh, and also it has internal parasites in, in the flesh, worms in the flesh. But so when you farm it, it becomes this sashimi grade fish that has uh, graced the tables of, of restaurants such as the French Laundry. And so this is part of the opportunity that, that aquaculture offshore aquaculture can offer in bringing new species to market. Next slide, please. Uh, we had then also moved from the operation in Kona in 2009. We sold that. You may remember 2009 was a global financial crisis. And we looked at where else that then we might start to grow offshore aquaculture. And it is a really challenging process. I mean, there was a three year permit process for us to get the permits for that operation in Kona. And we had friends in Mexico that had said, please, we desperately need more seafood down here. And the regulations down there are much more encouraging. And so we began an operation uh, down in La Paz in the Sea of Cortez. Next slide, please. Again, this was about four miles offshore. It, it was a more gentle slope here inside the Bay of La Paz. Uh, and again, these were submersible net pens. These look more like the traditional salmon pens, but they are able to be submerged down below the surface. Next slide, please. We'd also then, over the course of from about 2011 through to 2014, we'd run a couple of trials in Kona where we wanted to push the regulatory envelope for aquaculture in federal waters. All of these, the operation previously in Kona had been in state waters. Uh, and the, the first attempt at this was an unanchored drifter cage, uh, which required just a, a permit from NOAA. And then the second, which was the Villola Gamma test, that was then a, a net pen with an anchor. And this is the Villola Beta test. It's just, it was meant as a demonstration project. So it was only 2,000 fish in this very small aquapod here that drifted around in the eddies in the back of the big island for around eight months. Next slide, please. And we're also intending, because of the, the success from these Bolala demonstration projects here in Hawaii, we want to now be able to bring that to the mainland. And so we're moving forward with the Bolala Epsilon project, which is again, a single pen with a small batch of fish, 20,000 fish, uh, that would be around 40 miles offshore from Sarasota in the Gulf of Mexico. We need to go that far out offshore as anybody that's fished there knows it, it's a very broad shelf. You gain about a meter of depth for every mile offshore that you go. And we wanna be in water that's at least around 40 meters depth so that you've got some, some cushion there when a hurricane will come through. Next slide, please. And the plan here is just a single batch of fish, again, just as a demonstration. We hope that what we'll be able to do there is have the fishing and boating community come out and fish around that pen. We'll be able to take journalists and policy makers out there and NGOs and those from the conservation community because we want to be able to show there the same benefits that we saw here in Kona for the fishing and boating community. Next slide, please. So I want to go through the, sort of the, the three areas where we see risks and benefits for recreational fisheries in offshore aquaculture. The risks we can model, we can manage and we can monitor. Then I want to talk about the potential benefits, which is both the FAD effects and then also the interactions in terms of stock enhancement potential. Next slide, please. So modeling on a number of levels, uh, and next slide, please. On a number of levels, we can look at, at the way that we model, uh, both for water quality and substrate impacts. I mean, on a global level, we can model 
carbon dioxide and methane additions to the atmosphere and what that's going to do for the climate for the next 30 years. So we can certainly model in an ocean environment what the impacts of uh, nitrogen, organic nitrogen, phosphorus and the particulates, what impact that will have on both the water quality and the substrate. There are things like Jack Rensel's aqua model. So we can get an idea of where we want to put pens. And the general principle here, is we want to put them in deeper water, further offshore, where there are brisker currents. Next slide, please. And then there's also ability to be able to model the, the engineering here. Uh, there are very sophisticated programs now that can make sure that the fish stay on the inside of the pen uh, and the sharks stay on the outside. Next slide, please. But there's also always the potential, there will be some potential for escape. Generally, in our experience, when fish from the inside of the cage end up on the outside, they become bait. Uh, they're fat and slow and stupid. They're domesticated. And so they don't thrive very well. They're suckers for a recreational fisherman with, with a hook. Uh, they're also still very tasty. But we don't want that escapes. Nobody wins with escapes except for the recreational fishermen and the, the, the dolphins and the other predators there. So we do want to be able to manage around that. We only make money on the fish that we keep on the inside of the pen. And we also want to make sure that there's minimal impact from any escapes. And so NOAA has set up an omega model that is able to evaluate the impacts on the genetics of, of a, a stock from potential escapes. And all of the modeling to date has shown that so long as you don't have very heavy selective breeding on th those fish, that there will be no impact on the wild stock genetics. Next slide, please. And then the, the management, there's a plethora of permits that are required. Each of these uh, has some potential for uh, input through the, the NEPA process. And along with these various permits, there's also burdens for monitoring for the farm. So monitoring on water quality and substrate impacts. And that information is available to the agency. And we want to, as an industry, we're wanting to make that information available publicly as well. The Kona operation here has always had that water quality and benthic impact information publicly available because it is really validating of the fact that if you're in deeper water further offshore, you don't have significant impacts on the wider ecosystem. Next slide, please. There are, though, some real benefits. And next slide, please. The real benefits here are from the, the for recreational fishermen, the, the fish aggregation device effects around an offshore rate, in the same as with the, the wind farm operations here. And what we've seen is that this has really changed the perception of the fishing community here in Kona. The perception of offshore aquaculture has changed dramatically as they've come to realize these are real hot spots. Next slide, please. This was both with the Villela Beta test, the drifter cage, and this is just on a Veterans Day morning, 16 boats that were within view around the cage as it was drifting. This is about 12 miles out offshore. People catching tuna and marlin and mahi mahi and wahoo hand over fist. I'd have people calling me up in the morning saying, Neil, I'm heading out fishing. Where is the cage? Next slide, please. And then the next iteration that we had of this was the Villa Gamma test where we put an anchor down. We still wanted to be in federal waters. So this was six miles offshore in 6,000 feet of water, 12,000 feet of mooring line. Next slide, please. But again, it was a great fad. And this time people knew where it was. They didn't have to call me up. It was within a five mile radius. It would swing on this circle. This is the feed barge and the, the mooring buoy in the foreground here. And this is this, the array of recreational and charter boats that were usually around this any morning. When we had to pull that out at the end of the project, I had a fisherman come up to me in the harbor and say, please don't take that fish pen out. That's the best fishing I've had in my life. Next slide, please. I wanted to bottle that, <laughs> that sentiment there. And the next slide, please. The, the other benefits that I believe that offshore aquaculture can offer is through developing the technologies and building the scale, building the capacity for hatchery production and raising these fingerlings, that it's going to grow the ability for stock enhancement, for recruitment supplementation. So that there can indeed be plenty more fish in the sea. And this is both with uh, fish such as the Almaco Jack, the Kampachi, which is farmed here in Kona. Next slide, please. Have I run out of time already? Next slide, please. Then let's click through these fairly quickly. Almaco Jack. We've done hatchery work here with the giant grouper, which is closely related to uh, the Goliath grouper down in Florida. Uh, it's a phenomenal species, phenomenal growth rate. And it's 
if not endangered, it's very heavily fished. Next slide, please. All of the groupers now, we have the hatchery capacity to produce groupers. We can produce fish such as the giant trevally, which is the signature species here in Hawaii, and also snappers such, such as the opakapaka. We can produce them in the hatchery for our farms, and that, that also then helps us refine the technology so that it becomes more cost efficient. And then by having that hatchery capacity, we are able then to be able to provide fingerlings for stock enhancement programs. And this is an area where in the same way that salmon hatcheries and salmon farming have developed hand in hand, we see great potential here for the development of marine fish hatcheries and marine fish recreational fisheries to develop together. So thank you very much. I've enjoy, enjoyed the opportunity and look forward to the Q&A session. Aloha. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Russ and the steering committee for inviting me to come here and talk a little bit about uh, my experience in uh, wind farms in Rhode Island. Oh, sorry. Is that a little better? OK, sorry. Um, so uh, I'm Rick Bellavance. I run a charter fishing business in Point Judith, Rhode Island. And in our neck of the woods, there's a actual operating wind farm. It's the first one in the country in Block Island. Uh, next slide. So the Block Island Wind Farm um, was started to be built in 2015, and it was uh, commissioned in December of 2016. It's about three miles southeast of Block Island uh, and about 16 miles off the coast of Point Judith in Rhode Island. There's five windmills to this farm, and they're oriented from the northeast to the southwest. And the depth of the water in that area is about 90 feet for turbine number one in the northeast and 75 feet down to turbine number five. It's the first offshore wind development uh, in the United States. So uh, some of the graphics I use, I, I came here as a fisherman and I wanted to kind of show you what it's like to, to experience these things as a fisherman. And I thought I'd take some pictures off of my chart plotter so you can see what I look at all day when I'm fishing. And just to orient you a little bit, I don't want to go too crazy with the clicker, but that's Block Island, the, the yellow land up on the top. And then the five turbines are about three miles southeast here. And um, the federal water line is right here. So this is a state waters project. Uh, next slide. So I thought I'd start a little bit about talking about what the recreational fishing was like during the construction of the project. Uh, when they were actually building the project, putting the pilings in, putting the foundations in, there was a several hundred foot exclusion area um, around the construction site. So we couldn't go into that area at all. Um, and that was just during the construction period. Since the construction is completed, you can go right up to them. There are no exclusion areas at all. Um, when they were actually driving the piles into the ground and, and building the, the project, the foundations, the fish didn't bite at all in quite a few miles around the area. Um, if you kind of look in here, these little green dots are all little spots I like to go fishing. And there wasn't a lot of biting going on when they were driving the piles into the bottom. But they did start to bite pretty quickly thereafter. As soon as they stopped, you'd start to get bites again. Um, I can also say that the construction went a little bit longer than they anticipated. They had thought they could put these five turbines up in a one season, and it actually took into a second season. Um, so that was a little bit longer than they thought. Um, and another th thing that was I thought was helpful is they did hire some uh, professional for hire vessels to keep an eye on protected species as part of the construction period. So that was some an opportunity for uh, recreational businesses to do some work there. Uh, next slide. A little bit about fishing uh, post-construction. So this graphic here is a picture of one of my old plotters from the 90s. And I uh, put this X here. That's a waypoint for the turbine number five. And this is some pretty good bottom that was there long before the turbines got built. It was a popular area for us. Um, once they put the turbines up, it got popular for everybody. So it was in all the fishing reports. And there was a lot of, you know, it didn't take long for word to get out that these bases attract fish. And so the area became a lot crowded. As folks start to drift off the turbines, they started to find some of those good spots that we had uh, in the past. 
Um, so that area is now pretty heavily fished overall. It attracts fish like sea bass. We saw that in the video um, from Claire earlier. Striped bass and bluefish, bluefish also kind of congregate around those, those structures, so you can catch those with diamond jigs. The dogfish, love them. They are, when they are in town, that's, they're everywhere. Um, but I've noticed personally that there's a whole lot less codfish there than there ever was. We used to catch codfish there pretty often on those big blue circles, as are all structure. And um, we caught codfish there. We don't see them as much as we used to. Now, cod's also in tough shape, so I don't know if it's attributed to the turbines or if it's just that the stock's depleted, but that's a, a thing that I noticed. Um, one other thing that I think is important to remember, and all you guys are, that have boats, you kind of get, you know, marine safety and all that there, but these bases are huge, I mean massive, and they're kind of sketchy to fish next to sometimes. If you get a big heave going, and that area southeast of Block Island is a kind of a place where currents come from a couple different areas, and the wind might be coming from a third area, and it gets a little sketchy in there, and you start getting close to them, you can feel your boat getting sucked in. So it's important to remember that not every day is going to be a fishable day next to a wind turbine because it's uh, maybe a little bit dangerous. Um, one other uh, helpful thing is that scuba diving and spearfishing freediving has become popular around the turbine bases. Folks can go and drop their people in the water and go swimming around. Recreational people go scuba diving there all the time, and uh, they have good luck spearfishing. So that's a bonus. Uh, next slide. So um, that's my experience with the Black Island project. I thought I'd touch a little bit on some future projects that are in the works just in my area. Um, Brian spoke to all the different projects they have going up and down the coast and all around the country. But in our area, the big projects that are uh, before us now are the South Fork Wind Farm, uh, the Revolution Wind Farm, Sunrise Wind Farm and Vineyard Wind. Those are kind of accessible by recreational fishermen. They're further offshore than the Block Island Wind Farm, so they're less protected. Uh, and they're, it's a little more costly to get out there because they're further offshore. The areas that they're talking about on, on an area called Cox's Ledge for Revolution, Sunrise, and uh, South Fork uh, is heavily fished by party and charter boats. Um, a little bit less on, on private boats, but they do go out there looking for codfish and uh, highly migratory species. A lot of whales in the area, a lot of bait and stuff like that. So it's a, a pretty productive area. Um, and it's actually, if I remember right, essential fish habitat for like 30 species. So it's a, it's a pretty good area. I think that we need to really think long and hard about the impacts that's going to occur to recreational fishing as we uh, develop that area. Um, so, as uh, I think Brian mentioned, there's a lot of projects. There's going to be, I think, probably decades of construction in these areas, and we need to think about what that cumulative impacts are going to be over time as we're banging on the ground there for, for a while. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another thing I think is important is our recreational data, right? It's super important. And it's, there's, it's lacking. There's not a lot of real refined data for the recreational fisheries. Stuff, places like uh, ideas like where you fish, what you fish for, when you fish is important, um, how much money you spend when you go fishing. These are important things that a lot of the agencies don't have like super refined data on. And so anything we can do to help those conversations are going to be helpful to us. What concerns you have about these projects? Is there anything that you think you know could kind of be impactful to recreational fishing? It's important to be able to relay that stuff. And then what benefits you see? You know, we've heard about the great opportunities around the structures, so those are benefits as well. Uh, next slide. Oh, so um, my little video thing went away here, but um, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to. See, is this going to be my video? Look at my, uh, my plug for forage fish. That's a, a little school bluefin tuna that we caught last year in one of the wind energy areas off uh, Cox Ledge. And the thing there I just want to emphasize is it's important to think of these forage fish. We're all worried about what's going to happen to Atlantic cod, what's going to happen to the whales and all that, but without the forage fish, a lot of that stuff may not be there. 
Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to collaborate with the Stell Wagon Bank Charter Boat Association and have a, a bluefin tuna biologist, Walt, Dr. Walt Gallette, give us a, a, a talk on bluefin tuna. And he mentioned during his presentation that the diet of bluefin is changing over time. Uh, previously, it was heavily reliant on herring and other fish like that, mackerels and so on. But they're finding more squid now in the gut content analysis of bluefin tuna. And so the areas that they're proposing some of these projects are pretty heavily fished for commercial squid. I think it's important that we understand the impacts of the projects, mostly during construction, but also operation um, on these forage fish. Um, I touched a little bit on essential fish habitat. Some of these uh, wind energy areas have been defined over a process that took place a decade ago. Now, I'll give Boehm a lot of credit for improving their process as time goes on, but some decisions that were made in the past are, you know, maybe weren't the best decisions at the time. So we're going to have to deal with putting some of these projects on essential fish habitat, and maybe there are some things we can do to mitigate the impacts to the best uh, possible way we can. And then the last thing I'd, I'd like to mention here is just uh, the cumulative impacts of all that's going on. Uh, there's a lot of offshore development planned up and down the coast, and it's really unknown what we're going to, what those ultimate impacts are going to be to us as recreational fishermen. And I think the more we can do to try to understand all the different uh, fish that are out there, from forage fish to game fish, as we build and, and learn lessons as we go through, the better off we'll be in the long run. So, um, again, I thank you all for your time. I just wanted to give a little uh, brief idea of what it's like from my experience fishing on the water in one of these wind farms, and I'll look forward to the question and answer period. Thanks. <laughs>
when you, if you're not a person that's been here for a long time, you don't really know how the, the structures work. Um, but we, over the years, I've seen a difference where that when the fish farm was out of there, the ledge between Kailua Kona and Captain Cook didn't have the accumulation of bait because the bait was stopped by the structure as we we think because for the years that it was out there it wasn't and now that the structure is gone it, the bait is back on the ledges in fact just yesterday i was fishing the one ledge straight in from where the thing was where the fish pen was and i caught a marlin and there was tons of bait so you know it's something that we haven't seen for a couple of years but the pro is that anyone can run out 15 minutes from wherever you launch and you go and catch tuna and marlin and mai mai and ono right at the structure and with the fuel costs the way it is right now it actually is a benefit for the small boat fishermen for sure and the charter boat fishermen that you know with fuel costs now don't have, don't want to raise their prices and things they can go to the to the farm catch a bait live bait around there all day and then troll back to the harbor and it, it's a good day and the customers like catching the bait and you got a chance of catching a big tuna or a marlin uh, the biggest marlin i caught off of neil's farm was 708 so i mean i fish it myself i have to because it's there um but we've seen the impacts of these these fads because throughout the years growing up on the island we i've fished the ledges um all the way we have 60 miles of coastline that are in the lee of the island and we have calm water 350 days a year and the ledges there are three main ledges the grounds which is up on by the airport um we have keho from kailua to captain cook which is another ledge and the other big ledge is in milo lee which is 40 miles from the harbor and the one at milo lee they have two state buoys there that have impacted that ledge um so the difference that we see as a personally as a person that knows how to fish the ledges the buoy and the aquaculture farms do impact that those ledges but it doesn't deter from catching as much fish as we want um you know i've over the years because of the fads and the fish farm we call it the fish farm um we learn how to fish these things because they're there um i'm my personal opinion would be not to have any fads or anything but the fish farm acts like in the gulf you have the oil rigs and the oil rigs are huge fish fish aggregate devices in the gulf and this fish farm being as big as it was is probably the biggest fad that we had and that's why it was it was probably the best fad that was in the state um i can't tell you how many pounds of tuna that have come out of there or how many marlin but it's very significant um, but our our fish are migratory and they migrate through the island because you know even though we are a big island we're actually a really small speck in the middle of the pacific ocean so when migrating fish hit this fish farm they get stopped there and then they don't go into the spots that they usually would on a normal basis um but um you know as as far as the recreational fishermen it's fabulous 
for the charter fishermen, it works good. A lot of people will fish there or not. But one thing that it does pull is the tooth dolphin end up living there and then you're not allowed, you can't fish because the tooth dolphin will take your bait and won't let you fish there. So that deter deters people from fishing there also. And then it does accumulate a, a few sharks. Um, you have the, the deep water divers like it because they can jump in there and be able to spear Mai Mai and Ono. Uh, I've even seen one guy spear a marlin there. So, I mean, we, we have, as far as the charter, recreational and commercial, we have no problem with the fish farm. But in my personal preference is I'd rather have no fads and no structures to, because I know how to fish the ledges. But, you know, I'm just one person and you have to think of the whole community. And as far as the community is concerned, um, they, it was a benefit to everyone, actually. Um, we have, we even had kayakers come straight out of Keho Bay and they'd come out every day and fish at the fish farm. Um, it's that close. So anyway, um, that's all I have for right now. And I'll see if anyone has any questions later. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Magoo. All right, thanks. Well, thanks to the uh, six presenters. Really appreciate the background and perspective. Um, we're going to slide the break back from 2.30 to 2.45, just to make sure we have about a half an hour for question and answer uh, on this with the six speakers that we have. So with that, I think we can open up the floor to anyone that has questions. I think the best way to do it that's working out the best is actually walk up to one of the two microphones and just kind of queue up behind them, and, and I'll alternate sides. Um, and then <clears throat> please all, you know, introduce, give us your name and your affiliation when you uh, start your, your it could be a comment or a question and uh, away we go. So with that, sir. Thank you, my name's uh, Dave Monte. I'm a charter captain, a member of the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers and on the board uh, of directors of uh, the American Saltwater Guides Association. I have a two-part question. Um, one is I know that there's, uh, you know, the whole wind farm uh, discussion focuses on much of it, doing proper research before, during, and after construction. And there seemed to be a little bit of a misstep between BOEM and NOAA being run by two different t total departments. And I know that there's been an agreement recently between the two organizations on this very issue. And I was wondering if uh, someone could share where that agreement is going and how it's going to enhance uh, research um, in wind farm areas, number one. Number two, I'm wondering if there are any study plans to study the possible um, positive cumulative impacts of offshore wind on recreational fishing. Um, my experience like Captain Bellavance's with the Block Island Wind Farm is that it has been positive for fishing. We just heard um, the gentleman talk about the agriculture farms uh, attracting, um, attracting, you know, creating structure, attracting bait and fish. We know that it, it occurs in the Gulf as well on the oil platforms. And in Europe, um, the studies show that um, there's a greater abundance of fish in wind farm areas than in control areas outside of wind farms. So I think this is a key thing uh, we need to study to make sure there's no harm uh, long term, uh, before, during, and after construction. But we also need to focus our energy on positive stuff like positive cumulative impacts. And I was wondering if some of the panel care to address that. Thanks. Great. Thanks for the question. And before we get to responses, uh, Neil, Danielle, and McGrew, we can we can see your picture. So uh, if you want to comment on anything, just kind of wave around a little bit, and we'll we'll get you there. So um, with that, any um, any folks in the room or on the line want to comment? Yes, Brian, go ahead, please. I can I can uh, take a, the first stab at uh, the yes. We just um, released the um, 
the joint uh, BOEM NOAA uh, Federal Fisheries Survey Implementation Strategy. Um, we had our actually our first uh, public meeting on that. I think John Hare was balancing this and uh, that first public meeting earlier today. Um, and uh, we are accepting public comment on that. Um, it is uh, laying out basically the strategy for how to uh, implement a lot of the things that the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in particular, um, have identified to help, uh, you know, um, adapt um, their, their current survey methodologies to the presence of offshore wind facilities. And, um, you know, we've already taken some um, jointly taken some steps to address that for the, the bottom trawl survey. We've had um, a couple, two workshops to date that are kind of, um, you know, doing a lot of the things that the strategy um, has identified and some of the things that Northeast Fisheries Science Center has identified. But I don't know if anyone from NIMS wants to elaborate further, but um, the, yeah, we just published that yesterday um, in taking public comments on that uh, implementation strategy and uh, encourage everyone to, uh, you know, attend one of the workshops um, information sessions um, uh, for that. Um, so Thanks, man. Anyone else want to see John jumping up or anything? So I guess that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, um, and and there was a was there a, and there was a second point uh, part I believe just um, you know regarding the the information and and, and um, cumulative effects. I, I, do want to say that you know the, the two projects that we've identified the one in federal waters the coastal virginia offshore wind farm and the block island wind farm um, have been the subject of pretty intense study both by developers um, and by boehm um, we have boehm has the rodeo project um, where we're really just out there doing it's a real-time opportunity for observing the effect the environmental effects from uh, from these facilities and um, you know has really you know, demonstrated, you know, what, what the changes are, what we can anticipate from the different, you know, foundation types. There's two different foundation types, as, as uh, Rick alluded to earlier, uh, with the monopile and the, and the jacket structure. Um, and uh, and we're, we're definitely learning a lot from that process and, and, and incorporating those lessons or the, that new information into our environmental assessments for, for future projects. Um, so I think that was two of my points there. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? I'm not seeing any. John, go ahead, please. Is that on now? Yeah. Uh, I have two related questions for Captain Bellavance. Uh, the first, well, I'm a firm believer that these things are going to be fish aggregation devices, and, and not only are they going to aggregate fish, but they're probably going to increase biological productivity. I mean, that's intuitive. If you don't know that already, you're probably not. You probably don't fish much. Um, but what concerns me greatly is the access and the impacts during construction. And my first question is, you mentioned uh, that it could take almost a decade. And we've always been told from day one, we're looking at one or two years. I'm wondering where you got that from or if that's, you know, something that we should be aware of. Sure. So, um, first of all, the Block Island project was uh, the construction period was extremely extended from what they had originally anticipated. That went longer than they thought because it just the first one of their kind. They had a few speed bumps, learning, and so on and so forth. But when I mention um, a potential of a decade of building, I'm thinking of the cumulative time period of all of the build out of the entire wind energy area off of. Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So there's a bunch of different projects that are proposed, not just the, the three or four that I mentioned. So that noise is going to be going on. And these are bigger turbine bases. They're monopile as opposed to the jacketed structure. The hammer is going to be bigger. And I feel like the impacts will be felt further away. Um, so as we think about that, we need to think about what mitigation strategies can be used to limit the impact of that noise and, and so on and so forth. John, you had a second oh, question? Yeah, and that's good to know. Um, <clears throat> your contention that the fish didn't bite during pile I mean, that makes total sense to me. All that racket, they're going to be spooked. They're not going to bite. Uh, but what I'm wondering, and maybe maybe Brian would be the better person to answer this, is, is there any science that shows that's the case? Because if we don't have that science and we're going to be impacted for almost 10 years, we really do need to know about that 
and and we need to have science that proves it's the case rather than anecdotal you know suggestions yeah um, I mean I can obviously construction is you know may occur over like a 10 year span but you're not pounding you know not constructing or installing piles that entire you know 10 year period there's you know uh, periods of the year where the the seas are, are calm enough where you're even able to go out there and, and do it um, the past two projects that we've approved have been only piling um, in the daytime um, so there's it's it's sporadic um, but over um, I think in my slide I said we have you know 15 cops you know 15 construction operations plans that we're, we're looking at so those are um, you know um, 15 different projects that will have to be constructed and there's uh, limited um, uh, installation vessels that are able to do the work so some of it will be you have to be staggered some of it may be able to occur at the same time we have to get through those projects and actually get a better sense of when those construction windows are actually going to be so I wouldn't want to state that it's you know active construction you know that whole uh, period of time um, you know as we move forward but it'll be sporadically you know throughout that period of time if that helps okay. can you follow up yeah thank you I, my question was do we have the science that shows that there are impacts during pile driving to the fishing community? And if we don't have that science, we need to have a plan to get it because it's pretty darn important that we know. Okay. Yeah. The I think it was some of the things that Rick identified, um, as far as you know, fish not biting during active noise. I think that's you know um, pretty well documented that you know there is um, you know though. Um, you know, some fish like black sea bass will, you know, kind of huddle down and um, not bite during that, that active period. Um, we've done studies on, on squid as well. They do seem to get accl uh, acclimatized pretty quickly to it, you know, initial startle response, but once it's con the noise is continuing, they'll continue to do the work. So there is there is a reaction, but it's, it's um, depending on the species, you know, that it, it may be, um, you know, for the, for the duration of the, the pile being driven, um, or it may be, you know, an initial reaction, but then resuming normal behaviors at, at the start of that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. We'll switch to the other side. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Scott Hickman from Galveston, Texas. Um, first off, you know, when they proposed wind in the Gulf, uh, I reached out to Rick a bunch. Rick and I go way back. He's been a, a wealth of information from a fishery standpoint. So he's a good guy to talk to about this. If you're a fisherman, you have any concerns. Um, two, Bohm, Bohm, Mark Belter and his folks down in New Orleans have done a great job doing the, the public calls, stakeholder calls, and really helped. And, and you know, from an agency standpoint, y'all have done a, done a great job. We appreciate that and filled in a lot of gaps. Uh, we love platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, especially the Western Gulf. You know, we were sad to see a lot of them go away during the Idle Iron Obama days. And uh, we're, we're happy that we get a shot at getting a bunch of them back off of Texas again. Um, one thing that, that I haven't even really talked to Rick about, it's kind of come to my attention, I've done a little research, and in there, I don't think there's been a d lot done on this, is how these transmission cables, the circuits, in the electro the electromagnetic uh, energy that, that comes off of those, how's that going to affect certain species? Maybe that's something that was affecting cod, they're more in tune to being bothered by the electromagnetic uh, stuff, and um, you know, is there a plan to do some more research on that in the Gulf? You know, because we're already having problems with cobia migrations and king mackerel are showing up in weird places now and not in their traditional areas. We don't need another issue causing the fish to go where they're supposed to go, especially near shore where we have access to them uh, by our recreational charter and commercial fleet. So is that something that's in the works to start wrapping your mind around it better? Or is that something Rick's you know something, but I, I haven't heard a lot of discussion on the electromagnetic energy that comes off these things. So in, in our area, the, the concerns about electromagnetic fields have been raised by all different fishermen, commercial and recreational, relative to lobsters, scallops, and finfish. And um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'll let Brian fill in the details on what research is being uh, completed or in the works to better understand that. But I think it's something that definitely needs to be figured out before we start going too crazy with covering the 
bottom of the ocean with 12 inch cables with electricity running through them. So um, I think I, I think it's a great point. Um, I'll see if uh, Brian has more specifics on actual studies. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rick, and, and thanks for the question. Um, no, we have, as, as Rick mentioned, it's it's not uh, it's been something that's been brought up um, repeatedly, and, and we have uh, dedicated a lot of funds to uh, studying it. And in, in the Atlantic, for instance, um, you know, we didn't have any cables from that BOEM permitted in place at the beginning, but we do have power cables uh, of similar size and magnitude um, connecting ports of. of uh, New York, there's Neptune cable, Long Island, uh, the Cross Sound cable. So for the Cross Sound cable, we did uh, do um, mesocosm studies with uh, lobster um, and skate um, to look at their their ability to move uh, across uh, an energized cable. Um, that's published on our website as well. They, bottom line, they you know animals can uh, detect you know different uh, electric and magnetic fields. Um, I will will state that all these cables um, are shielded, so it's you're primarily talking about like an induced electric field or a magnetic field, um, rather than you know a straight uh, E field, uh, because they are shielded and, and oftentimes they're um, designed in such a way that any uh, any electromagnetism is uh, canceled out um, in the in the cable design itself. Um, but we've also done um, some work on the West Coast as well, um, and uh, the, again, those results, that was with Dungeness Crab. And um, uh, so all those studies, again, really kind of show that, yeah, they can kind of sense it, but it's not impeding the movement of the animal in, in any way um, that, we, that we can find. Um, and those are available. Those results are available on our website, and we actually had, do have a, an EMF fact sheet that talks not only about uh, the results of the studies, but also you know what species we anticipate might have uh, be able to detect those uh, those magnetic fields. So, so as y'all start putting them in the Gulf, you do have a budget to do some research on this in the Gulf. I, I don't I don't want to speak for Mark uh, Mark Belter, but uh, um, I mean I think if you raise it with them and, and, and the Gulf folks, they'll they, they do their own you know studies prioritization as well and um, and yeah I, I encourage you to reach out to the, out to them and uh, um, you know we, we'll see what that lines up on the their, their prioritization. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks. Looks like thanks Scott. It looks like we have three more questions in about ten more minutes. So um, we can some of these question, questions can spill over into the next session as well. So I'll, we'll, we'll try to get these in, but if we don't, we'll, we'll make it work. Right, so go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Rich Hittinger. I'm the uh, vice president of the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. Uh, and I've been fish, fishing in the area where the Block Island Wind Farm is located uh, before the wind farm was there, uh, uh, during construction in the general area, and since um, and I have two things um, one is a very quick comment and uh, and that is on the aquaculture uh, if you're looking for sites for offshore aquaculture in federal waters consider putting them right next to the wind farms after they're constructed right next to the turbines uh, you've already got disturbance there uh, it'd be a great place to, to look to put aquaculture I think um, the second thing is a bit more complicated, but it's uh, it's looking at the process and the stakeholders. Um, when I look at the process, as Brian explained it, with the four steps, the involvement of stakeholders in those four steps seem to come at step three. Now, it seems as if you want to avoid problems and the way to avoid these problems in terms of people competing for the same place in the ocean or, or having interaction is to get the stakeholders together as early as possible. So it seems that uh, the stakeholders should be involved in, in step one or before step one. Uh, and and uh, I think that bringing in the both commercial and recreational fishing groups uh, into the planning process early on would be very important, and I think it would be uh, beneficial uh, to, to get to get that done early. Um, one of the things that I, that we found, uh, I, I am on the Fisheries Advisory Board uh, for the Rhode Island Coastal Resource Management Council, and we've been working with the wind farms in Rhode Island, uh, the permitting. Uh, they're talking in the South Fork Wind Farm. Uh, 
during installation of these uh, 60 foot diameter monopiles, pounding them down into the sea seabed, they're talking about um, sound levels that are well in excess of 200 decibels. And they have indicated in their own documentation that the sound levels will kill larval and fin fish, as well as kill invertebrates in a, a, a certain radius. And it's, it's out uh, in the vicinity of miles uh, from the actual source. Uh, so, so those are the things that, that I'm concerned about. And I think I'd, I'd like some comments about getting the <clears throat> stakeholders involved early on in the process. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rich. Are there any comments on the, the getting stakeholders involved early or citing aquaculture near the wind turbines? Yeah. Brian and then Rick. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, just real quick. Yeah, I, if I did want to stress that the, the very first thing that BOEM does is, is um, in that planning analysis phase, there is a lot of stakeholder involvement. And maybe, as Rick said, it has changed, it has evolved over, uh, over, over time, especially if we've moved to the more the regional approach versus the state-by-state -state approach. Um, but uh, I did really do want to stress that you know, there, there is a lot of stakeholder involvement in that initial call and area identification up to the wind energy area. Um, but where I, I, I conf you know, where we don't, what we don't have is information on what will actually be constructed in that polygon, right? You know, that's where we don't have that information until such a point where we have a lessee, and that lessee has a good idea of where they want to sell the power and how much power and what the state of the technology is at that time. Um, I didn't have the slide that's showing the size of the turbines getting larger and larger over time, but um, the number of turbines necessary to uh, achieve the energy goals um, has become less as the turbines have, have gotten larger. So it, it becomes a challenge to at what point do we actually have enough information to actually look at, you know, kind of the design and array, and that, that is the step three uh, where we have that. Um, and on, on the sound, I mean, we do take the acoustics uh, very seriously. Uh, the two projects that we have um, uh, just recently approved at a commercial scale are employing um, uh, sound dampening systems, uh, mm -hmm. basically um, underwater bubble curtains to keep that uh, acoustic um, footprint a lot smaller. Um, most of the area where we do anticipate um, any any associated uh, mortality is is in the you know the immediate area of the foundation. Even though we we do talk about like uh, you know being able to detect it at larger distance, like the 160 dB level and, and so forth, that that is a, a another uh, threshold. But that's that's a much further um, distance and and not anticipated to result in any mortality to finfish. But I think that was my uh, yeah. points there. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Rick. Did you want to add something? Yeah, just uh, real quick. Yeah, thanks, Rich, for the comments. And for sure, that's been. Uh, the most frustrating part to me as a fisherman involved in the process is just this feeling of lack of being able to influence decisions from the very, very beginning. And look, we all know how important Cox's Ledge is to Rhode Island's fishing community, but it was still designated as a wind energy area in the very, very beginning. Now that's a decade ago. I think they've made some changes over time. So things like that may not happen again. I hope not, um, but um, there's no real way to correct that problem either going backwards. So I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from is it just doesn't feel like you can participate. But you, even though it doesn't feel like it, you still have to try everything that you can. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. There's a lot of meetings involved, as Rich knows as well as anybody, and um, a, a tremendous amount of time. But it has to be done, and you can make some changes. You may not get all of the changes you want, but you can make some. Um, I didn't really point out in my chart of the Cox Ledge area, but there was a section of uh, bottom that was completely removed from the potential for development based on fishermen's input and in saying that that's a, a little edge that we just need to have, and, and they took it off the map. So I think the New York area got shrunk a little bit, so or maybe even a lot. But, um, so I, I do think that uh, it's important to participate. It's easy to get frustrated and say, tap me out, I'm all done, this is a waste of my time. But you can't. You just got to keep trying and keep trying, and hopefully they listen as much as, as they can. Great. Thanks, Rick. Um, Bob, Bob, if, if I may, this, this is Neil here. 
Oh yeah, I'd like to. Pass. We, got, we only have about five minutes left, and and all these questions are between 150 people and cookies and coffee. So we, I get, I'm getting a lot of stares at me. So people are ready to go. But yeah, go ahead, Neil. Yeah, j just re really quickly to, to Rich's question about co-siting of aquaculture and wind farms. I, I hear this a lot, uh, and we're certainly interested in anything that makes it more appealing in terms of the ease of the permitting process. But there are some just differences in. in uh, the advantages of different locations. Now, these wind farms are in 75 to 95 feet, uh, I think somebody had said. That's not where we want to be. We want to be in deeper water. Uh, uh, generally, for a commercial farm, you'd want to be in 200 feet depth. Wind farms are going to want to be in places where generally where it's windy. Uh, and that's not what we need to be working on the water. And so we generally want to be places where it, it's perhaps not quite so exposed to the wind. And I'll also leave it to Claire to talk about do her clients, the, the folk that are actually putting these windmills in, do they want to have the additional drag and the additional risk of having fish pens and fish farming boats banging around in, in close to where the turbines are? I think it, it, it sounds sweet, but it's a little bit like trying to have a dairy farm next to your, uh, your, your solar farm, perhaps. It, it, it sounds great, but it doesn't really fit very well. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, we'll go to the next question. Try to go through these pretty quick. So I have uh, just a variety of different things when it comes to this conversation. It seems to be fish aggregation and fisherman aggregation at scale is what we're what we're looking at. Um, I've been very encouraged in the sanctuary process and expanding boundaries um, in the Bowen process for understanding fishery impacts with removal of oil and gas platforms. Um, a lot of times it's done with explosives. Uh, want to get some some input and some thought on the future of this um, understanding that these plate these these structures are going to be here for a while in the in the wind segment um, we need pathways to keep them there long term if we're going to if we want to create artificial structure we've learned very quickly in the oil and gas community that now is not the time in the oil and gas to keep those there but now is the time to keep these System, these structures in place. If we're going to do that, we need to establish a pathway now. That's the now's the opportunity, not whenever it's time to decommission these. Um, also, to consider uh, these as potential vectors for invasive species. We've seen that happen through the um, flower garden banks. If you want to talk about lionfish, they love structure and they, they can hop around wherever they need to go. Um, definitely, just consider consider these things, and then the, also the contributions that we have for. Um, opportunities for over harvest and, and what it does to fishing rates um, you aggregate this many fish and this many fishermen uh, we just make, make sure that we, we fully consider these uh, in the in the process to get this moving forward great thanks for that, that feedback any any comments from the panel on that I think it was more of a comment or some ideas for us to think about moving forward all right uh, one last question and if we can do it fairly efficiently people will be happy so appreciate that uh, sure. My name is Kerry Efferton. I'm a chef and recreational logger from New York. Um, so on the aquaculture side, I'm, I'm very engaged in what happens in terms of uh, shellfish and, and, and kelp and everything. Um, there are a lot of concerns in, in my community around what happens in the offshore aquaculture, especially in the Northeast. Um, I did see the atlases um, for the Gulf and for the Pacific. I guess the third one for the Northeast is still pending, and I'm, I'm curious to know uh, the areas and the species more specifically about what's going in there. Great, thanks. Danielle, can you comment on, on the Northeast options? Sure, Will. Um, so we identified both the Gulf and Southern California as the first two areas that we would look for aquaculture opportunity areas. Over time, we expect to identify 10 aquaculture opportunity areas, which will probably take us around the country in some fashion, but it's really been driven by interest from stakeholders. So there's not an atlas in the works currently for New England or the Northeast. Um, as we move ahead in developing additional aquaculture opportunity areas, as our resources allow, um, there'll be opportunities for engagement of where we go. So far, we haven't heard um, resounding interest from the Northeast. It's been a bit mixed because there's a lot going on in New England right now, um, and we understand that. So. There's a lot of potential and a lot of commercial interest, but when it comes to developing an atlas, 
associated with the aquaculture opportunity area process. Um, that's not currently in the works. Okay, great. Thanks, Danielle. Any other comments on this uh, question? All right, seeing none, I'll turn it over to Jessica to lead us into the break. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let's give a final round of applause to all our panelists. And our panelists. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, so we are going to take a break now, um, just a little bit less than 15 minutes. And um... all right, we've got we're almost there. We're one panel member short, but we're going to go ahead and get started and, and we'll we'll figure that out as we go. Um, <clears throat> So welcome back from the break, and uh, hopefully everybody got some coffee and some snacks and they're uh, a little bit of energy and moving around a little bit. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the second portion of this session on um, ocean uses and balancing the, the different um, ocean uses that are out there and the multiple, many, many uses that people want to have out in the ocean. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're going to have, uh, I think, seven panel members. Uh, two online and five up front once we find Marcos. And uh, I mean, t yeah, two online and five up front once we find Marcos. Um, and <clears throat> really, this is a, a facilitated session to hear from the expert panel on uh, just general topics, some of the things we talked about this morning or earlier in this session and, and uh, some of the other things as well. But there will be some time for questions and comments during the session as well. Uh, so uh, write those down and we'll, we'll try to fit it all in. We are going to try to end at um, 345 or pretty close to it. Um, a few minutes late is okay, but we don't want to run too long. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started and introduce the panel members. Um, the first three are, or actually the first four are from the previous panel. We've got Brian Hooker from BOEM, Danielle Blacklock from NOAA Aquaculture Office, uh, Rick Bellavance from New England Council and Charter Road Captain, and um, Claire Riche, did I get it right? Yeah. I really butchered it earlier, so I'm happy I got it right that time. Um, and then there's three new uh, members, Marcos Henke. Marcos is um, chair of the Caribbean Fishery Management Council. Welcome, Marcos. Uh, Dr. Jason McNamee, who is deputy director of, for natural resources with Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And Karin Braby, Dr. Karin Braby, um, Marine Resource Program Manager with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and she is virtual, and you guys can see her on the screen. Welcome, Karin. Glad, you glad you're here. Um, so with that, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, obviously, the, the first four panel members I introduced, you heard kind of where they were coming from earlier, but I'd like to go quickly to Marcos, Jason, and Karin, and just ask them for kind of a two-minute introduction on, on you know, what their background related to these issues of ocean uses is and just kind of kind of where they're coming from. So with that, Marcos, do you mind giving a, a quick spiel? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcos Hanke. I'm the chairman of the Caribbean Council, charter operator for more than 30 years. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to put a little bit of perspective, uh, Caribbean perspective to this, right? Because once you talk about continental development of aquaculture and when wind farm and so on is very different than what happened in the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean peculiarities, uh, be mindful that Captain Crew uh, grew from Hawaii, brought some of those points uh, uh, that make sense to us too. Uh, Caribbean peculiarity is the mosaic of sensitive habitats, strong recreational and sport fishing uh, uh, potential, presence of small scale artisanal fishery, very close close deep waters and finally in case of the, our region our council is divided in three islands San Thomas, San John, uh, San Croix and Puerto Rico all of them with different backgrounds uh, and uses for the fishing resource especially on the recreational fishery and uh, Puerto Rico have in case of Puerto Rico we have a, a experience on, on aquaculture with the Cobia farm before, and uh, it was, a, from my perspective, from the industry perspective, was a missed opportunity to utilize species of local consumption like mutton snapper, sailing farm, farm fish through the traditional fishing village and markets, and also develop local capacity building on, with the university. Uh, important, 
the recreational and commercial fishing community economic and economic participation uh, promote that while prom uh, food security and avoid and avoiding gentrification of the resources is something that is very important and requested by the fishing industry especially recreational and small scale fishers uh, aquaculture opportunities maybe i'm going to get into that later on on the discussion i have a list of it uh, one thing that i want this group to to discuss and to have on mind is that we are not discussing the secondary value of the aquaculture we have aquaculture measured by the poundage of single species produced by the unit but in case of the Caribbean, the way this is going to work out is like our environment, that is a multitask, like the scientists know. You have to interpret in an ecosystem-based management or an ecosystem with a broader approach to be effective in the Caribbean. Same will apply to the aquaculture. Uh, for example, on the cobia farms, we have huge recruitment of small lobsters that was attached to the cages, but there was no follow-up structures for that lobster to get into the environment and to be part of a, of a fishing opportunity on the natural population. And this is just a single example of the secondary values like that we have to explore and integrate once we develop aquaculture in the Caribbean. I have many other points. I don't want to take the opportunity from the others but we keep conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. Appreciate those comments. Dr. McNamee. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and hi, everybody. Jason McNamee. Uh, I work, uh, you're hearing a lot about Rhode Island today. Uh, I'm, I'm another one of those little state, but uh, lots of people here. Um, so I work for the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. It's a state agency. Uh, and it's the it's the natural resource agency for the um, state of Rhode Island, and I thought I'd offer um, we we are in the precarious position of you know being on point for natural resource issues with both aquaculture and uh, with any offshore um, energy projects, um, and so I thought I'd offer kind of a the two different contexts that we we worked with, we've been involved with aquaculture for a while. Um, and the way we managed aquaculture, there's there's another agency within the state that comes into play here. And, and this is something that I think fishermen in particular, but r really everybody found uh, enormously confusing as a lot of uh, these discussions started, started to happen. There's a Coastal Zone Management Agency in, in Rhode Island in, in most states. Um, and they're kind of the point on both aquaculture siting and also any offshore energy projects. Um, and so they had been the lead, but when it comes to the natural resource impacts, my agency comes in into play. And so in the case of aquaculture, the way we always operated was we would get an application for uh, from a, an aquaculturist. They'd find a site. Uh, they'd kind of spec out a project and then put an application in. It'd come to us through the, the Coastal Zone Management Agency. Um, and so that's how it happened. It was sort of you know um, ad hoc. These one-off projects would come in, and we'd react to them uh, individually, case by case. In the case of you know, Rhode Island was, uh, as has been brought up a couple of times today, home to the first offshore wind project off of Block Island. In that case, we actually had a starting point. We, the Coastal Zone Agency, through the uh, foresight of the executive director of that agency, Grover Fugate, they had developed an uh, Ocean Special Area Management Plan, OSAMP, mm -hmm. is, is how we talked about it, where they had thought about before anybody was talking about wind turbines offshore they had created uh, a set of information that gathered where people were fishing habitat types like all, all of the science and information available at the time and kind of collected it into a, a big giant document um, and so when the block island project uh, started to be discussed we had a plan uh, and information to work from 
And so that, that's the context that I, I wanted to offer you. Um, and so there's sort of two take home points from offering you those two situations. Uh, the first is having a, a plan is better than not having a plan. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but as these projects begin to work their way down the coast, I think that's something other state agencies ought to be thinking about is getting ahead of that, collecting the information now. Um, and then the other really important part is in both cases, the critical aspects of what happens during the discussions is getting that local knowledge. Even though a lot of the offshore wind projects, they're large national, you know, uh, focused projects, that local knowledge from those local folks in the adjacent uh, states, you need that information. You need a good mechanism to get out there and get that information from the local um, folks because it's critical. Everywhere has foibles and nuances and um, you can't understand that from large kind of nationally focused data collection systems. You have to get that uh, from the, the homegrown folks um, in the states. So I'll probably uh, park it there, Bob, and pass it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Dr. Bravey, you want to make an opening comment, please? Yes, please. Just checking to see you can hear me this afternoon. Yep, sounds great. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me as part of this panel. I've been involved in um, ocean uses and balancing ocean uses for over a decade now, uh, following a number of issues that have hit Oregon. Um, I am a trained scientist. I'm a marine biologist uh, by trade uh, and currently a fishery manager, natural resource manager. So that's my uh, context. Uh, I've been on the West Coast most of my life, short stint in DC. Um, and so I know this area really well um, and across the region. And one of the, one of the things that's really quite different from East Coast versus West Coast, and I feel like I need to speak for the West Coast here on this panel, um, is that north of uh, San Francisco Bay area for sure, um, our West Coast area is quite rural and our uh, coastal communities still are very much engaged in natural resource um, extraction and activity, and that's both um, sport and commercial. Um, we have a very um, delicate economic um, situation where low population of people on the coast and, and things like sport fishing and commercial fishing are essential to driving those economies and those cultures. They're very integrated into and, and part of the character of, of this whole region. And um, our coast is pretty um, pristine as well. Uh, we don't have a lot of development. We don't have things in the water. Uh, and so uh, thinking about bringing in new uses is really um, a, a, a difference. This is gonna be a, a very uh, different future for us as this develops. Um, and instead of it being a wide open public trust resources, we're seeing these uh, developing ocean uses as privatizing the ocean. Um, and cutting it up into sections and prohibiting uses and, and so on. Um, and so that, that is a difference uh, maybe for us uh, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, I really appreciate the comments from others um, in the earlier panel and, and then just now about listening to local voices. It's essential in understanding the science, the fisheries, the culture, the economics of how the system works, because we all want uh, responsible development. And what that means is very different, uh, both based on the ecosystem context and the cultural and economic context. Uh, one size does not fit all. In Oregon, um, we have uh, embraced the Rhode Island uh, approach, which is planning is good. Uh, and so from uh, an early time, we have been looking at wave energy and we've developed what's known as a geographic location description or GLD, which is a bureaucratic term for a plan um, for uh, getting Oregon at the table for um, permitting decisions offshore. Uh, we've invited uh, to uh, 
our colleagues at, at BOEM uh, to develop a task force with us. And so we've had that task force running since I think 2011. So that planning is part of the Oregon culture and, and context as well. Um, another difference between East Coast and West Coast is that while monopile uh, installation is uh, trusted uh, and tried and true technology in Europe, in uh, Britain, and starting on the East Coast, the West Coast is not um, conducive to using monopile installations for wind. Uh, and so we are looking at floating offshore wind, which is very nascent technology and so brings with it a whole level of additional concerns about ecosystem use, um, compatibility with um, uh, fishery activity around the devices, uh, and, and we have a very rough ocean. So um, uh, not saying that that's a difference, there's rough oceans, lots of places, but that is a really big um, concern and something that we're all paying attention to carefully. So one of my other hats is um, serving as Oregon's uh, co-chair on the Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Coordination Council. Um, control of fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas use and impacts on our climate and the ocean is essential uh, to me as an individual and to the state of Oregon. Uh, and so we need to find a way to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels, but uh, we need to do it in a way that's smart and that respects um, and embraces the fact that our ocean is fragile and uh, can be damaged by us. We've shown that, we see that already. Uh, and we need to be careful how we uh, put steel in the water because uh, it will be very hard to pull back and fix mistakes that we make. So looking forward to a, a thoughtful uh, panel discussion today on how we do it right. Uh, not quickly, but right. How do we get this right? Thanks. Great, thanks Karen. And uh, Karin and Danielle, we can we can see both your pictures. So as we go into this uh, discussion phase, just wave your hand uh, if you want to make a comment. We'll we'll call on you and get you in the in the lineup here. Um, <clears throat> I've got a I don't know four or so seed questions to get the conversation going. I don't think it's going to be too hard to keep the conversation flowing with the with the folks that we have, and that's a compliment. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and and pose one of the questions, and then we'll we'll see where the conversation takes us. Um, First question I have, you know, what steps are, are need to be taken to maintain su uh, sustainable recreational fishing opportunities as wind power and aquaculture grow? So what what do we need to do to make sure there, there's still strong fishing op recreational fishing opportunities as these uh, technologies develop? So with that, uh, any any hands, any thoughts? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe harder than I thought. Uh, Karin, go ahead, please. <clears throat> I'll start us off. I'm sure others will jump in. But uh, sustainability to me really uh, goes back to the science and understanding our stocks. Um, and that means that we need to have really solid surveys for stock assessments, surveys for ecosystem health and monitor those over time. Um, if we put in wind devices or we do some other activity and it impacts those stocks or that the supportive nature of the ecosystem for those stocks, our fisheries fall apart. And so there were some really great comments at the earlier panel of um, folks thinking about that and thinking about the connections there that we need to have very science-based decision-making and monitor over time so that we know if we need to um, adapt our course forward and make sure that those stocks are sustainable. Um, that's a really core element of one of my other hats, which is a uh, council member for the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And I know there are other council members on this panel and in the room. Um, and that is uh, really critical work that we need to do together. Great, thanks. Jason, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so you know, I was thinking back as you're asking the question to the breakout session from earlier. And, and one of the really key discussion points that um, came up during that discussion was about flexibility. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's a key, um, a key step here is 
you know, flexibility on both sides, both from the fishermen side, and I've been amazed by the creativity of, of some of the fleet in Rhode Island with the Block Island project where, you know, there was a lot of concern uh, ahead of time as, as there should have been about the, the impacts uh, to their businesses. But what, you know, I think it's largely been a fairly positive experience on the recreational side, I should specify. Um, but they were able to, you know, this has been talked about a lot, but there are fishing, actual fishing opportunities. And I think there was also other creative opportunities that uh, the fishermen that are out on the water with boats were able to um, get involved in, like, you know, um, bringing tourists out to, to see the wind. It's people want to go see the windmills and get a boat ride. And um, so that was a way they supplemented uh, their their business and so on the fishermen side I, they're built to be flexible and, and to pivot and, and to go where the the opportunity uh, is we also on the government side need to be flexible and allow them to pivot and to build systems within our states that um, you know don't prohibit them from kind of you know, moving to a different species or a different type of operation or into a different time of year, if that is where they need to go to stay in business. So just the key element there is an important step is to make sure you can maintain flexibility um, because that will allow fishermen to do what they do and stay in business. Great, thanks. Daniel, did you have your hand up earlier? All right, go Danielle and then to Brian. I did, thanks. I would say that the key is to participate. Uh, it is our sincerest hope, at least with aquaculture planning from NOAA's perspective, that this is not a black box exercise. All of the lids of the box are open and we're punching holes in the side and we're just hoping that people will read and engage and participate aquaculture opportunity area process is one way to participate. That's all planning related. Those can be, they're not just for fin fish, they're for any type of aquaculture. They're also not only in federal waters, they can be built in state waters in collaboration with the state. Um, and the other key to them is that it's not a permitting exercise. Permitting is still required. So it's sort of an extra engagement opportunity. You have engagement at the planning level and then you also have engagement opportunities at the permitting level with the permitting agencies. And the key to all of it is that you have to take advantage of those opportunities. And we will do our very best to let you know when those are. But I sincerely mean, please participate, because I certainly don't know what that room full of people knows. And it will only make a better product if all of that knowledge is consolidated into one process. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Brian. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, advantage to going after a lot of people. Uh, a lot of great points raised. And, and you know, it's, I think, you know, the, the premise of your question is what can we do to ensure, like, the access? And I, I think what we've demonstrated from the earlier discussion, too, is that access doesn't appear to be the problem. Um, it, it's, I think, where we've identified where we perhaps need more information is around the usage. And I think, um, you know, we just heard about, you know, is there a shift and in, in change as a result of, let's say, around Block Island, a lot of recreational fishing, has that, you know, resulted in, you know, movement of some commercial operations into a different place? And so um, we have the tools and resources to look at, uh, you know, fisheries effects. That's fairly well standard. But as far as, like, understanding the human dimension and changes in um, human use of the area at the resolution, to um, make meaningful decisions, I think, is an, an area of opportunity uh, around both in any other uh, shared shared use of the ocean. So, great, thanks, Brian. Other comments from anyone? Yeah, or Marcos. Yes, uh, I left this hoping for opportunity to add what you just said. Uh, for example, a list of significant, uh, important things that can be added or develop in conjunction to the projects, which is already partially discussed, habitat restoration, erosion control, recruitment and enhancement for natural stock, fat for pelagics, diving industry, tourism attraction, and, and all of that will 
go around to community inclusion and promote well-being on the whole community. One thing that I, I hear, maybe it's because of our, the way the things work in the Caribbean is that on the high production areas that you are going on the cold waters, you're really going for that max quantity of, of fish. And we are trained by nature, by our day by day, to do a multitasking thing. And I think it's, we have the opportunity to do that. And for example, before it was brought to the table, why we don't do aquaculture on the wind farms, right? Well, yes, maybe it's going to create some problems, but maybe you can do mussels, you can do some things there that will produce some poundage and some benefits and, and or some recruit extra recruitment for other species. And these analysis have to be done that we are losing sight of it. And this is my invitation to the group and to the experts to explore those those opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Marcos. Uh, Rick, do you have a comment? <clears throat> Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, pretty much in line with what everybody's already said, but I, I just have to flag that I, I just think that there's a, a lack of understanding, or an accurate understanding of the recreational fishery and how it works, you know, both the for hire and the private angling side. And anything that we can do as a as participants in those industries to help plug in some of those holes with information just makes for better decisions. Through the processes that I've been involved with, it's always been fishermen sitting around a table, offshore developers on the other end of the table, and you're going back and forth. And the stronger your data is to make your point, the easier it is to get compromise. But if there's some uncertainty around what you're providing to back up your case, just makes it easier for the other side to say we don't believe you so we're not doing that and I, th I think that as we go forward just thinking and you know even if it's your own logbook or whatever you can write down to make a clear picture of what it means to you in your area all these projects are different um, and what happens in southern New England is the impacts might be different than what happens down you know, midway down the Atlantic or in the in the Gulf because the, the terrain is different, the species are different, the fisheries are different. So it's important to really localize your your fishery and, and have a way to explain that as you get an opportunity. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's another area we haven't talked much about, so I'll bring it up. It's kind of a sensitive topic, and that's mitigation. So if, if there are impacts to fishing, they're unavoidable, maybe it's during construction, maybe it's during operation, how, what should mitigation look like, and how should that be structured, and how should it be handled uh, with these projects going forward, assuming, assuming we need it? You know, and I'm, I'm not saying we will, but if, if mitigation is appropriate and necessary, what's the best way to handle uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation impacts to, or mitigating impacts to the recreational fisheries? Jason. Yeah, I'll, I'll venture uh, into these uh, tricky <laughs> Someone waters Someone had to go here. first. Yeah, and, you know, I guess, <clears throat> interestingly, as we're sort of thinking about this topic, uh, in the case of commercial fisheries, and it was not easy uh, when I say this, but it's a straighter line, I guess, to sort of think about that. There's a kind of a a business there's a product there an amount uh, history that you can look at so it's like a little more straightforward in the case of recreational fisheries it's way more complicated it's more oblique it's more indirect but there's still an impact um, and you know I, I think we've in Rhode Island at least I think we've largely lost that aspect of, of thinking about this. And, and it's because I think in general, my sense, and, and Rick can correct me or, or anyone in the audience who wishes to can correct me. Um, you know, again, I think they, they've been seen as favorable installations and, and not uh, a negative. Um, and so, you know, the mitigation has sort of fallen off, but there's a loss of access to an area for a period of time during construction. And there's, there's impacts to recreational fishers as well. So I'm not giving you much of an answer here other than to offer that it's a much more difficult problem to think about on the recreational side of things than, than it was for um, the commercial side of, of uh, the ledger. 
Thanks, Jason. Uh, Rick had his hand up, then Brian, you sort of had your hand up. So, Are you committed <laughs> to an answer? So Rick will go first while you think about it. All right. I don't blame you, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, so this is where the rubber hits the road, right? So <clears throat> mitigation first, from my opinion anyway, mitigation is a couple different things. First is how we mitigate the project in general, right? Can we do things like Brian mentioned, a bubble curtain to make sound so that it's not as big of a deal? Maybe you put the windmills in during a time when there's less fish in the area or something like that. So that's one way. You can also remove turbines from places that are really important and not allow one to be built in one spot, but don't crush the whole project things like that that's mitigation but then ultimately you get to this compensation argument at the end of the day and that's where it gets ugly nobody wants to give their money away and that's where we had all of our fights so um, coming to the table with that information is the first thing that the recreational fishery can do for sure in my experience the the private angling community wasn't even really recognized as a, a, a something that needed to be compensated for um, in some of the projects in our area and we worked hard to explain that no that's not actually true there's a lot going on and maybe you know boats would be bought differently based on impacts and so on and so forth so there's a lot you can think about there on the for hire side I think there's a more willingness to understand because there's an actual business model there and if you lose a trip to an area uh, because you want to go shark fishing and they're banging on the ground when the sharks are around now you can't go Maybe they don't want to go straight bass fishing, so you lose that day. That's an actual tangible thing that you can look at and say that was X amount of dollars. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it comes down to being able to characterize that and make a good argument at the, at the table when you're negotiating those compensatory uh, arrangements. And also thinking outside of the box, it's not always just giving a check to every fisherman. Maybe there's a marketing campaign to lift the whole for hire industry up. That would be helpful instead of just writing a check. Or maybe there's uh, boat ramps that can be fixed and other things besides just a, a solid dollar value. So it, it's complicated, but it's, it's something that can be worked out. It's just not very fun. Great, thanks. Brian? I think Rick really uh, identify what I was going to uh, elaborate on is that yeah, mitigation takes many forms and when you brought up mitigation I think a lot of people's minds go straight to what Rick was talking about the compensatory mitigation piece which uh, I think Rick already addressed um, but yeah there, you know, there's mitigation to you know fishing activity there's mitigation to the fishery resource um, and I think as, as many people in this room probably know that BOEM is in the process of developing uh, guidance uh, to lessees on you know the, what we what we may look for in construction and operations plans as uh, in regards to mitigating um, fishery impacts again when I say fishery I mean you know the fishing activity impacts and not so much the the fishery resource uh, activity so um, that that's the, the main point I wanted to, to, to bring up it is you know an active area of discussion um, within BOEM and in and, and, and the Northeast uh, broadly um, but I think it's really important to try to think of it, you know, in that bigger picture of avoid, minimize, and then compensate, um, you know, and, and what it is that we're, we're looking for. So. Great. Thanks, Brian. Marcos. Uh, the Council is involved on, Caribbean Council is involved on sustainable fishing campaign, uh, exploring different uh, species for diff new uses for different species. And I have some, some examples, and it's very interesting to do this on a recreational fishing summit, saying that uh, before in Puerto Rico, we just used blue runners for bait. Now it's being used by recreational fishermen for consumption, and they actually learn how to clean, how to prepare in a specific way. And my example is going that the mitigation is not just repairing a habitat or repairing a species, it can mitigate the effect that, it, that, that the fishermen will have in the future in terms of access to the fishing resource and the ability to do this sport and to go, go out fishing, right? And by doing those campaigns, I think we would go a long way that once something happens, there is alternatives, there is ways that the recreational fishermen can keep performing the, the sport, their sport. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Clear? Clear? I just wanted to also build on what Brian was talking about earlier about the, the RFI on, on fisheries mitigation. The offshore wind industry definitely, I think, recognizes the importance of this mitigation step um, and has thought a lot about what it looks like to have a compensation 
um, a mitigation scheme across all leasehold um, across all leases. So obviously, fishermen um, cross um, multiple leases to get to different fishing grounds. And we submitted a, um, a proposal to the the BOEM request for information, mm -hmm. and I thought thought a lot about it. And I think. Um, kind of Rick's points about data and understanding the exact impacts and what impacts um, come from um, offshore wind turbines versus climate change are really important um, pieces. And so having that data, I think, is, is really important to make sure that um, that, that can be factored into compensation because that is something that the, the industry has has really kind of come together around across all, all the competitor all the competitive companies and, and leases on wanting to establish a, a federal a federal scheme that works across um, leaseholders to to coexist with um, the fishing industry, both commercial and rec in, in the ocean. Great, thanks, Claire. And then I'll have a comment from Karin, and then we're going to go into a question and answer session with with the audience. So, with that, Karin, you're up. Great. Uh, just a couple of things to add. I think this is a great conversation. Um, I think one of the challenges we have um, on the West Coast is definitely that it's it's hard to quantify what the impacts are going to be, and it's going to take additional steps other than just figuring out where people are on, on the plotters. Uh, it's going to take economic evaluation of what those days on the water actually mean to coastal communities to understand what's at risk and even what would be compensated for. Um, so I think we have some additional due diligence to, to go through on the West Coast to really identify what those um, what those costs are. And then we also really haven't gone through a careful definition process of what acceptable impacts are. Uh, and so I just want to kind of take a step back and say we really need to understand that trade-offs might be in an unacceptable category. They might be acceptable. They might be beneficial. But until we kind of have clear um, goalposts for what um, those different categories of impacts look like, um, understanding a footprint of a fishery on the water doesn't really help us enough um, to make really responsible decisions. Um, and then I, I also just um, uh, wanted to you know, acknowledge that there are mitigation steps just in the design and building of the farms that should be taken into consideration. And, and Claire, thank you for your comments. You know, allowing access where possible um, to fisheries, allowing safe navigation, creating navigational channels among different components of a large, a large farm, for example. Um, preparing for change um, over time and preparing for potential decommissioning um, so that those uh, devices have a lifespan and are responsibly pulled from the environment when the time is right. All of those things um, are really important for um, the mitigation of the activity uh, versus the compensatory mitigation to an industry or to a fishery sector. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, with that, if anyone has con or questions, go ahead and line up the microphones and we'll take those. And, and while folks are lining up, I don't see many people moving, but if folks are lining up, I just want to introduce Miranda Peterson. Miranda, raise your hand. She's uh, from Senator, I mean, uh, Congressman Pallone's office. Uh, so if anyone wants to catch up with her and, and talk uh, Capitol Hill issues, she's more than welcome. I think she'll be around for an hour, a while. She'll be hanging around for the rest of today, at least. So with that, um, Patrick, you're up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so again, Patrick Paquette from Massachusetts. Um, Full disclosure, I used to be associated with a group called Anglers for Offshore Wind. Um, and I live in Hyannis, Massachusetts. I also operate a, um, a fishing lodge for the f over the five weeks of the Martha's Vineyard Striped Bass and Bluefish Derby. Um, and I fish offshore in some of these proposed wind, shore, um, wind areas. Um, specifically along the lines of getting to mitigation, um, I'm also a member of the Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Fisheries Working Group. There's a couple of us <laughs> that serve on that body in this room. Um, so I believe that some of the baseline data that's um, that's been even promoted isn't enough. Um, I believe that we have a lot of data mining looking at the recreational offshore fisheries, um, especially toward what I'll say is our end of the Massachusetts end and the Rhode Island end. 
um i think there's some more data down at the rhode island end but i believe that that besides the data mining type of study that we should have had ahead of time more actual study to establish baselines we're going to break ground steel in the water um within the next few months so my question is this whether you agree or disagree with the amount of baseline knowledge do we have enough data and how are we to anticipate and measure after the fact when we know what the actual impacts are because our concern is we don't know what the impacts are um, we want we believe that the companies are doing what Boehm says my question is how what is the action about when the claims for the impacts come after the fact to what happens with the fisheries that have been going on out there the HMS fishery as people have said reaches all the way back to big money marinas all along these islands all along Cape Cod all along Rhode Island every time you see one of those boats sitting there that cost a half a million dollars with its 12 foot tower you know and it's off in and it's offshore gear every one of those tournaments that is a million dollars going through it or more those impacts if they're impacted i don't know that they are i want to pay i want to mitigate actual problems that can be quantified but if if we don't have enough baseline data that terrifies me that terrifies me and so i'm want, looking for some comments about the actual baseline data because early on in the process the comments from us and from anglers was <clears throat> baseline data um, as directed by the ssc so that fisheries management bodies could make those judgments about impacts and i really didn't I, I'm not satisfied with the answers that have been given to the public. I'm satisfied with the answers about a lot of the other questions that have even been brought up here. But the ability to determine impact and then discuss mitigation after the fact, judged against the baseline data of the recreational sport fishing fleet out there, I'd like to hear your comments on it. Thanks, Patrick. Anyone want to comment on baseline data and, and where things stand? Karin, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that um, for some stocks, for some activities, we have a lot of really good data. Unfortunately, that's not the rule. Uh, we have a lot of stocks for which we don't have enough data and um, those baseline data are essential and, and yet we are in a situation right now where we have a, a mandate. We have a need to think about alternative energy sources. We're never going to have perfect information. And so we're, we're facing a situation where we're trying to make decisions in the face of uncertainty, and it's always challenging. Um, I think that we have more time to do additional due diligence to gather uh, information before final decisions are made. Um, but it's going to take intention and collaboration among all of the folks on this panel and across the nation who are actively engaged in these activities to agree to do that, to do it slowly and right so that we can collect the additional information that we need to cover those bases to the degree that we can without being unreasonable and trying to seek perfection, um, which is unattainable. Um, so thanks for the question. I think it's a really important one. Great, thanks. Other comments? Go with Brian and then Rick. Yeah, thanks, Patrick, for the for the question. Um, you know, I, I think as as we just heard, and uh, that you know, there's always going to be a, an opportunity for more information to be collected, right? I mean, there's fishery management decisions that are that are made on uh, yeah. the existing information. Um, we have an obligation to look at the best available information. Um, and again, as I mentioned, in, you know, we have the environmental studies program that um, you know, seeks to identify where there's information gaps and uh, mm -hmm. to fill those information gaps. Um, so I, I, you know, as we you know, begin to actually develop some facilities, I think we'll start to get better, better information of, about, I think in the last question I was asked very, oops, sorry feedback there um 
very pointedly on what what's an area of an opportunity, and I think it is um, what we've identified in, is, is recreational use and, and how recreational usage of an area may change over time, um, where that information may be a little more available for uh, some more of the fisheries uh, data, uh, fisheries, uh, the commercial fisheries that operate there. So, um, and I, I doubt I'm fully answering uh, your, your question, um, but. Uh, you know, I, I do believe we have the information necessary to support um, our decisions, and you know, we look forward to continuing to increase the available information uh, to support our decisions in the future. Rick, you can go ahead. that noise <clears throat> so um, just a couple of quick points on on monitoring pre-construction monitoring um, first is so we're pretty far along the path here in southern New England but there's other areas that are you know have opportunities to do things a little different and learn from some of the lessons that we learned in, in southern New England and one of the first lessons that I would stress is from a fisherman's perspective anyway we feel it's important to do any kind of um, pre-construction surveying, pre-project surveying um, before they do any of the geological surveying of the area. So the developers will come through and they, we call it mowing the lawn. They go back and forth with these different sounding devices and sonar things. And um, if you're trying to monitor that area for fisheries resources at the same time, there's likely to be some impacts of that other activity going on at the same time you're monitoring. So what's the value of the data there? Um, so if you have a chance to do that first and then let them go in and monitor or do it separate, not at the same time, that's a recommendation I would make. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing I think is pretty cool is, so there's, as technology improves, there's more and more opportunity to put these electronic receivers, acoustic receivers, and uh, around different areas and then have fish w implanted with uh, acoustic transmitters and you can kind of learn a lot from that too um, I think that that's kind of a new technology I think at least in our area it is and I've been happy to participate in a project that does some of that I think they should do more of it and I think that's helpful data so those are my, my two recommendations good thanks and Jason yeah this is a, that was a great question um, and I thought I would add one additional element and that is you know what we're talking about the types of things that we're talking about whether they be the economic aspects or the biological aspects there's just a ton of uncertainty and so the statistical power that you need to be able to actually see something from within the data is something that needs to really be considered you need a lot of sampling um, and you know we kind of learn that through the Block Island project um, and so I just offer that as advice um, to sort of think about that aspect uh, of trying to understand future states from your baseline um, and so that I think what really needs to happen is you need to hone in on a core set of things that you're going to look at and, and compare because um, you can't possibly do enough sampling to get at all of it. And, and one final comment, and it's something Rick just said that I'll emphasize, and that is, uh, you know, I, I was sort of um, disappointed. I, I think there hasn't been as much looking back at the Block Island project as a model as there should be. And so that's another um, thing that I encourage people to look back, look at that process, look at what was done there and, and learn from it and, and build from that. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments on this one? Doesn't look like it. Yes, sir. Question. Yo. Is this on? Yep. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm Captain Mike Piridnock. I'm from Massachusetts and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, ask a few questions. Um, I mean, as it's been noted, it's not clear what the cumulative impacts of hundreds of wind turbines are going to be on our fishery. Um, and there's concerns for us and, and uh, for many that, for instance, uh, we go to Cox's Ledge for cod. 
as well as for pelagics. And as has been pointed out with Block Island or, or logic dictates, these are fish aggregating devices. They've done a great job at Block Island of attracting black sea bass. So logic dictates that if now you're going to place these wind turbines out at Cox's Ledge or elsewhere, you know, to the claw all the way to Gordon's Gully, uh, they're going to now attract black sea bass. We don't go to Cox's Ledge for black sea bass. We're going there for cod. So we have significant concerns that this is going to result in an artificial fish aggregation that will now move species into there and displace cod and other species that are there. And for all of us in the Northeast, we, we go after black sea bass near shore. That, that's where we want them to be. We don't want them moving offshore. We want to be able to go to cod, uh, go go to those other areas, and for the cods to be maintained. I think it was I, I was unaware too until um, Rick pointed it out with this 12-year issue that uh, it could take a 12-year period of time to do this, and uh, ultimately the impact on us or being, our ability to fish and the fish disappearing when that takes place. Me and others on the water, as they've done these geotechnical surveys the past few years, I'll, I'll tell you, as I think Rick mentioned it, the fish disappear. They take off to our frustration while that takes place. Uh, so for us, that's, that's having a detrimental impact. Uh, in addition, as noted, you don't want to be doing your fishery surveys while you're doing the geotechnical surveys because the fish are taking off. So, you know, ultimately, what could happen here to the detriment of the shoreside angler or the vessel or the boat or the recreational boat or, or, or for hire vessel that doesn't have the ability to go to Cox's, to go to the Claw, to go to Gordon's Gully because the, they don't have a vessel that can safely transit out there, is that this could result in those species moving there and not coming near shore. I know this is all speculation, but we all keep pointing to black sea bass. It's a resilient species. It's moving north with climatic shift. They're finding them all the way up in Maine in the lobster traps. And, 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 and as I said, logic dictates these could be fish aggregating devices for them and displace species. So I'd just like to get your thoughts about that and, and what could be done, which I'm not sure what could be done because the cumulative impacts aren't understood. But I think this is one item that makes some sense it uh, possibly could occur. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Any comments on the question about displacement and species, species complex changes and, and the impacts? Brian? Yeah, maybe just, yeah, briefly, yeah, no, I, uh, thanks, Mike, for, for, that, for that question. I, I think we actually have, you know, been able to learn a lot, um, I was talking at, at the break about, you know, artificial reef sites, and, and we do see different species compositions. I think many recreational anglers, you know, would agree, like, you know, the distance from shore and where you know artificial reef sites are located. I think we're seeing. We didn't get to see. I don't think we got to see the video of Seavow at the at the break. Um, but I think you know um, more anecdotally. I think the species composition at, at Seavow um, does differ to some extent, which is what like 20 miles offshore. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, than than what we're seeing at Block Island, which is you know less than three miles fr from shore. So. Um, I, again, again, lots of opportunity there to, to learn about what those d uh, differentiations. But I think there are some great examples in the Gulf of Mexico and other places where there is structure and being able to see that, that distance, uh, the difference in species composition um, based on distance from shore or other uh, attributes of the ocean bottom. Thanks, Ben. Karen, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, yes, those are issues. <laughs> the cumulative impacts are a concern and fish displacement is a concern. And as we see fish stocks uh, move north or do different things um, as, as we're seeing our oceans change, you know, having rigid structures in the water where these fish are trying to migrate through, um, it, it, it's going to cause different pinch points in the future than we have today. And so collectively, we need to anticipate um, those as much as possible and try and figure out how to um, provide for adaptive management essentially in the future. Um, and it, you know, we kind of need a crystal ball to be able to do that to some degree. Um, but it's something we should all be talking about. We should all be considering and planning for because it will it will happen. And, and our fleet on the West Coast uses 
the waters from Washington to California seamlessly. The fish use that space seamlessly. Um, they don't recognize state borders uh, and they don't recognize polygons for local culture facilities. Um, so we need to we need to figure out how to let those resources flow um, while these changes are happening um, and while we're putting ridges structures. All right, great. Thank you. Um, any other comments on this one? We've got about 10 minutes or so, Jessica, is that about right? About 10 minutes or so. we got three more folks lined up. So let's go to the next topics and, and we'll see where we go. Tom Fody. Well, I was thinking when the conversation had mitigation of private anglers, how do we do that? And it's a lot different. The, the biggest impact will be on the private anglers because they make up, when I look at New Jersey, most of the, the income comes from the private boat anglers, whether it's spending money here, spending money there, but that's what, to the state, it's where they get their taxes and everything else. And how do we compensate them? There's only about three ways you really can do that. And one is by doing research to feel what the impacts are. And that goes back to baseline, but I'll cover that in a few seconds. But the other two ways you gotta do it is providing public access. Because that's what's important to the private anglers, whether it's boat ramps, whether it's other facilities, to basically have that data, that area that basically they can fish from. And if you're affecting what's going on there, one of the ways mitigation money can be spent is on public access and giving greater access, which companies have to do when they impact recreational fishing in certain areas, they basically do that, provide public access someplace else. Because um, they are public lands. They belong to the public, as, as we, it's a public trust. You know, I've been arguing that uh, battle with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Interior for about the last 35 years because of sand mining, beach replenishment, and a number of other issues. And so we gotta respect that and see how we're gonna handle all the public when we basically look at that. The other thing is, in, we were talking about, I was thinking about the guys in the West Coast, because I was involved in the salmon since I've been on Mayfac and the, before that marine fish, we looked at issues all over the country and the water and the damage. How do you make the water companies basically pay? Well, hatcheries was one of the solutions. Well, if you're gonna have impacts on the fish, the salmon out there, maybe one of them is a supplement to the hatcheries. Again, to produce, we was talking about Maybe in Oregon they're going to need the hatcheries earliest today. So maybe that's another way of doing that, that kind of research. Or basically helping with the MRAG numbers so we better understand what recreational fishing, not the party and charter boat, but the real recreational anglers out there that basically are impacted over. So I'm trying to think of that, you know, windmills, I, you know, it was easy for me because in 2008, uh, Lisa Jackson, who was then DEP commissioner, went on to be head of EPA under Obama and then now is running the environmental thing for Apple, called me into her office and said, you know, Tom, and I didn't spend my name like I'm at Tom Fody. I served on the, as the governor's appointee for 29 of the last, or 26 of the last 30 years and also legislative proxy at Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And Lisa says, we're gonna do $4 million study on the effects of windmills. This is 2008. I says, oh, so how much, what kind of fish are you gonna study? He says, no, it's birds and marine mammals because we can't get money for fish because, you know, Audubon pushes to study the birds and everybody else studies the mammals because endangered species, we're going to study the mammals, but we're not going to do any research and we can't come up with the money to do that. Which was interesting because the $4 million was actually twice as big as the money that New Jersey was putting in at that point in the whole Department of Marine Fisheries. So we were spending one more money on the study than we've been operate the agency for, the, for that year. So it's always interesting. So there's ways of mitigating. We should be looking at that as a whole and not do, and the baseline studies you really, we really need to do, as Pat was saying, because we don't know which beach replenishment and the cumulative impact of both. The inshore fisheries used to be every 10 years we did beach replenishment in New Jersey. Now, because of the hurricanes, because of global warming, we're doing it every five years. So we're destroying the offshore lumps dumping it on the beach so we kill everything that's out there because we're sucking the sand out of it and we're dumping everything on the beach because and we're killing the fish there because of the greater good of protecting the property we basically ignore the effects it's having on the surf fishing and everything else and we're, we're afraid that's where we're going to wind up with the private boat anglers thank you for your time thanks tom you covered a lot of ground in there any <laughs> any um any comments on on mitigation and cumulative effects and studies and all the other things that tom talked about Not seeing any, but uh, thanks, Tom. We'll go to the next comment. 
Yes, th thank you. Uh, Rich Hittinger from the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. Um, so having gone through this whole mitigation uh, negotiations uh, with wind farm developers as part of the Fisheries Advisory Board in Rhode Island, I can tell you that um, it's a very difficult process, first off. Uh, but secondly, it's very different for recreational fishing than it is for commercial fishing. For commercial fishing, you can easily come up with a dollar value. Uh, for recreational fishing, it's not that easy. Um, I look at things that can be done for mitigation. Um, I think one of the things that can be done very easily is when the wind farms are being placed in a complex environment, in other words, a rocky bottom, something like that, <clears throat> the developers could make available their detailed mapping that they've done of the bottom, make that available to recreational fisher, uh, fishermen. They have it already. Uh, they, they can tell you where every boulder is. Uh, and just, just that would be a, a positive thing for recreational fishermen in the area. Um, so that, that's very simple. Uh, in addition, uh, sponsor research that is beneficial to recreational fishermen. And that may be uh, by doing studies of who fishes where and how much that private recreational fishery is worth. Uh, you know, de determine what's going on out there. Uh, it could even be research into uh, things like the uh, metal content, the, you know, the mercury content, the lead content of various types of fish that are being consumed, uh, you know, from that area. But, but do research that would be practical and uh, beneficial to recreational fishing in the area. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Okay, any comments or thoughts on that? All right, we appreciate it. Yes, sir, Richard. I'm Richard Heath from Oregon. Um, my comments are toward mitigation as well. In one of my former lives, I lived in a state where we developed the largest gold mining operations in the world. And when they showed up, uh, of course, it had huge impacts on public land. Monetary compensation became almost a, a nasty process because we viewed it as buying the problem instead of solving the problem. And that takes, uh, that, I mean, if you're compensated, you're happy. If you're a fisherman who isn't compensated, then you feel like you've been left out. So in our case, we found that the most effective way to do is what you've heard here, which is uh, compensatory mitigation. So if you impact X number of acres of habitat, then the expe expectation is you'll develop that much uh, compensating habitat. We did allow pooled mitigation where you could take uh, three or four projects and pool the acreage and then allow that to be compensated in one purchase. So I'm just cautioning you against monetary mitigation and to everybody else. It, it, it feels good for a while, but it, can, it has the potential to get out of hand and not do what you're thinking it's going to do. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. We really need to wrap up. So we'll get one more comment, and we're, we're done with this session, I think. Yep. Uh, my name's Dave Monte, a charter captain. I spoke a couple of times before. So very, very quickly, uh, I'd like to uh, take off where Rich uh, left, who was at the microphone just before me. Uh, the Nature's Conservancy, and I, and I make everyone aware, probably aware of it, uh, did a recent um, study on natural designs at the base of pylons, uh, blending in with uh, uh, habitat that's already in an existing pl uh, place to actually enhance uh, habitat and recreational fishing. Um, so these types of things, along with uh, multi-uses, and I think uh, the European wind farms have a little jump on us on this, the use of agriculture at wind farms, uh, enhanced recreational fishing. These are things that are being done uh, already. And uh, this is a, a little bit of ad, a bit of an ad. These two things, if anyone's interested in continuing this dialogue, uh, John here mentioned the Beard B-A-I-R-D symposium at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography, which continues April 13th. And TNC will be presenting there. 
um, oh, th these are big strategies towards uh, resiliency. Uh, Ocean Conservancy, we'll be talking about policy, making, uh, uh, making our federal law uh, a little bit more climate nimble. Orsted will be there on research and monitoring. So I just wanted to mention that to folks. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this session. I want to uh, thank all the panel members that are here in the room and, and uh, Danielle and Karin that are virtual. So thank you guys for your time. Really appreciate it. And with that, Jessica will take it from here. All right, we'll do a switch of the panelists in, in less than a minute. So hang tight if that's OK. Uh, we're going to transition um, back to hearing from our breakout groups on the climate resilient fisheries, and then we're going to tie it all together in the end. So at this point, um, I would like to have all the folks who are reporting out, so one person from each of the four groups who is um, your designated uh, report out person can come up to the panelists, and uh, we'll let these folks go ahead and take their seats. So thank you. All right, um, while we're getting our last group represented, we'll go ahead and get started. So for the next half hour, we're going to hear, if everyone can, like, sorry. We wanna try to get you out of here on time, right at five. So we'll try to move through these last two sessions. Thank you. We'll hear from these groups to hear some of the recommendations and about maybe five to seven minutes uh, for each person to report out on their group. And uh, we will start with, uh, why don't we start with Forrest? And if you wanna just introduce yourself uh, and your group to start, that would be great. Yeah, Forrest Braden, Southeast Alaska Guides Organization, also uh, owner operator of the Alaska sport fishing business. Uh, and our group was uh, Alaska uh, Pacific West Coast and, um, Hawaiian Islands, South Pacific uh, general area. So um, I heard that we have the best group, and maybe Russ Dunn said that to everybody, but it, it was a great group and uh, uh, a lot of good conversation going on. Um, just kind of following along with the, the line of questioning that we had, that I think we all had, key concerns about uh, uh, resiliency and, and climate change in our fisheries. One of the key things, uh, key takeaways was the uncertainty that faces all of us. Um, loss of opportunity, uh, which can maybe harken back to the idea of uh, either shifts in stock, um, displacement or, or whatever. Uh, one thing that came up that I think I'll insert right here is that uh, impacts are not always negative. There were both positive and negative impacts listed. And uh, one example of that was uh, the, um, it was mentioned, I think, here in the broader forum, uh, the bluefin tuna fishing in, off the Southern California coast, which I actually grew up in San Diego, and I saw some bluefin tuna fishing, but that just wasn't a thing back in the 80s and the 90s uh, like it has been for the past four or five years. And uh, so, but interestingly, there was a reduction in the amount of bluefin, like the limits, daily limits went down. So uh, what may be happening locally could be a positive impact, but um, in a more broad sense might be a negative impact stock, uh, stock concerns. So uh, loss of resource, different from loss of opportunity, loss of resource altogether. We've heard about salmon stocks, uh, uh, Pacific salmon stocks, Alaska salmon stocks swindling it seems to be a general problem. And we don't know that that's uh, a result of, of climate uh, changes, but it, it could definitely be. 
um, slow management response. And I'll give an example. Uh, I, I happen to also be acquainted with the uh, California fishery, fished uh, uh, black cod um, off Santa Barbara. And uh, I know about the depth zones there. And apparently uh, with worrying water, uh, for instance, Lane Todd can push further offshore and it gets you uh, outside of the the depth the depth limits that you have. And so um, management response, are we equipped to um, respond to that uh, quickly or is it a you know a two-year process and by that time another problem is rolled around uh, w one interesting point made from Hawaii is that uh, wreck fishing is not just recreational fishing but it equals food it equals culture and it equals uh, livelihood so um, what does it mean climate resilient fisheries uh, one good thing that came up, I think, that was a Mayfac generated uh, conversation, but came into to our forum, is is what is our focus? Is it on, uh, is it on, you know, uh, stocks and uh, fisheries re, re, um, coming back, or is it more on just kind of the, us rolling with the punches? Sorry, I got distracted there. Uh, us rolling with the punches, is it, is it our adaptation? Is it uh, the ability of the stocks to adapt? Uh, and, and we focus more on you know, our ability to respond uh, and, and be ready and be proactive. Uh, this is not necessarily in order, but since that we need, how many minutes? I take You're good. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought two minutes and here we go, five to seven, and I don't know where to respond here. So since that we need to look at uh, how to redirect our resources uh, to com combat the combat effects of climate change. Uh, for instance, um, being proactive if, um, if there's cl uh, climate shift or climate differences, how do we need to use our resources, water? Do we need to uh, reevaluate uh, some of the longstanding practices of water use and, um, and maybe redivert some of those resources to make it through uh, or to respond to those changes? Um, we can look at past regimes and patterns, uh, things that have happened in the past, things are cyclical. Uh, we may just be experiencing something that the Earth has experienced in the past, and so maybe we can look back um, and project forward and, and uh, use that to posture against uh, possible future scenarios. Um, being ready to adapt to species uh, variety and availability of, you know, how do we if we have bluefin tuna available to us now, uh, what does that mean? Uh, one interesting thing was um, we heard about uh, we heard about as those species showed up, others disappeared, and there was an interesting comment about how you know offshore blue, blue, uh, bluefin trip might be more expensive, and it prohibits a lot of people from participating in ways that they per participated before. So, h how do we how do we um, posture for that? Uh, kind of lastly, here on the education front. Um, how do we teach people about what's happening? How do we instruct them, enlighten them? And not information is not always uh, j just having being informed is not always uh, translate to action or to understanding. And so, how can we draw people in? How can we incorporate them uh, into the conversation? And I think this is a good example of that kind of forum where you know we've been asked to to contribute. And if we can do that with our clients, if we can do that with our um, fisheries. Uh, I think people feel involved and they'll understand from a different way than they would understand if they hadn't been drawn in that way. And then there's a couple more things that came up. Great group, but I'm going to stop there and pass the torch. Thanks, Forrest. Uh, let's go right down the line. So, Luis, if you just want to introduce yourself and your group first. Yes, thank you. I'm Luis Barbieri. I'm with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, and I'm reporting out for the South Atlantic, Gulf Coast, and Caribbean. And I'm sorry. I, uh, First, I don't know what's happening with Russ uh, this afternoon. He did come to our group and said that our group was the best. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, going down the question. So key concerns about climate change impacts on fisheries, limited availability of regional resources for managers to address needs. So this was a theme for our area, Southeast United States, both South Atlantic and Gulf, as well as Caribbean, is the need to greater investment in resources for research and management to support uh, understanding uh, of the impacts and get ready, prepare, prepare for what needs to come. Then inability of the existing science management and regulatory framework to keep pace with climate change, which may result in loss of opportunities and access 
to resource or along the same theme. For example, how essential fish habitat interpretation affects habitat restoration. Additionally, our ability to predict how opportunities may increase or decrease because of species migration. Also, environmental and biological effects from changing oceanographic processes. Harmful algal blooms, things like red tides, and species vulnerabilities due to limitations of animals' ability to migrate latitudinally in the Gulf. So the situation they're in the Gulf, they really don't have any, anywhere to go latitudinally, so they get kind of trapped in that situation. What will be the impacts of that? Then going down to the next question, what does it mean to have climate resilient fisheries? First of all, start with healthy stocks. Then have an EFP, a fisheries uh, ecosystem plan, to provide a framework for decision making that goes beyond just the traditional fisheries type of approach that we use and in include also the ecological and ex ecosystem perspectives. Focus on diversity within fishing communities and the ability of fishermen to adapt and still have opportunities with rewards. For example, and Marco mentioned this for the Caribbean, Caribbean fishermen introduced to blue runners as a food source. So this is something that happened there that they learned to take advantage of. Greater collaboration and partnerships between state, federal, and other agencies or institutions. So instead of just focusing on each one of these dimensions of this issue, working separately, increase collaboration and communication so they can work better together since this is really multidimensional and multidisciplinary in nature. For example, collaboration with water quality managers and fisheries managers. Going down to question number three, needs to achieve climate resilience, resilient fisheries. Implement region-specific scenario planning. So the presentation earlier this afternoon, or late morning, on the climate, uh, the region-specific scenario planning, right, the scenario planning was really well received and people felt this needs to be expanded to other regions of the country, other fisheries. We need more resources and funding that are proportional to the regional scale of this area. For example, uh, camera surveys, increased fishery independent long line surveys, cooperative research programs, and increased citizen science. So basically, more investment in science in the region so we can actually better understand what's going on and be able to address it appropriately. Uh, improve council structure of or process to manage climate driven changes, improve water quality and habitats, stakeholder buy in and stewardship, create tools to address increasing fishing pressure in the Gulf. And then finally, on the education and outreach to help advance climate ready fisheries, community level education and outreach. So we need to have a better understanding of what it means in terms of climate change and having more public buy-in, stakeholder buy-in of the concept. For example, change perceptions by illustrating at the micro level rather than the macro level how climate change is affecting people's livelihoods. Education and engagement through MRAP. So we already have MRAP in different regions of the country, increasing that educational component through them, and then a solution-oriented focus on the consequence, consequences of climate change. Great. Thanks, Luis. Uh, Maura, why don't you go ahead for your group? Hi, I'm Maura Kelly. I'm the, region, the Recreational Fisheries Coordinator from the Greater Atlantic Region. I'm going to report out from New England. And as a native New Englander, we know where Russ's loyalties really lie. <laughs> um, so when we talked about concerns similar to the other groups, we talked about access sort of in two terms, both fishing for what's there, what, what is right outside your door, and the infrastructure related to, to access and the, and the difficulties with maintaining or in increasing access through infrastructure problems. We talked about a concern related to when rare event species stop 
being rare, um, either in a location or time, um, and how our data collection systems are, are struggling a bit to make that transition from when something really is r rare versus becoming more common. Um, and similarly, we talked a lot about concerns regarding if, if a lot of our independent, uh, fishery independent surveys are keeping up with sort of the timing shifts in distributions. We heard about fish arriving in areas earlier than they had in the past and are our surveys adaptable to recognizing that? Um, we described sort of a, a climate resilient fishery as one that aligns research with our priorities given our limited resources that ta again takes advantage of what's available including doing things like spreading out management measures so there's always something to fish for um, that supports and allows for adaptable businesses from the for hire perspective and we talked a little bit about it's it's kind of managed similarly to what we have now but like better um, in that it's it's built through a very deliberate public process but it allows for for hire businesses and anglers to pivot more quickly so we do our traditional sort of deliberative process but build in areas where we can increase the speed or responsiveness to, to changes that we're seeing um, some of the data needs we talked about included supplemental data streams um, using things like study fleets to show alignment through different data sources um, and better integration into stock assessment and other processes um, and leveraging multiple reporting streams to, to do all these things. Um, some of the management hurdles we kind of talked about what we need to get to a climate resilient fishery included um, dealing with some of the, the things we hear from our enforcement partners um, related to sometimes, you know, can limit the, their concerns about how complex a management scheme can be can kind of limit the flexibility for something like a total boat limit or a multi-species bag limit of some kind. Um, and again, as, as mentioned before, the intentionally deliberative public process can make things slower and limit flex flexibility, so let's build in some additional places for flexibility. Um, when we, we sort of roundabout got to the outreach question through all the other discussions, and uh, we think it's really important to utilize all of us as all partners in, in outreach as ambassadors and um, as, as much as nobody likes to say it, as influencers in, in different fora, um, to, to be really intentional about how we translate all of this complex information to uh, a more, to be more accessible to the general public, um, being younger a little bit in our messaging and, and being matching the social platform. Um, so we're aligning our message better with the expectations of, of various platforms. We're not putting a, an image of a PowerPoint slide with 400 words on it on an, as an Instagram post. Like we're really matching things a little bit better to what people are gonna expect in those. Um, and again, along with that sort of balancing between um, making everybody aware of what's going on with, with sort of sharing too much detail in the weeds, keeping it accessible. Um, and we also talked about on the, the data support side, considering the, motiv the motivators for um, anglers and for hire captains as to why they want to, why they should want to share their data. Um, we heard about a reporting app process that's going on in Rhode Island that um, kind of re-emphasized that the first motivator for people when they surveyed them about would you be willing to share your recreational fisheries data is conservation. And that the second was to help them become better fishermen themselves. Um, and I think using those motivators to, to encourage additional data streams is kind of where we can get, gain some real progress. Great. Thanks, Maura. And last but not least, David, can you please share your group's findings? Yeah, I can, and I'm going to attempt to keep it short because there's a lot of repeats, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think um, that reflects that we have a lot of the same issues, and if we look at, at that as an opportunity, well, we can move forward um, in some positive ways because the time is now to improve some of these things we've been talking about for so long. I heard a repeat of nearly every single issue, and it's how do we prioritize them, how do we talk about the pros and cons and take action. Um, my three-year-old son watches a show called Shaun the Sheep, and I was preparing for it. I'd never heard of it before. Before I was even a father, I accidentally found a cartoon of sheep playing ping pong back and forth. And I went, wow, this is perfect for a fisheries conversation. <laughs> it is so hard to implement some of the things that we know are real and, and are important. And um, 
that picture just said it all. And we have to stop playing ping pong, bouncing it back and forth, and stop being cheap. Uh, we have lots of great um, leadership in this community, in government, private, public, state, federal, you name it. And we have to not just recognize that we have strong leadership, but be leaders. Um, and that's not stuff that you're going to find on these these paper I brought up here, because I, I was tricking myself and thinking I could actually use these and, and, um, and actually give you some good ideas that were on paper. Um, I didn't do my homework. I made a mistake today and didn't get a great list. But let me let me go down to a couple of bullet points instead of kind of waxing poetic up here. Um, we have to think about um, the importance of anecdote now more than ever. Um, we have to recognize that um, where we came from is important to, to tell us where we go, but only so important, and try and elevate some of the future voices um, that need to guide us into the next generation of, of what this looks like for our community. Um, in a community that won't look like us, won't experience fishing the way we we have, and kind of recognize the flexibility we must find within ourselves to, to really shape what the future of fishing looks like. Adam Nowalski made a comment that stuck very clearly in my mind about setting our expectations about what a successful fishing trip looks like from the private angler perspective, from the for hire perspective, and everything in between. We need to be ambassadors to speak to that opportunity and, and the things that we know we hold dear. I mean, that feeling you get when you leave the inlet or you hop on your boat and you get a tug on your line. Does it really matter if it has stripes or whiskers? It shouldn't if you're actually getting back to what's most important about fishing. And so those kinds of things that we all have the ability to be a positive step in the right direction about embracing the changes we have and still recognizing how important our resources are, whatever they may be, wherever they may be. Um, or we can constantly try and be that cat being dragged off the cliff here because um, it's not that that, that big of a deal. Um, we, we can we can persevere and we can move forward. There's pros and cons on all these things, and of course in the Mid-Atlantic I can hear the most my friends from New Jersey and my friends from New York talking about things and feeling differently about things, right? It's not new to the Mid-Atlantic dynamic, right? It's a necessary evil, and we have to, again, question how we, um, how we face these things because it all comes back to resiliency for all of us. Um, habitat. 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 It's water and bottom. Can't forget that. It's water and bottom in time and place. And so whatever resources we have out there, because we're a data-rich country, we're a data-rich community, but we forget all that very valuable information that's out there and might just be reorganized in a different way, whether it be from people going out and fishing. You know, this kind of gets back to the community science-based piece of things and, and even the anecdotal piece of these things. There's a ton of information collectively in this room that's on these flip charts, thankfully, and I know that the team will help condense um, so you can read it more specifically about, about what's going on um, in the Mid-Atlantic and what we commonly, and we all kind of have in common here. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it with one piece that relates to, um, well, two pieces that I've already said a couple times today. One, the importance of social sciences and advancing our ability to kind of collectively find, try and find consensus for whatever that future may look like something we've done very poorly as a community. I mean, I think having agency and, and you know, public-private partnerships on that front is going to be key to defining what our future looks like. We have a ton of great leaders that know those skills, but we also throw fisheries biologists experts into a social science experiment, which is fisheries management, all too often. we got to stop, be smarter about that. Um, and it comes back to knowledge and outreach and education, and I'll say MREP again. Um, I've been a state waters focused guy. I live in the Chesapeake. It's a lot of where my work is, right? And my great friends on the federal level constantly remind me through MREP, hey, this is a federal program. Well, if our states up and down this coast are really going to effectively build proper participants for this process, then all of us need to be going to our state capitals and saying, hey, look what our federal friends have built. We can't scrape together a few bucks to better connect with our local communities. If we can't, we've ultimately failed. So I'm challenging all of you that in four years we come back and talk about what we each did in our own state capitals to talk about matching, digging up pennies and any, any bit of money we can to empower and educate our people. We do it all on a daily basis, but not as cohesively as we could. So let's see what we can do. Let's hope we, uh, we make each other proud in four years or whenever we may come back here. So thank you. Thank you.
and thanks to everyone for participating in those groups and sharing all your thoughts and ideas so we do actually have about five to ten minutes to hear from anyone who participated in those groups and wanted to add something that wasn't already mentioned or if you have a action that you're burning to share um, that you're going to take home in your region from either the climate session or the balancing ocean uses so um, in the next couple of minutes if anyone would like to come to the mic and share some final thoughts and then we'll close it up and if not then you all did an excellent job representing your groups so um, all right well with that I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Tim Sartwell with NOAA Fisheries who's gonna offer us some closing remarks I think we're getting to that point in the day. Um, I'd like to just do one more round of applause for all of our speakers and panelists today. It was a great discussion. Um, the theme of, of this year's summit is recreational fisheries in a time of change. And I think we hit that really hard today. Um, we talked a lot about climate change and climate resilient fisheries. And uh, we talked about the growing ocean industries and, and the need to, to balance the uses out in the ocean while preserving sustainable recreational fisheries. And, you know, in the alternative uses, we were a little Atlantic heavy. We we're a little Rhode Island heavy. Um, it's almost like our AAs used to work in Rhode Island or something. It's crazy. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that as this industry moves on and as wind energy continues to develop that the people from all these other regions were able to hear some of the concerns and the issues that have been encountered with alternative ocean uses and, and take those back and take them back to your local communities, your local marinas and, and start thinking about when, when these planning and these public inputs start opening up in your regions, how, you, how you're best prepared to um, voice your opinion, to make sure the recreational sector is, is considered um, and is preserved as we move forward um, you know with the climate discussion the word that was in my new england panel was nimble and uh, the council system often isn't nimble but um, i think it was kylie who said we need to figure out how to do our traditional stock assessments and continue to do our traditional ways of management but we need to figure out how to best incorporate that local knowledge because this climate change is happening really fast and the people who are on the water every day are the ones who are seeing it and can speak to it quickly so we need to figure out how to make our management system more nimble um, and more reactive to the the challenges that we're seeing on the water the other thing that i'll mention is is data data came through every single conversation today. And a lot of it was having your data to share, having your data to back up your arguments, to support your public opinion. Um, and it's essential. And there's more data. There's data that we need to find. Um, and there's data that we're going to collect in the future. I think Rick was saying we need to do a good job of monitoring these wind farm installations, figure out how we're going how they're developing over time and i think the recreational sector can provide a really big opportunity there um, i remember we were at a meeting and australia was presenting on how they you know were, were giving cameras to recreational fishermen who were monitoring artificial reefs with cameras while they were fishing to help collect data so we need to be creative to think about how we can help fill these data gaps as these as these um, ocean uses develop and what role can the recreational sector um, play in not only just collecting but also sharing that data and helping to to make sure that sustainable uses um, continue into the future and um, I'm glad Dave emphasized habitat multiple times I would encourage everyone to talk to Kara and Carrie while they're here about the habitat work that's ongoing and coming um, fisheries habitat is essential conservation of those habitats to 
produce fish into the future is essential. So it's exciting to see that level of investment moving forward. Um, finally, communication engagement. We are starting the Russ Dunn TikTok channel, so please feel free to log in. Just kidding, Russ. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be like that Allstate commercial, everyone looking and crashing as they drive by. Um, but communication and engagement are going to be key. Uh, I encourage you all to utilize Russ, utilize me and the Rec Fish Initiative and all of your regional rec coordinators to stay informed, um, to ask questions and you know, know when these opportunities to provide public input are coming up. Um, utilize us, utilize your state and federal scientists to build creative data collection processes into the future um, and ensure that everything um, that we're doing into the future is collaborative and towards a sustainable fisheries and ocean uses for all. So that was just a quick little recap of some of my takeaways today. Um, before we break, I do want to, um, if you have, I think, one more slide, Maya. Um, should be a couple of pictures up there. Uh, maybe. Mm, no, keep going. There we go. So Russ had mentioned it this morning. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit more. Uh, Bonnier has been a great partner with us trying to promote recreational fishing um, in a time when people were limited in their access on the water. Um, this was the, the last uh, the final four of our photo contest, interesting timing as we walk into the final four this weekend in basketball, but we worked with Bonnier on these photo contests and, and they've been super successful. Um, this, last, this last round, we had over 1,200 photos submitted from across the country. We had um, over 12,000 votes in this bracket challenge of the public getting to pick their favorite recreational photo contest and or excuse me, their favorite recreational photo out of all of them. Um, and across the entire contest, we had, you know, two and a half million, impre almost two and a half million impressions of, of what we were putting out on social media. And um, it, it's exciting to point out that that Mahi picture with Captain Barbara Evans was the winner of the 2021, 2022 recreational photo contest with Bonnier. Those were the four finalists, but she was the winner for that photo contest. Great photo, um, super pleased with that partnership. Um, as, as we look forward into the future, we're, we're super excited to continue public-private partnerships to support recreational fisheries and promote recreational fisheries for the benefit of the nation. Um, so with that, thank you all. Thank you all for participating today. Tomorrow we get into management and data, and um, it is a good conversation as always. So I think Jessica has a couple more instructions. I'll be brief and we'll end early. So uh, thank you all for your engagement and productive conversations today. Also for everyone streaming online, thank you. And uh, hopefully everything went well from your end as well. Um, I did want to mention just a few things. There are some uh, regional posters outside in the atrium that you can peruse. Um, during the reception and just a reminder in case you weren't here this morning the timing of the reception was moved up from uh, 6 to 530 so um, that will be in the atrium at 530 and uh, lastly we will eventually post the uh, presentations on the event webpage um, assuming we can work all that out with the communications folks so those should be available and um, I, I do want to thank our AV and our tech people and Maya and Chris who have been doing an amazing job today, um, keeping us all, you know, however hundred many people there are online and here um, seeing and hearing everything that we need to. So thank you and to the, the hotel staff as well.